Okay. Good morning, friends. I hope you guys are well. Oh, had a decent sleep. That feels pretty good. I was looking at this pretty sunrise on um, one of the Tahoe cams here. Yeah. Bear with me. I'm still kind of sleepy here. Getting that coffee going. Oh, I feel like I'm finally starting to get recover from this terrible flu I had. My throat, though, isn't quite there. Um, I was hoping that I could rest it while I had a sore throat and the flu, but with all these fires, that ended up being a forlorn hope. <sighs> we still have red flag in the valley right now. But it looks like the red flag warning is out of the, uh, no longer applicable, no longer applicable to the Sierras, as far as I can tell, looking at the National Weather Service. Hey, good morning, John. Good morning, and welcome back, guys. People start trickling in here. Um, I want to see what happened during the night. That was a crazy wind event. Boy, did we see all kinds of eerie things on the cam. The, um, looks, looks like, uh, while the camera is still alive at uh, Tobias Peak, I guess the lookout tower is still alive. We've had some, uh, eerie time lapses at places like, uh, Rocky Point. Where we were seeing the uh, smoke go over like a strange kind of a slipstream in front of a dolphin that's just beneath the surface. That humped sort of uh, roller coaster looking uh, smoke area. Hey, K Dot, good morning. Hey, Alan. Kox has gusty winds infographic for today. Cool, thanks. All right. It was a little hard to get to sleep. We're listening to that's Caldor right there. There. They're getting some aircraft up. Hey, Nicole. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, that's our. Um, this is the shortest route. There's so many backyards, but the brown. Let me um try to do something with the internet here. I'm uh. I'm going to push a button. It might burp a second. Just uh, hold on. Okay. All right. Let's see if it worked. Okay. Hopefully that worked. Okay, somebody is going by with a, some sort of a massive uh, street sweeper type of a device. I don't know if you guys can hear that. Okay, I. Wonderful. <laughs> it seems that there's massive construction going on next door, so. and all throughout the street, so I'm sorry. Smitty was saying the Rubicon is an issue today. I didn't, I didn't know what he meant on the, on the email this morning. So there's still an active red flag flag warning for much of the active wildfires. Okay. 
Well, we know that they're getting aircraft up on the um, here at Tahoe. Here's the uh, here's here at Tahoe's 12-hour time lapse. Wow, look at that wind. And water on the lens. Oh, I'm ready to copy. Okay. Yeah, continue with the update. Uh, fire remained in the footprint overnight. We got light to moderate, precip across the fire. Uh, crews will be continuing to mop up today. Looking for a hundred percent mop up break. Nice. Yeah, this will be resources beyond scene to approximately 1,800 this evening. The trainee, I copy off at 957. That sounds awesome. So the Rubicon update just now was that the fire remained in its footprint overnight. Light precipitation fell on it. Crews will be there to mop up until 800 this evening. Cool, cool, cool. 9.58 a.m. Excuse me, guys. I'm making a note here. We had, um... We can do a Leak Springs time lapse as well. I'm so glad that that air was pretty moist. It looks like perhaps even a bit more moist than they anticipated. That's such a blessing. We were a little bit worried about that, especially... After seeing the uh, the kind of nervous aspect that they had during their um, uh, briefing, the Caldor yesterday and the day before, uh, the community, the, excuse me, the community meeting. Okay, let's go and write down. I'm sorry. There's this massive construction sound going on outside. I don't know if you guys can hear this. It's like an incredible blower device outside. I don't know what they're cleaning or cleaning up at the construction site, but if, you, if, it, if it comes to the microphone, just let me know and I'll uh, mute myself for a moment. Hey, J.E. Cat, you're listening to North Cal Fire on my phone. Well, they just, J.E. Cat, that's what they just said. Um, that it's okay there, that it remained within its footprint. Here's the Lake Springs cam. Is there something else um, I didn't know about? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, J.E. Cat may not have audio for my stream going. Um, uh, but I'm going to ask uh, J.E. Cat what uh, channel were you listening to? Yeah, Smitty, I we, we just heard them say it was in mop-up, that it was uh, um, it never left its containment. It was already declared 100% contained. Um, yesterday or the day before so it stayed within its footprint and had light precip on it and I can't even see any issues on any cams um, so that's why I'm puzzled about I think Smitty kind of woke me up with a text saying uh, email saying um, that the Rubicon was doing something and so I jumped over jumped on the computer but I don't see anything happening with it I don't see any any at all kind of heat detection and it's been 100% contained for oh man that was loud for a bit now um turn that down 
And so... Okay. Alright, there's a massive machine thing going on outside. Hang on a second. Figure out what machine is out there. Be right back. Okay, as soon as the machine is gone, I'll talk again. Meanwhile, this air attack is over the scene by uh, the Capels Kirkwood area. Okay. Maybe the, maybe the machine is done with its crazy uh, blowing thing. Stay on this main road, the uh, GPS tells us take a, take a route out through the black uh, onto the forest ground. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, the KNP and Windy is uh, remain the fires a bit. They remain the areas of greatest concern, for sure. But here, I don't see them in red flag. I only see red flag for the northern um, valley. Am I confused here? You guys are really confusing me. The Rubicon's going up, and I'm like, okay, it's contained. K and P is in red flag. Uh, where? <laughs> uh, I, is this is this old? Am I missing something? I just um, we uh, we re red flag's a very specific thing. I think they should expand that a little bit, be a little bit more looser with the term. But I don't see a red flag over the Southern Sierras. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, they, um, thanks for keeping us abreast of the situation. Yeah, they, um, 
they do have crews there, but it's to complete their mop up. They were uh, talking about how good it was looking just now on the radio. Um, the uh, KNP and the Windy, we are kind of blind on. We can look at the uh, before we do video roundup. And good morning, everybody. This is arriving. Um, I didn't. I don't see a lot of movement in it uh, to the southeast, like we like we thought, or to the east. It seemed like um, what they said was true. That mostly the the wind affected the fires on the higher elevations, and the peaks were burning. And we saw that crazy, uh, eerie time lapses, um, like here at Shirley Peak. Fire See this? This uh, eerie dolphin slipstream kind of thing going on. There's a little bit of cloud cover, but unfortunately it doesn't look like it got any uh, precipitation. So, um, yeah, every morning at 7 in the morning, J.E. Cat, um, there's a shift change where the night crews go off and the day crews show up. Um, air attack does come up every morning at like 8 and survey everywhere. That may have just been their number one priority to go look at the situation. Um, the, I, I don't see that it was of any particular concern to them. Um, JCAT says a cave-in at the Totten mine on Sunday, trapping 39 miners. 36 are out now. Oh my gosh, what's that? Um, whoa. Is that big headline news? I just I just woke up, guys. So uh, here's what the uh, Wendy was doing over the night, that eerie uh, slipstream thing. Um, this looks fine. Uh, it looks like there was a trace amount of precip overhead. Uh, obviously not enough to turn things off, but uh, enough to uh, bring to light anything that looks out of place. And I do not see anything out of place. Uh, between 69 and 73, yeah, it looks the same. Nothing across the line. Interior smoke, a little less fire behavior. Damper version of the dirty black edge. This is Caldor uh, Radio Comms. The uh, air attack is giving a report right now. He's doing his flyover um, of the Caldor situation, trying to figure out which kind of uh, aircraft they should order for today. What, what mine cave in? Let me take a look. Is it in, hey, Morris, good morning. Oh, Sudbury, Ontario, nick, nickel mine. I go to CNN, and it's not even there. Um, Sudbury. Mine, miners trapped. Okay, let me take a look at that. So, is J, J E Cat, can you hear me right now? Um. They've been there for two days. I didn't even hear about this. Uh, yikes. Well, I'm glad they're rescuing them. Um, so, yeah, I don't think J.E. Cat's listening, but 
Uh, oh, there you are. There you are. So right now, Air Attack is doing the the morning flyover to try to figure out if uh, they need um, if they need air support for uh, anything. Going around the Caldor, they're saying everything looks within at uh, Spirit Airlines. Everything looks within um, perimeters, but there is there is nothing over the Rubicon. There is no air support there. And it uh, stayed within its footprint overnight, and um, they're in mop-up, and the cr ground crews will be mopping up there until 1800. Um, he said, 5973, everything's within the lines, and by 69 in strawberry, dirty, uh, more wet version of the black line. So everything looks great on the Caldor, as far as we can uh, gather from what the uh, current report is. Um, Air attacks morning report and flyover. Um, but yeah, KDOC, that would be a good thing. We can look at predictive services. That would be the next thing to uh, take a look at. Um, today's weather report. We'll look at the fawn and others. So predictive services is based out of Reading and um, they are the Pope when it comes, there's no higher authority for fire weather in uh, California. So we have the uh, the very, very dry Central Valley area. This has the highest uh, risk in the uh, northern uh, portion of California. Um, we'll go to the little morning video. That should be... Here, the fire weather webcast, updated daily during fire season. Welcome to the North Ops fire weather webcast for Tuesday, September 28, 2021. Wetting rainfall affected a significant portion of the region during the past 24 hours. The favorite area was found across the northwest corner, where locally one, to plus two inches fell. The upper west slopes of the Cascade Sierra Ranges, mid coast, and northeast California also fared well. A few lightning pulses occurred near Shingletown. The most recent water vapor loop from GO 16 shows a Pacific trough over the region with ridging just offshore. Visible imagery this morning shows variable cloudiness over the area with a thicker band of clouds moving off to the east. Skies will eventually clear across most central and western areas as the day progresses. The Pacific trough will exit to the east as the day progresses and allow Pacific ridging to influence the region's weather tonight through Thursday. It appears that the models are settling in on a weak disturbance moving over the area Friday and then setting up offshore while a ridge of high pressure builds over Northern California during the weekend. This pattern could last into early next week, although we'll be watching where the weak low pressure area ends up. Temperatures will be cooler than normal today, but gradually warm through the rest of the week. Widespread above normal temperatures expected this weekend and possibly lasting into early next week. No precipitation expected at this time through early next week. Close cold frontal brisk north-northwest winds will affect portions of the area today, favoring the coastal range, Bay Area, and Sacramento Valley. Peak gusts will generally range between 20 to 30 miles per hour, but locally a little more in the terrain-channeled areas. This forecast image is valid at 1400 today. Locally breezy north-northeast winds will develop tonight and last into Wednesday morning before lowering during the afternoon. The Sacramento Valley and west slopes of the Cascade and Sierra Ranges will be favored. A similar wind pattern expected Wednesday night into Thursday and possibly late week into the weekend. Peak gusts will generally range between 20 to 30 miles per hour. This forecast image is valid at 2300 this evening. Following good to excellent humidity recoveries overnight, values will lower today, especially across the areas that didn't receive as much, if any, rainfall. Expect minimums in the teens and 20s across portions of the Sacramento Valley, Greater Bay Area, and to the lee of the Sierra. 
This forecast image is valid at 1700 today. The lowering trend will be more pronounced Wednesday into Thursday, with more widespread interior minimums in the upper single digits, teens, 20s, and 30s. Values should improve slightly Friday before lowering during the weekend. This forecast image is valid at 1700 Wednesday. The seven-day significant fire potential product reveals a mix of risks near term with increased risks late in the forecast period as the dead fuels dry. Near critical conditions expected within the Sacramento Valley today due to the gusty wind flow combined with lower humidity, cured out grasses and a flammable live fuel moisture. Pockets of elevated fire danger will continue through the rest of the week into the weekend due to locally breezy and dry conditions, but not widespread enough to warrant a high risk. In summary, the Pacific trough finishes its sweep over the area today, leading to gusty post cold frontal winds and near critical conditions across the Sacramento Valley. Locally breezy and dry north northeast winds will occur the next two overnights and possibly extend into the weekend. An overall warming and drying trend commences today, although temperatures today will be below normal. Possibly extend. Okay, so to highlights, the Pacific trough finishes its sweep over the area today, leading to gusty post cold frontal winds and near critical conditions across the Sacramento Valley. Locally breezy and dry north and northeast winds will occur over the next two overnights and possibly into the weekend. An overall warming and drying trend starts today, although temps will be below normal. So the valley didn't really get any moisture and um, that's why it's in a, a red flag because there's gusty winds, they're dry, and the north winds are the... Uh, bad kind of wind for uh, the fawn fire. So we have to check on that and see what's going on over Shasta. They did a super job of getting a lot of that contained uh, and they had a, a wonderful uh, winds out of the south that pushed pushed the fire just up against the lake and kind of pinned it there. And they took advantage of that situation and uh, put a lot of lines around it but we should check it out today because um, a north wind would try to try to push that fire to the south again. We need, need to make sure that that stays uh, stays in line. So um, we go up to um, and here's a better visual. See what I mean? The north wind at wind out of the north would push over here at uh, Lake Shasta. It would try to push the fawn fire south again, which is what was happening the day that it broke out and it caused such havoc. So sorry, Havoc, I didn't mean to use your username here. So um, 15 to 20 miles an hour is uh, not not great, not terrible. Um, we should uh, check out the situation. I was looking at Tahoe. Everything was looking pretty good, pretty grand over there. Um, Air Attack is doing its flyover right now. I'm going to unmute them in case they uh, speak again. Um, they're trying to figure out what kind of... Uh, aircraft they want during today. I don't even see any new heat detections Auto from. I don't even see any new heat detections here. That's looking good. We'll check the cams. So, uh, and we'll we'll take a look at the. Uh, they may have had a morning update on the fawn fire. We'll uh, we'll take a look. If we go up here and. Look at cams, it's looking very, very clear. Highline trail, you can barely see anything. We see red retardant all over the, the what was that, Bear Mountain. We could do a 12 hour time lapse. We couldn't even see the fire overnight. When I finally uh, went to bed. Yeah, I'll, we'll check that out in a second. Have a good what the different uh, containment levels are. It got a little bit of rain I hear. Frank Presley says it felt like fall here earlier in Reno. Cool, cool. Hey, hey Jay Connors. Good morning. Um, 
Let's see. Oh, hey, John. Just stepped in to say hello. Hello, everyone. Hey. I'm just going to listen to continue to complete the overhaul of the Willie's brakes. Oh, your your old Jeep? Cool. Yeah, no no worries, John. That's okay. We uh we were there to catch it. Uh John put his phone in his pocket and started banning people as he uh walked around with the screen on. <laughs> so we we thought that John was hacked for a second. I was about to rip away uh mod powers in emergency. And then he goes, "Sorry, phone was in the pocket." That was the uh, the funny thing. Yeah, it was at uh Dixie was at 94% containment yesterday. I don't think it changed, but we'll uh, eagerly check the videos in the morning. Um, I don't know that my internet has a good connection right now. There's a massive construction outside. They interrupted my uh, power by leaving breaker boxes and stuff open down the street, and uh, a bunch of kids climbed on their equipment and started throwing switches. And uh, then a little bit earlier, it was this massive... Uh, uh, blowing a uh, cleanup operation for some sawdust or something they were trying to blow off equipment. So I may get interrupted, I hope not. But internet's on the fritz right now. They're, uh, they never do this at the uh, at the right time. So we, we see red retardant all over the place. Um, this is looking from the, what, east, kind of at the area where the, uh, the fawn fire is. Yeah, it's looking from the east to the west. And so the lake and the fire is back behind this uh, this little bare mountain or hill or whatever you want to call that. So I, I'm thinking that I, I have a good feeling about today with the fawn. They, they've done such amazing work. Even though they have wind gusts, they've, they had that huge, huge amount of air uh, retardant drops and you can still see it all over the mountain these big splashes of red they had dozer lines out there a um, couple of days now to work when the wind was pushing it up against the lake now that today's wind is going to try to push it south I just uh, I, I think they probably have it under un, in hand so we'll go and check um, we'll check on it I want to look at the uh, the KNP and the windy today are my big areas of concern so we can look at Sequoia Kings National Park, see if they've got a um, update real quick. I want to see if there's a evacuation update for the Windy. I just, uh, I don't think that there there is, but we should uh, take a look. An hour ago, there was a KNP update. Let's um, quickly look at Tulare County Sheriff's Office. Um, I don't see anything new from yesterday. So we'll, we'll also check the evacuation map. Uh, link is in the description of this video. It's tularycounty.gov.ca.gov slash emergencies. I believe if I remember that off the top of my head. Yeah, it is. Oh man, that machine's running again outside. Looks the same. That um, all the way down to the current... All the way down to the Kern County line in the uh, Kern River drainage, we've got uh, you know yesterday's evacuation warnings um, from M from Gold Ledge all the way to the Kern County line. But we, as far as the heat detection goes, we don't see that it did a lot of movement. Uh, it kind of burned mostly within on the peaks of where it was already located. So we'll we'll come back and check on that. I wanna I wanna make sure that everything's okay with the fawn fire at the moment, um, and then we can pay proper attention and do our video roundup. Predictive services is showing that the red flag and fire danger is extremely high, all the way from the um, North Valley from San Jose, San Jose up up to Red Bluff. It looks like uh, because it. The rain skipped it, and yet there's going to be that north wind that's drying and dry. And so why why are north winds drying and dry? Uh, because mostly they come out of the, the inland area like this. And you see that's this huge deserty Great Basin thing. 
and so they're dry as a bone. They're unnaturally dry, uh, straight out of a desert. Not um, not the kind of stuff that was moist uh, like yesterday, the day before that came out of the Pacific. But north winds usually don't. They usually don't. Even if some of them come in from the ocean, and they're a little yeah, bit more on the moist side, they're, they're, they seem to always mix with the dry stuff. So, and we'll be watching. Joseph, Ian, Charlie, 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 Yeah, so we'll, um, you know what we could do is look at CAL FIRE. CAL FIRE would tell us about the uh, containment lines of the Dixie as well, or containment percentage. And here's the thing, guys. Um, I was tipped off to this. Federal or state funding surge dollars, or whatever you want to uh, call it, you know, like extra, extra funding for wildfires, ends the moment that there's 100% containment. So if you look at ancient fires that have been kind of, not out, but like a done deal for a long time, like the one affecting Doyle, the, uh, gosh, what was it called? Sorry, guys, coffee hasn't really kicked in yet. Um, that's going to stay there around 98% for a long time because they have so much extra work to do because the Dixie ran right up next to it that they don't want to lose their funding. So um, the uh, there's the Dixie's current footprint, but... Uh, and it's not even, it's, it's acting like it's invisible, like it's not even still there. Um, but over here, this fire, what was that? The, what was that? The, it starts with a B, the, gosh, what was I, I really need my coffee. Um, just Google it. Uh. The the sugar, and then what else was it called with the complex? The one that just took out Doyle this year? Um, the Beckworth. Excuse me, I knew it started with a B. The Beckworth. That's not 100% uh, containment, even though it's a done deal. It has been for a while now. Um, the, the, the reason it's not 100% is here is kind of the general area where it was and the Dixie burned right up next to its containment lines so they had to uh, put resources on the same lines and that it was a funding sort of a thing so the Beckworth is what like 98% expect that to be like that for a while so that they can continuously finish their work and uh, make sure the area is safe because the Dixie is not dead it's still going it's still dangerous it's just uh, with the moisture and the uh, hard work they've been doing and uh, the favorable, uh, much more favorable uh, weather conditions. It's just less of a threat, but it still is one. So we're, we're listening to um, Caldor. They're going to get some aircraft over the scene and hopefully... Um, Put the dang Caldor uh, to bed. Hey guys, start cutting the upper part of the bowl, low side of the road. Let me know if you have to drop the bowl, though. Let me know if you Okay, yes, yes, you guys were saying. Uh, hey, Mike, Eric, back here to ground. Okay, so. Let's go, let's go and check on the phone uh, fire. No threats in India, Mike. We're listening to Caldor um, as air attack is up over the over the scene. Um, it Look looks that. great. Jumping on the 
recon with four hotel ups. One of your India flying sites to uh, look at that stuff. Over by four and I. They had some, uh, just enough precipitation for the Insano winds uh, that hit the Tahoe area last night uh, and yesterday for for them to um, not spread. So that's that's wonderful. I think that's another good stroke of luck. Um, everything I've heard air attacks say, we only muted it for like two minutes to watch the um, Reading Predictive Agreed, Services. Uh, Okay, he was talking about the Smith incident. Um, he said that there was just two light smokes. I understand. Post camera actings uh, are a little bit different from the line officer perspective. So, yep, uh, we'll support whatever the direction is, though, uh, with the transition to the, the next team coming in uh, right now. Uh, no threats. Your division looks snug. We'll remain overhead for. Uh, most of the morning, we do have four type ones and two type twos available for water if you need. Your division looks snug, no threat. <laughs> How neat. I just don't know exactly who he's talking to, but I think he's. I think he's talking to uh, India up there, which is over by the Echo Lakes, Fortnite type area. Look at the phone fire info in a second. Nine I want to. This is an acceptable ceiling for you between uh, seven and one thirteen, right? Okay, I want to make sure he's done. So far, it's just air attack and a helicopter over the Caldor. But just a, a summary of that is it got just enough moisture that the insane winds uh, didn't appear to blow anything over lines or cause any new spot fires that I can tell. Air attack's been making a, kind of a, a really long circuit around, checking out all the smokes at, um, that were visible in the cams, like the uh, strawberry, uh, up above strawberry. The um, kind of scary looking for a bit uh, flare up that was caught on the Sierra Tahoe cam. This this overnight was just absolutely slammed by winds, even though it was bright and there were there were some minor issues. Uh, thing, things. if your engine's available today. Things stayed within the put footprint, and so I'm just gonna I'm gonna mute that because we're we need to go check on the fun fire. But thank goodness, guys, just thank goodness we had this amount of moisture. Twice Tahoe has dodged a major bullet. Where imagine if if these 60 mile an hour winds this week and the one last last week had been dry, what kind of insane uh, growth and revitalization of the caldor we could have seen? This was extremely lucky. That these um, these storms came in with a bit of rain, so yeah. Desiree says I went to watch Holt Haley's weather report. Now I'm back. Cool, Desiree. Can you summarize it? That would be awesome. Um, I would love to watch Holt Haley's stuff, but it kind of goes on for hours, and I have to do my own thing. So, and I can't just sit there and watch it with you guys because you guys should go to him and you know click the like button and watch watch his content so um, 
I wish there was like a 15 minute summary at the beginning and then he could do the rest, but it's frustrating. I, I want to look to him for the fire weather, but I don't have an hour to uh, to look at it or three that sometimes his own broadcasts go on. So if you guys could summarize it for me, that would, that would be awesome. Um, going back to the fawn fire, there's mostly evacuation uh, kind of uh, info about returning to areas that are, have been downgraded from a mandatory to warning. I tweeted some of those things. It was a evacuation orders and warnings update from one hour ago. Residents returning home should use caution and be aware that county roads and fire equipment is still working there. A reminder to the public, if you come across a road and fire hoses are across it, stop and wait to be told that it's safe to cross. If the if the lines are charged, if the hoses are fat and there's actually water in them, never drive over them, just period. It would ruin the hoses and screw up what they're doing. Um, if they're flat, wait to be told that you can cross. Um, this is very blurry. They just sort of did a bad scan of some sort of a document and it's really frustrating. It's not my broadcast that's actually blurry and I can't really read that. Um, I have a small monitor for the uh, for the broadcast, but mandatory evacuation basically remains in place for some areas from Clickapooty Creek. I, that's blurry and I can't read that. West from Wildcat Canyon and south from Juniper Drive. And then there's warnings that remain in place for all kinds of other places, uh, like uh, that anybody familiar with the area still knows about. So. Looking at the uh, morning updates, looks like we got one from one hour ago. Let's watch this about the, the fawn fire. And it's real brief. Hey, good morning. My name's uh, Tim Perkins. Sorry, let me fix the sound. Operation Section Chief with Cal. Hey, good morning. My name's uh, Tim Perkins. Operations Section Chief with CAL FIRE Incident Management Team 4. And today is the uh, operational briefing for September 28th, 2021. So the fire today is broken up into two branches, Branch 1 and Branch 5. We have four divisions on the fire. I'm going to start in Branch 1 down here in Division Yankee. Um, crews are going to be engaged, what we call tactical patrol. They're going to be in and out uh, around the homes. Um, through Oregon Trail in the uh, homes through that uh, area, you know, identifying uh, hazardous trees and the different hazards that the fire kind of created uh, throughout the last week. As you move up into Division Alpha, up near Copper Canyon and through the homes up there, uh, there as well, we're going to have uh, crews engaged in tactical patrol, making sure all the hot spots are out. You'll see crews in and out of the, uh, the homes and on the fire line. Um, as you move up towards the, uh, the easement, the power line easement, up through Alpha into Division Bravo, uh, we're going to continue to hold the, uh, the lines up into Alpha, up towards Radcliffe. Moving towards the top end of the fire, we're calling that Division Bravo, up near the uh, Calaveras uh, quarry. They're still uh, working on uh, some hot spots on the backside where it kind of moves down towards Alley Cove. You'll see crews engaged in there today, making sure that there's no more hot spots in through there. Coming around the top side of the fire, we'll move into Branch 1. Up towards uh, Division Mike and into the Silverthorn area, crews continue to mop up and patrol. Um, they're also doing some tactical patrol in there as well. We've got dozer lines that come down through Silverthorn, uh, holding the fire cruiser and uh, making sure that the fire is not moving uh, any further and the fire has stayed in check through that area. Coming down into Division Tango, um, towards uh, Bear Mountain Road. Um, a, good, a lot of good dozer lines been put in uh, over the last week. That fire is holding in check. We'll have crews to ensure that there's no additional fire movement and they're uh, working on controlling any hot spots that come up. Coming down into uh, Bear Mountain and Division uh, Uniform and then Division Whiskey. Same thing along Bear Mountain where that fire came through a lot of the homes. In through Sunrise, in through Kitty Hawk, we'll have crews engaged. Uh, through the homes, making sure there's uh, no additional hazards as we uh, prepare for our goal of repopulating the entire area. So crews are continuing to engage 
um, uh, all the way down into back towards Oregon Trail to make sure things are safe and there's no additional fire hazards. Thank you. That's the uh, operational update for September 28th. Okay. Um, the operational updates, once again, are, are, are mostly for um, their own crews rather than uh, the public. So the they don't they don't anticipate a whole lot of problems today, and that's that's wonderful. So I'm less concerned about the fawn fire, even though there is a north wind. Um, I'm actually more concerned for the valley in general and the uh, the fact that it's under red flag. Um, I'm more concerned for like new starts, new starts in the valley today, and of course the KNP and the windy. So we have a video roundup time. Um, the summary is Caldor area looking rather well. Um, they had a lot more moisture than they kind of expected. Air attacks up there doing reports and everything that we uh, heard so far was looking pretty good. Um, they're going to transition to a new crew and so they're talking about um, summarizing the situation for the new people coming in. And uh, that'll be sad. We uh, we miss we'll miss the uh, the fun uh, pilot, uh, air attack pilot, who was uh, kind of hilarious sometimes. Um, but they're all they're all pretty pretty good at what they do. The aircraft has really helped turn the tide with the uh, the Caldor. We saw amazing amazing work since uh, day one there. The um, there's no official flood red flag kind of warning over by the KNP or the Windy. However, it's still pretty high fire danger. So we have um, Tobias Peak Lookout is alive. It's still alive and kicking. Um, just a precursory, you know, glance at things. It doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of movement on the Windy, but there's a whole lot of action. It it did um, burn off the top at the peaks and the ridges pretty fiercely, and we saw some pretty uh, eerie kind of time lapses from, uh, for example, the Shirley Peak Cam, where um, a crazy amount of wind just went over uh, over the peaks like a dolphin slipstream, like a dolphin underneath the water. And uh, this is not animating very smoothly. I don't know what's up with my internet connection right now. But uh, the we 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 see that there was a lot of ventilation over at least over the very top of the fire, and so the peaks were blazing up good on the KMP and the windy. Um, the North Fork, uh, as far as the KMP goes, it was in the North Fork of the um, uh, area, and there wasn't much in the way of inhabitation there, like just a bit northwest of where the uh, the Giants Grove is with the Generals. And we saw a lot of helicopters working the scene yesterday, and hopefully they'll they'll be able to today. But uh, those those two remain the the greatest concern. This is actually just stuttering here. I'm sorry. Let me try to tweak my internet connection again. Um, I'm I'm sending little diagnostic reports about my internet troubles to my um uh to my ISP. So sorry. Let me uh. Send one of those. I'm like uh, typing up slow connection to alert wildfire cams. Okay, and uh, let me send that off. And now let me let me uh, hit a let me hit a button here. If it burps, it burps. But if not, it might make the internet better. So bear with me. Okay, just uh, reconnected. Hopefully that'll be better. Let's see what happens. Is it going to load? All right, let's test this again. Let's do a 12-hour time lapse. There we go. See how much smoother that is. Awesome. Okay. And there we can see how the extreme amount of ventilation just kind of went over the uh, over the, the peaks, but we see at the same time that there is still a lot of smoke in the lower elevations, which may have suppressed fire activity at the lower 
lower portions of the KNP and the Windy, um, just just as they were explaining in the meetings. So, um, oh, Husky says my brother is in surgery right right now. Well, I hope I hope everything is okay. You know, uh, prayer sent there. So, um, my internet's working here. Thanks, Morris. Yeah, it. Sometimes it does a seamless little transition. I can hit buttons and go to different servers. Um, but sometimes it'll just completely drop the connection for everybody and I scramble to get it going before YouTube totally uh, disconnects the stream. So, um, Desiree says, overall, we are where we expected to be today and the snow's an added bonus. Thanks, Desiree. Desiree was... Oh, Desiree, you said... Holt has not posted a video in two days. Oh, okay. Well, he's in school for his, uh, what, master's or something in weatherology? <laughs> so I, I don't know that he's going to be able to do stuff every day like he did before. Uh, but he, he's cool. I call him Hainley the Kid. <laughs> he's uh, been such, such a wonderful asset this fire season and last one. Uh, keeping people calm and telling them uh, what to expect with the weather. When my stream ended last year at the, after the glass fire, I was like, guys, you guys are in good hands. There's somebody new on the scene called Holt Haley. Yeah, he knows his stuff about the weather. So, yeah, J.E. Cat says Holt said on Saturday he was back in school. He would try to post late in the evenings and on weekends. Yeah. Well, his, he, a star is born is all I got to say about Holt, you know. He, we'll be saying, hey, we were his original subscribers. I mean, I, I knew about Holt before it was cool, last last year, when I was covering the glass and the Zog finds. So, um, he's working on his master's thesis, but we'll try to update when he can. Okay, let me look back up, because Desiree uh, was trying to summarize um, what Holt's... Uh, what Holt was going to say uh, about this weather event. So um, Desiree says it was two days old, not as current as we would like. The weather system came through just like he said. It didn't come down as far as we wanted. It was not as wet as we had hoped, but more wind than anything in cold air. He talked about the KNP and the Windy mostly, and that there were a couple of spot fires blown off the southwest side, but they were on it. Well, that may have actually been what really hurt the situation they they did explain that we'll do video roundup in a second of the KNP and the windy um that spot fires are what caused um it to get so close to sugarloaf and we know that they they lost some structures and we're not sure how many um this morning's update or maybe if they have a community meeting tonight we'll find out but it was real bad when we saw the uh when we saw the uh heat detections all over Sugarloaf and we were wondering what was happening. They're right here. This is the Sugarloaf Mountain Park and Sawmill uh, historic structures area and you know as you can see when we turn on the, the fire activity the um, it was all over the place. You know, they were speaking about uh, trying to race there with fire crews and by the time that they they arrived they had some structures engulfed or at least uh, impacted greatly. So we, we should go ahead and look at their updates. Fawn fire is looking good guys. We'll continue to watch it but they don't expect any problems today. Um, as for their morning update, Caldor is looking good. I don't think they expect any uh, problems but we can of course watch their update. But the KNP and the Windy, we um, we are really concerned about. Uh, so the that was our fawn fire update. They have 65% containment on it. There's been three five fire injuries. 8,577 acres, 26 damaged structures, 185 destroyed structures, 1,269 threatened. They have 183 engines on the fawn fire. 30 water tenders, 8 helicopters, 50 hand crews, 25 dozers, in total 1,796 personnel, a million cooperating agencies. Um, fire suppression, the current situation with the fawn is that fire suppression personnel will continue to strengthen the lines by patrolling and extinguishing hot spots. Southwest winds today will transition to a north wind event this evening 
with predicted gusts up to 35 miles an hour. Fire suppression, repair, and rehab has begun and will continue throughout the next few days. It's our priority to make the area of fire uh, make the fire areas safe for residents to return to when told. Uh, residents will within evacuation warnings should be prepared to leave at a moment's notice if fire activity does increase. So even though it looks good, that's, that wind is still very threatening, and so it's not a uh, it's not it's not a uh, where in the world is the second page? It's not an entirely safe situation. They just don't expect extra problems. Okay, they have two pages, two two page ones instead of a page one and a page two. Um, <laughs> so I, I can't read the second page. Um, all right, let's go to Cal Fire because they accidentally posted uh, two two page number ones. Um, I guess we have to do this. Cal Fire. I yeah, incidents. Fun. View the details. Okay, hopefully that flyer will um, be posted here. Damage inspection map, okay. Uh, really? Is it not here? I guess not. I, that's why I hate about... Uh, See, here, here is, uh, there should be one-stop shopping, just one website for everything you need on one fire, and it isn't. So here's California's, uh, Cal Fire's uh, official website, and it just has some maps. Finally, it's just hard to navigate. Here's the, it, it just sucks when there's status reports that they put on social media, which not everybody has. And this that everybody can visit doesn't have the same info. It's like why why isn't it here? Ah, okay, so I guess it was a single page, but it said page one. This is basically the same amount of info, um, but it seemed incomplete. There's usually two pages to the incident update. Like so, see how it says page one? Well, is there a page two? There's, there's two uploads of page one. So, well, that, that's all we can see. Uh, if, if they fix it, if there's a... Yeah, this one says that the Cal Fire red page has page one and two. Other people are talking about it. Uh, because the road closures should be on page two. Um, other, other people's questions are, so you're concerned about a wind event and yet you've released equipment and personnel. Please explain that. Well, it's because they don't expect it to move uh, beyond its footprint. So, um, that's that would be the, the, that's the uh, summary. Okay, there's a button here, print status, print the report. I, I don't see a page two. People are saying it's here on Cal Fire. I, I, I don't know what to make of this, guys. Um, <laughs> I, I guess we'll just wait for them to add page two. We know the road closures are Old Oregon Trail at Sunrise Road and Bear Mountain Road, Union School Road at uh, Ridgeview Drive. Bear Mountain Road and Dry Creek Road are now open to residents only. Bear Mountain Road at Silverthorne in Jones Valley Spit is still closed. So, all right. Uh, okay. <laughs> so that's kind of the roundup on the Fawn Fire. Let's uh, let's go check out if there's new K and P and Windy um, updates. Tulare County Fire Department. Tobias Peak is still alive and kicking. 
There's their community meeting from yesterday. I don't see anything new um, at all, like no morning update videos. We could watch the Caldors if we don't have any other videos. That's the operational update from yesterday. Um, so at some point in the morning we'll get one. We do have a new video for the KNP Complex uh, operational update, which was two hours ago. So let's watch that. This is what two minutes long. Let me uh, fix. In on one of the operations sec. Let me fix the uh, sound. Here we go. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Clint Remington. I'm one of the operations section chief trainees with Southwest uh, Team 2. So I'll talk to you folks a little bit today about uh, what we accomplished on yesterday's uh, mission and then the plan going forward for today's shift. So overall, a really successful day yesterday. We had a little bit clearer air with a, a slight west wind. So we did get some operation folks that got to get up and fly. A lot of rotor time and windshield time yesterday really getting a good look at the fire as a whole and potential opportunities we have to to engage it and kind of look at a larger box should we need it so i'll start out with the night shift last night we are running um, resources at night to keep an eye on everything take action where it's needed so last night on the north end um, of night division pretty quiet we've had a little bit of activity up in the sierra x-ray and i'll kind of talk about that a little bit further um, in a minute but that mellowed out about uh, midnight last night, just some isolated pockets of heat, uh, everything pretty quiet on the north end, but that's really all they saw last night. Um, Focus last night with most of the resources down on Mineral King Road. Um, we kind of talked, and all you'll hear me say it again, we talk about this mile marker 1415 stretch. And what's happening there is on that steep cliff um, face that's coming around just above the north side of Mineral King Road. We are having the fire back down a little bit very slowly, but we get what's called rollout, which is as stuff's burning rounds and logs and debris. It'll come down and kind of touch that road. We haven't had anything cross it yet, but as that fire comes down and backs to the road, the guys are being real successful kind of grabbing it and make sure it's at the road and mopping it up and, and securing that. So um, for today, well, I'll go back to yesterday. So yesterday, I'll start out in uh, division. We'll do echo yesterday in branch two. So all of this was pretty quiet throughout the day yesterday. We didn't get a real good look at this because of the smoke with the western wind, a little bit of smoke push over. So the ops folks flying it didn't get a real good look at some of this stuff out to the east. However, we do have resources out there. They've been monitoring the fire behavior. Um, it's been, like I said, pretty mellow out there. Um, but more than anything, we're just monitoring by air using UAS drones, things like that to give us some heat signatures where it is. But feeling pretty good about Division Echo. But as we come around into Division Charlie, um, that's the division that runs along this Mineral King Road here. That has been a huge focus for us. Um, the past couple days in the previous team, they'd put a lot of work into making sure this Mineral King Road is uh, really open and it's going to serve as a good holding feature for us should we need to use it. So. A lot of crews, a lot of engines, what they're doing is going through with heavy equipment, engines, the crews, they're brushing this road out. They've been putting a mobile ground-based retardant on it to make sure that they're prepping that green side. And then anything comes down, we've got a real good opportunity to hold it at the road. Fire behavior-wise, it's just been isolated. It hasn't moved much the last couple days. There's a few fingers here and there that are starting to kind of creep down. Um, plan for today, we're going to have folks figure out how to get into some of that country and engage it more directly with the opportunities with the weather and the higher humidity. So we're going to look to take advantage of some of those conditions, figure out how to get crews a little more engaged direct and try to go direct on the on the fire edge and try to pick some of that up. So we'll see if we're successful there. It sounds like um, they've got a good plan for that. Uh, they did try to fly Oriole Lake yesterday. Um, that was pretty smoked out as well. So didn't get a good look at that. They're hoping today they can either get the UAS in there or or get folks in there and they're trying to find out how to hike into some of that country it's pretty remote access to get in there and need to clear some of that out so they'll be working on that today to get in and assess how everything's going in oriole lake uh, coming around into division alpha you guys can see all these x's up here that's dozer line that's been put in along uh, the fire edge there that's all looking real secure um, they still have folks direct on the fire edge up in here, just making sure that that's checked up, isolated pockets of heat along the fire edge, and overall, um, real successful yesterday, and they'll continue that today with crews. 
The check lines are still in place. As you can see here, we've got these dozer lines to serve as little blocks should we need to tie fire off from one to keep it from spreading to the other. Same thing as Charlie. We're going to try to get folks in here today and look at how to go direct as best we can with the intent that we don't have to use Mineral King Road if we don't have to, that we can secure this fire edge um, on the southern end of the fire there. Structure Group 2, um, they've been down in the community of Three Rivers, um, addressing all the structures in there, coming up with a good protection plan, um, ordering resources and supplies, pumps, hose lays, things like that. So they're getting all that established down in the community of Three Rivers, feeling very good about that, um, right-sized on resources, and, and that plan will continue. So coming around into uh, Division Zulu and X-Ray, we've been working really close with CAL FIRE, a lot of good information, sharing back and forth, sharing of resources. So it's, it's been a real good relationship with those folks and working close with them. They've done a lot of outstanding work the last couple weeks. You know, they've got all of these contingency lines you'll see out to the west. Um, a little closer in, you'll see where they've put some hand line in and tying things into the Kawea Road and North Fork. Uh, things are going well there. They did have a couple slops a few days ago on this North Fork, but they've got all that picked up. Um, no issues, the largest being two acres, so it sounds like we're all secure there. But the plan for today um, is to go in and really try to find opportunities to go direct on this fire edge. A lot of this, when you get into this brushy country, it kind of helps us out if the fire stays parked for a day or two. It gives us opportunities to go in there in the brush and that grass savanna model and really go direct and get some good work in there. You know, it's a little different when you get up higher into the timber country. Um, it's a little more technical, but hopefully we've got some good opportunities to pick up some of this lower elevation stuff direct and get that secured to prevent the fire from wrapping around and threatening anything in Heartland um, or up in Sierra. So a lot of activity yesterday in Division Sierra. They did fly that a bunch with the ops folks. They turned a lot of rotors, and by that I mean a lot of bucket work directly with the crews on the ground, dropping buckets. Um, multiple helicopters yesterday in there and the intent there is to really try to just supply those crews with aerial delivery of water to get any fire spread checked up in here and that's going to be a focus today going forward as well really trying to seal up all of this northern piece between sierra and x-ray on the division break there to eliminate any further spread north we do have contingency plans you guys can see it in place they've got a lot of roads and dozer lines and the highway tied together if if we do need to get into more of a burning operation, but that's second to trying to pick a lot of this up direct. A lot of this country is pretty tough around this fire. Um, the crews and the engines and, and those folks, the crews especially, they're having long hikes in and out, um, rough country, but they're, they're doing exceptionally well. Um, coming around into Division Papa, um, they did do a small burnout yesterday. You can see this little finger here, so they tied that off, got that cleaned up, so this is more of a straight fire edge now. That, uh, that's an awesome operation to have. It keeps anything from getting different on us and trying to, to pooch out one way or the other. So um, still looking at uh, putting a firing plan together should we need it west of the 180, east of the 180, looking for opportunities. Same thing I've been saying, go direct right on the fire edge to try to secure this line to prevent any uh, further north spread. Um, coming around into Lima, you can see you know the small amount of containment we do have and feel good about on the fire. That's these highlighted black lines here, um, kind of west of Lodgepole. And uh, continuation of that, we'll have crews going north, working towards Division Papa as they're coming east to secure this edge. There well, might be a lot of bucket work in there today, um, taking advantage of the air conditions and a little bit of less smoke up in there to go direct with the crew, supporting them with bucket work. And, um, Coming down into structure group one, they are still working in Lodgepole, uh, the giant sequoia grove. So things have gone really well um, in the grove so far. Yesterday they were running um, what's called gel. They, they'll drop gel directly into the grove there. The intent there is to try to protect any of the trees from, uh, from catching fire and burning, and that's all been real well. We'll continue that today. But the folks are feeling really good about the fire that's up in the grove, very low intensity. and. Uh, the prior treatments have done real well to keep the fire activity knocked down there. Um, but it'll be the same story for uh, the giant sequoia grove over to the east there. But you're going to see a lot of resources. We did beef up structure group one um, with some additional engines and some overhead to help those folks out just so they can spread out a little bit more and cover a little bit more country um, and make sure we've got a good plan in place there. So feeling good about Lodgepole, the giant sequoia grove, all that uh, will be a continuation of, of good work to address all the structures and the the giant sequoias in there. Coming into Middle Fork, um, as you can see here, um, fire is still on the south side of it, which is a good stroke. It's keeping it from reversing slope and coming up and giving us any issues in here. So we'll continue to monitor that pretty rough country there. But um, 
we will keep an eye on that and they'll have plans in place should we need to implement actions to the north. Um, I kind of talked about the south end of Echo, but a lot of this is that rockier, scabbier country. It's not real conducive to fire spread. We will have little pockets here and there, but not a huge concern so far from what we're seeing out on this uh, southeastern edge of the fire. Um, but overall, real good day. A lot of information and intelligence gathering and, and things are going real well. So appreciate all the community support. Uh, it's great to see all the signs up that cheers the guys up and they're, uh, we're doing good and happy here to help, uh, help the local community. I appreciate it. No, no, no. We, the community, and we thank you. We appreciate you, firefighters. So um, I want to go back and kind of absorb that. I must confess, I don't have my coffee yet. I need to go. I need to go get some. Um, and I don't like the fact that YouTube is suggesting really weird videos for me to watch. Um, I kind of wanted to go by that uh, a little bit on the slow side and uh, kind of absorb that a little bit. So Big Dog says, is there a difference between gel and the red stuff or is it one and the same? There's actually a, a couple types of... Um, excuse me, i got to go in the kitchen. Ah. Uh, I don't know if I just didn't sleep well because of sinuses or what, but I'm just, I'm having trouble waking up. Um, so there's a couple of types of retardant, so I wish Dusty or, or Bob was here to uh, explain that. Um, there's Foscheck and a couple other varieties. I don't know how runny or how gel-like the various types of retardant are, but um, they... When it does dry out, it loses a little bit of potency, but either way, um, they typically last about three days for good potency. So when we had the K&P and the Windy Breakout, they kept reapplying it. You know, they were basically lightning at the top of, uh, of mountains. And so the top of the mountains was burning only. They, they were small for a long time. It was just so sad that... Uh, they didn't have the resources they need to respond in time to keep it small. Um, but they put the fire in a retardant cage. And that is one of the best things that... Uh, okay. That's one of the best things the aircraft can be used for. The moment that a fire breaks out, they can just basically put it in a big red cage. Like so. But the problem was, and everything went to hell uh, after on the K&P and the Windy when smoke meant that they couldn't fly the aircraft and then it eventually dried up became ineffective and then wind picked up and the Windy and the K&P uh, escaped their cage and burned right through the ve vegetation that had the red on it previously and got out so uh, yeah if anybody else is more familiar uh, with that, some of the retardant is runny, liquidy stuff, and some of it is more of a gel, and I just don't know which name brands are which. So, um, the uh, looking back at Morris says, I would like to know who the cheese burrito was with that bumped my... I don't know what that is. Okay, we got a spammer. Hang on a second, guys. Um, done. Okay. Wow, I was on that. That was a quick draw. <laughs> the uh, the cam cam thing was back. Um, those spammers, guys, like if they ever say, uh, watch you know the cam girls or whatever that is, just uh, don't hit hide user. Um, hit the button to report um, explicit material. Just um, hit, hit that button. Smitty, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Don't hide them. Just hit the hit the report button um, and then they won't even kind of be here visible uh, there's complications if you do the hide button first so anyway I, I got taken care of let's look back at this and just absorb this and understand what's going on completely we know that we um, when we were watching the buck rock uh, cams we saw a whole bunch of aircraft yesterday and he did gesture tour it and most things are looking much better than we than we expected and that's what he reported but Mineral King, um, and down here by Silver uh, City, I wanted to understand a little bit more about what their strategy is. Uh, 
and uh, what, what's going on with the North Fork. So let's let's go over it. Piece of the fire. We have a uh, Division Sierra, and as you can see, a lot of the purple on this map around Heartland. Um, this is all contingency line, so there's a lot of dozer line, hand line, different pieces that have masticated line, which these... Oh, it was masticated. Okay, that's when we should drink milk. Okay, drink. It's part of the drinking game. Uh, not alcohol, of course, but half and half or coffee. Um, masticators we are extremely enthusiastic about because they are new technology that makes building a fire line so much faster and um, cheaper. So purple I love the color code anywhere that you have dark X's that means it's a dozer line and it's complete and I, I'm glad to see that there's a lot of complete lines the black ones down here are their main dozer lines and he's explaining that purple was contingency that's great that's uh, that's their second second chance lines if the fire were to uh, breach the first ones which they call a slop over. They're all in place, really. If the fire pushes A, then we can fall back to B. Exactly. The contingency line is the fire pushes on A, they can fall back to B and man the station. And that's great that they have more than one set of lines because you would, if it is dangerous for them, it's best for them to leave and wait until the situation improves rather than sit there and risk their lives on a road thinking oh this is this is the only d line of defense that we have here for this fire it's it's best for them to make extra ones fall back to the secondary ones and go back and go direct and directly attack the fire um, when it's a bit safer like after a wind event now everywhere he's touching that says R that's where a road already exists. See, really faintly here it says Cherry Road, and that means they've used the road and improved it in order to make it a fire line. And that's that's mostly that's what a fire line is. Is basically it's a road that they make. Um, they can travel on it and suppress fire, and basically they've cleared the ground so that fire can't move along the ground. And um, any time the fire uh, spots over, then they use that same road or that line to access it and uh, get it get it out. So that's what R's mean. They're using an existing road, and the X's are like they made kind of a new one to make a fire line. So the uh, um, he was talking about using masticators to quickly make it, and that explains why they have so much of it on the map. Those are brand new type of technology that. Uh, it's like a tractor with a grab claw at the end of it that grabs things like trees and bushes and then it has a wood chipper at the end of it and it just goes Bruh! and the entire uh, bushes and trees and stuff disappear and stumps and logs and it becomes little wood chips on the ground which are not going to cause a huge flare up like a, like a tree on fire or a bunch, a bunch of uh, bushes. It's way more environmentally uh, friendly than uh, the old dozer type technology too. Um. But a lot of work happening up here in Sierra in the northern corner. So the past couple days, um, they've done a really good job working with heavy equipment, dozers, um, lots of hand line with the crews, going in and trying to pick up this northern fire edge direct. They are having to go indirect in places here and there, which means they're not right along the fire's edge, but having to back off a little bit just because of the terrain and uh, safely getting people in and out of access to the fire. So that's all going to continue moving kind of... Um, west to east coming around as best they can until we get over in Division Papa. So Division Papa coming down that General Sherman 180 highway. A lot of focus on securing anything across the 180 road right now that's already across and looking at if we have to down the road and we get pushed, coming up with a firing operation plan if we need to along the highway to kind of connect the dots and, and firm that fire piece up. Um, but a very busy division over in Papa as well. Yeah, so that looks like it's one there. When they say busy, um, that that means that there's a lot of uh, uh, action there, lots of uh, fire threat, and lots of uh, resources assigned to, uh, to immediately address it. So that's one of those places where I've been looking at the uh, situation. Uh, a lot of times, the wind is blowing the fire towards the northeast, and so I don't know what little Baldy is, um, but the Cabin Creek area. Um, when they say busy, you know, that, that they mean that there's a lot of uh, fire activity and threat. So, Lodgepole, he was saying, looks very good. 
that's that's a bunch of structures that we were very worried for. Um, so one thing to look at, Vision Pop-Up, Cabin Creek, he's saying very busy. We'll have to continue to look at that, but I, I don't know if we'll ever have a direct camera view because because of to the north here where um, where the rocky uh, uh, no not rocky oh gosh 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 sorry guys I'm still not very awake here um, that one fire lookout just to the north I have to go look at the cams it doesn't seem to be able to see around this this mountain so um, that's why I'm interested in hearing what he has to say about it oh. Coming over into Lima, um, you'll see a lodge. Well, that was it, I guess. He just said it was busy and there's a lot of activity. Okay. Pole group and a giant forest group. We've combined that into what's called a structure group one. And really the purpose of that structure group is they work within a geographical area on the fire to protect values at risk. Okay, guys, what's going on with the uh, unhiding the, uh, the spammer thing? Uh, I, I, I took care of that already. Thanks for, you know, trying to pounce on it. But if we if we uh, do too much with the spammer, oh, okay, guys, just 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 cool it with the spammer. Um, I had already taken care of it. Um, just uh, I was just trying to explain that the best course of action is to hit the three dots, hit the red, hit the flag, and then hit. Uh, and then hit, um, you know, report for uh, adult content and explicit, you know. But um, I want to type in, uh, make sure you are live. Hit the button under volume. Because uh, sometimes if I have an internet burp like that, uh, we go back, uh, people... Uh, are actually several minutes behind where the video is. So if you um, sometimes I look back into the chat, people are responding to what I've said or what's happened, like you know, like 10 minutes ago or 20 minutes ago. If you ever rewind the stream or if it ever has an internet burp like I had a bit, a bit ago, sometimes people are not live. So underneath where it says play and and uh, whatever on a desktop, make sure you hit the live button and you'll be you'll be present with us. So. Um, What's coming out of Twitch? I'm I'm not uh, Twitch. What I'm not broadcasting on a Twitch. So is there something I need to address in chat? Sorry guys, let me uh, take a look. Um, uh, Twitch. What? I'm just broadcasting to YouTube, so um, is there something I'm missing? Some of you still have it on your screens. Oh, weird. Okay, that I was unaware of. Okay, so. Then in that case, I guess we have to report then hide. Ah, this is so bad. What it did was it immediately hid it for me. So if you still have it on your screens, then I guess we have to report then then hide. But here's the thing: after I did the report, I can't hide. Uh, okay. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. I guess the new uh, protocol would be hide report. It's just the opposite of what I said then. So sorry guys. Thanks for thanks for catching that now. It's fine now? Okay, good. good. All right, let's go. Um, which could be the structures, it could be the giant sequoias themselves, but really our main priority right now is ensuring that we've got structure protection in place for all the infrastructure buildings and, and things surrounding the fire. But they do kind of dual duties, um, really checking up on the giant forest and uh, the stuff in lodge pole. So you'll see this black line here, which is um, containment line, and in Division Lima, they're going to start working north trying to bring containment line with a mix of um, hotshot crews, engines, things like that, working with heavy equipment to go right along the fire edge and look for opportunities to engage that and work around to Papa to shore up this northeast end of the fire. Oh, the structure group one I did talk about, they're going to have a very large presence um, in here in the giant forest group. So they will be in here um, checking structure protection, 
looking at opportunities if we need to put some fire down and ease it through some of those giant forests, uh, the giant sequoias, we'll have a good solid plan for that if, if we need it. Um, this middle fork has been what we've really been paying attention to the last couple days. Fire still on this kind of southern side of middle fork, but we are watching. There was a little bit of activity up in here last night, so we're going to keep a good eye on that. We will have a division supervisor in there today from our team really looking at plans in place to make sure, A, if we can hold this, B, if we can't, what it looks like impacts coming up in here. And so that these folks will work together in golf and the, the giant forest group to make sure they're talking to each other and really have a lot of good intelligence there. Okay, so that was critically important that, uh, this is, I'm sorry, this is why we're kind of replaying the video, is I like to play the whole thing without interruption and then go back and, and do a step-by-step -step because some people just need the whole video to play, boom, and they need to go about their business. And they can absorb it fast, and they have fire uh, training, and they know about it. But for the rest of us, it's best to analyze it bit by bit, like what's at risk, what's in danger. And so we were looking, uh, we were celebrating how here is where the General Sherman tree and such uh, is located, how they've been doing such a wonderful job protecting it and the four uh, sentinels. And they, they do have some black line, which is right there, meaning they don't expect the fire to pass and, uh, unless extreme circumstances develop. We're, we're talking like insane winds or something. So um, what we would love to see is a black you know, line all the way around it. Um, but they said that we were, they were watching this. And this is what concerned me extremely, uh, uh, excuse me, greatly as well, is that, um, I mean, here is... Here is a, a basically a, a river a drainage, but on this section of it right here, we have fire that went all the way down to the base, and fire loves to climb, and so it could climb straight up and attack the uh, come up over the ridge and hit the the giant grove, you know, the generals group um, from the south. That's what we've been worried about from day one, as the um, paradise section was over here and the colony section was over here that it could be attacked from two side two sides from the south and from the east from about two different fires and they merged because it already did cross and climb and climb the hill and this is a really fat wide section right here where it's been expanding in each direction uh to the north and well east to west north south however you want to orient that it's been spreading out uh, uh on the sides and um, one little spark, like one little wind gust blowing it right over the creek, it would race right up to the top of the of the mountain. That's an extremely steep uh, incline. There wouldn't be a way to really stop it. So they said that they were watching that. And so, are the giants safe up there? It's they're not out. They're they're not uh, completely safe. So it's looking. They've done a good job so far, but they, they're worried about it, and so should we. What it looks like impacts coming up in here, and so that these folks will work together in golf and the, the giant forest group to make sure they're talking to each other and really have a lot of good intelligence there. So coming around into Division Echo, a lot of this is more of a monitor um, type deal. There's been a lot of prescribed burn fuel treatments um, the last couple of years, and that has been a huge, huge help, really limiting fire spread on this southern piece out to the east, and it's Sorry, I read chat again. Let me go back. <laughs> the giant forest group to make sure they're talking to each other and really have a lot of good intelligence there. So coming around into Division Echo, a lot of this is more of a monitor um, type deal. There's been a lot of prescribed burn fuel treatments um, the last couple of years, and that has been a huge, huge help, really limiting fire spread. Hey, so we were wondering, uh, did they do any fuels reduction around the north part, uh, north of Mineral King Road, and you just confirmed that they did. We know that they did around the, the other giants areas before, which has really been helping. So I'm feeling a little bit better and a little bit better uh, as the days go on uh, for Silver City and the Mineral King. Uh, they're basically like historic type restored ghost towns, as far as I understand, uh, historical treasures. But they're in a very, very uh, vulnerable spot. This map does not show at all just how dang steep this is. So here's here's the road, and it's like, here's the ridge, and there's it's a sheer, almost a sheer vertical cliff from here to here to here to here. And so fire can roll down the, uh, roll down the ridge uh, uh, to it, and 
there'd be no way to stop it. You can't you can't just sit there at the bottom of the of the road and three thousand feet above you have a giant sequoia shatter in half and roll down to you. That would be like a tank rolling down the hill. You can't stand in front of it. Um, and so we've been uh, quite concerned that they may not, be, may not be able to hold the road a couple times. They abandoned everything because there's only one way out. And they they come back to uh, man the station. So he's talking about how uh, fire, we were wondering, why hasn't the fire just rolled over that ridge and immediately attacked the towns and gone down the other side? Well, he was talking about fuels reduction efforts in the past where they've actually uh, removed dead vegetation and... Uh, thinned out areas and you know burned off pine cones and duff uh, pine needles on the base so I'm so happy that they to hear that they have done that in the past that's helping them now on this southern piece out to the east and it's a lot of rocky kind of broken country not real conducive to large fire growth so this is more of a monitor show while we're really working to secure all the structures and keeping an eye on the on the giant sequoias so great that that really helps them like not have to uh, be everywhere at once and they can focus on the structure protection and tree protection you know the old uh, the old growth protection this is great a lot of good work happening in there um, coming down into mineral king we're still going to have a handful of vigilance presence in there we have been working hand in hand with cal fire um, doing some great work a lot of communication back on back and forth with our resources so Mineral King will still have a presence in there, making sure structure protection is taking place, and we've got good plans and and place in there. You're going to see, we do have I think over 75 like Mark III portable pumps pumping water, and we've got engines all over the place. So there's a lot of equipment and supplies being delivered throughout the fire to make sure the resources have what they need to implement those structure protection plans. Big focus today is going to be Mineral King Road. Um, there's going to be a lot of effort going forward the next couple of days to really make sure this road is, lack of better terms, as bomb proof as we can get it. We're gonna have a lot of equipment, crews. Um, we do have a bunch of water tenders that are spraying retardant along the road. So really we have every intention of using this as a primary holding feature. If fire were to come down towards Mineral King in which it has in a couple spots, you're gonna be able to see where it's kind of coming down, touching the road. So we're picking that up as it's coming and just making sure we're keeping fire north of this Mineral King road all the way through. So we do have, you're going to be able to see some multiple check lines here in case we do end up needing to, to do some burnout operations. We will have places to hang the fire up if we need to reevaluate and continue if we need to. But Mineral King Road is a big deal for us. It's a major, major priority. Uh, coming around to the west into Division Alpha and Zulu, you're going to see it looks like a very busy map, a lot of lines everywhere. But the purpose of that is, like I said, in the north, a lot of contingency line to give us multiple options. We don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket. So that's what contingency line is. We really make sure if push comes to shove, we have multiple options to try to engage the fire. So continuation of that work, especially with three rivers, very, very important. We've got a bunch of engines and equipment and things happening in there. So three rivers is a major, major focus for us, making sure we're stopping any fire spread as best we can coming down Mineral King to limit any threats over into three rivers. So. That's why a lot of focus is happening up here to ensure three rivers is good. But you will see a lot of equipment, engines, um, lines being put in around the community there. Uh, coming around into Zulu and X-Ray, um, CAL FIRE has done an awesome job. Lots of contingency line and options out to the west if we need it, but still a major priority is using these old ridge lines, old skitter roads, things like that, that they're going in with heavy equipment opening up. In some of this country, we're not going to be able to get real direct in there. It's just very tough to get folks in. If somebody were to get hurt, it's going to be very, very difficult to get them out. So a lot of intelligence gathering here still, but they do have a good plan if the fire were to start moving out to the west. Multiple options to pick up the fire spread moving west. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you guys? That's kind of the update for today. Hopefully we have some clearer air. I know it's been uh, it pretty socked in with smoke, and that's really limited our aircraft availability in the past really being able to utilize a lot of helicopters retardant operations things like that so hopefully we'll have a couple days of clear air be able to get some operations folks up to really fly the fire make good sense of it um, using drones uas and uh, doing heat signatures coming up with ignition plans there's a lot that's going to happen the next couple days to give us the best amount of real-time intelligence we we can gather so that's the update for today appreciate it Okay, I I like that style of of um, of uh, update. 
So that is the KNP. I don't think that we have a windy uh, update. Usually, I think they're recorded around 7 in the morning, but it takes several hours for them to make the uh, make their way to the internet. I kind of wonder if it just takes that long to do the upload. Um, I mean, we are talking about uh, extremely, you know, non-developed kind of uh, uh, boonies, <laughs> for other uh, uh, lack of a better term. Um, you know, wilderness. So I keep checking Tulare County Sheriff's Office. Um, we don't have any new evacuation updates. Everything there looks pretty good. Um, we can go to uh, Tulare County Fire Department. We just have we just have the community meeting of yesterday, 16 hours ago. Really, nothing new for any kind of update on the on the windy. Uh, there were updated maps that showed up on Facebook, which are going to be com completely, completely useless uh, because of the, uh, the activity overnight. So, yeah, we have like 20 hours ago uh, updates. So we'll just keep checking to see if there's been a new video. Um, oh, 23, 25 minutes ago, Sequoia National Forest. Gave us a windy update. Shut my mouth. But we, you know, we don't have a video update. We can read this. Um, Forty-one minutes ago, the windy fire. Resources are two thousand and four hundred two personnel. Wonderful that they're getting so many more people arriving. Sixty-nine hand crews, one hundred and thirty-three engines, sixteen helicopters, thirty-five dozers, and nine water tenders are on the scene. A structures threatened is. 2,000 residences, 100 commercial structures, and it says uh, structures destroyed, two commercial structures. Tulare County resident information. They will begin assessing damage to homes and property in the Sugarloaf and F Pine Flat areas. Community members impacted by the windy can call the Tulare County Info Hotline 559-802-9790. Affected property owners should complete a September lightning fire information form online. People who have cabins and summer home tracks and forest will be contacted by Sequoia National Forest. So maybe at tonight's uh, meeting, if they have one, we'll find out uh, what really was impacted. Um, that report may be really tip of the iceberg. It's going to take them a while to go in there and assess actually what's what was damaged. So um, we don't know exactly how many uh, structures were destroyed or damaged. Um, the Windy Fire is currently 87,318 acres with 4% containment. It's a full suppression fire, meaning they're not wanting any any amount of it to continue burning anywhere. It's been like that from day one according to them. And I believe them, by the way. The fire is burning on the Tule River Indian Reservation and Sequoia National Forest, including the giant Sequoia National Monument. Fire perimeter increased 1,935 acres in the last 24 hours. So almost 2,000 acres in the last 24 hours. That's actually pretty mild compared to what it could have been. Yesterday, gusty westerly winds up to 40 miles an hour tested containment lines on the east perimeter. So we were correct. Last night I speculated it was 35 to 45 mile an hour winds uh, just looking at the cams and so that's our confirmation. I don't know how they're com confirming that. Like did, did they have a mobile weather station? Because uh, the uh, there are no weather stations anywhere near the, the windy fire, not, not near its heart. I would be very curious to know. So it says, yes, yesterday, gusty westerly winds up to 40 miles an hour tested containment lines on the east perimeter. From Ponderosa south to Johnsondale, the containment lines held, yay, and no spot fires were observed outside the perimeter. Now that's the areas where they, uh, they lit the landscape on fire, lighting backfires to kind of create a scorched earth area. And uh, looks like that worked very well. 
On the south and the southeast side, uh, the fire made it very active between Baker Peak and Tobias Peak. Now there are, those are two mountains with lookouts on them. Tobias Peak is the one with the camera. We're hoping the Baker Peak lookout survived. The fire has burned into the 2016 Cedar Fire Scar, which has moderated fire activity. Well, good. I guess, uh, I guess they didn't have too many bushes grow back up, or maybe they had uh, burned them off the landscape. It's hard to say. Today, a cold front will move through the area, bringing gusty westerly winds up to 40 miles an hour on the ridges and the upper slopes. The winds will provide favorable conditions. Winds blow the active fire back into the area that's already burned. Awesome. For conducting defensible firing ops on the west side. Oh, that's wonderful. I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Today, the priority remains on the southwest side in Sugarloaf and the Pine Flat areas. Fire engines continue to engage in structured defense and extinguishing hotspots, which are tree stumps and down logs. Along the dozer lines and hand lines that extended that extended into California Hot Springs. On the northwest side, favorable, favorable winds will allow crews to continue conducting defensive firing ops southward towards the Wheatons. The firing ops uh, removes the firing operation removes ve vegetation and provides a black line to show slow the fire's progress westward on the Tui Reservation. Ground crews will be uh, Supported by water dropping helicopters. Crews also continue to destruct, construct indirect, weaning away from that fire's edge, dozer lines from Wheaton's south to Corral Hill in order to stop the fire from progressing to the west. You know, uh, when, when the f wind pushes it that way next, uh, next wind shift. On the north side, crews continue to improve existing containment lines on the Koi Flat Road, northeast of Koi Flat. So let me uh, change uh, something about my stream notice here. An update. There we go. On the north side, crews continue to improve existing containment lines along Koi Flat Road, northeast of Koi Flat. Their efforts have been successful. Successful in keeping the fire south of Camp Nelson. That's another place where they lit the uh, landscape on fire uh, when they had... Uh, uh, favorable winds and uh, prevented the powder keg scenario. Huge sigh of relief. If they didn't do that, if they didn't have favorable uh, wind, uh, a wind shift that allowed them to do that, then uh, Camp Nelson might have been a pile of ash by now. So, man, that, there are some strokes of luck that have been happening here on the Windy. Um, crews and engines are in place in Camp Nelson and in Mountain Air. On the northeast side, near Ponderosa, crews continue holding and improving containment lines from the Western Divide Highway east to Lloyd Meadows Road and south to Johnsondale. With the increased winds today, firefighters will be looking for any hot spots caused by blowing embers or debris. On the east-southeast side, fire remains active from Flynn Canyon south to Devine's Peak. Oh yeah, you could say that. The Tobias Peak cams have been pretty wild. <laughs> Crews continue to work along the Sugarloaf Road towards the Spear Creek summer home tract, improving fire lines and providing structure defense. The fire is backing down the slope east towards Kern River. The fire behavior specialist briefed firefighters this morning to be on the lookout for increased fire activity below Baker Point. That's an area that did not burn in either the Cedar or McNally fires. Crews will continue clearing around structures in the Fairview area as the fire moves closer. Fairview is on the east side uh, by the Kern River, on the east side of the river. Weather and fire behavior. The incident meteorologist is forecasting gusty westerly winds on the upper ridges and the slopes up to 40 miles an hour meaning winds from the west going to the east, just like, well, yesterday. Very cool conditions are expected with temperatures in the 50s to the 60s. Evacuation orders. The following information is from Tulare County Sheriff's Office. Um, for Windy Fire Evacuation Warning Map Area, go to Tulare County, 
.ca.gov slash emergencies or call 211. Um, these are the same. We already went over that. Just visit that website if you are unfamiliar. Um, road closures and restrictions at Jack Ranch Road and Old Stage Road. Highway 190 at Rio Vista. MT-99 at Gold Ledge Campground. MT-56 at Fountain Springs. Emergency notification alerts. Tulare County residents can sign up to receive county emergency notifications by registering at alerttc.com. They had trouble with that at the very beginning of the fire, but hopefully they ironed it out. The evacuation centers and all that information is also at the website. It's also listed in the description of the video. Sequoia National Forest Closures link and Smoke Outlook. You go to fire.airnow.gov. Uh, which looks like this. And uh, you can see that it's looking better that this wind has been blowing it towards Nevada, but on the east side of the fire and in Nevada, it's looking pretty bad with air quality, with the uh, thickest uh, smoke and, and worst uh, conditions over, um, you know, unhealthy, like Keeler, California. And um, uh, I guess it's not quite Nevada, but we're getting on to the Nevada line over at, uh, what, Lone Pine, California? Unhealthy for sensitive groups. So that's the uh, smoke outlook. It's a pretty pretty decent graph. And uh, the cams show a whole lot of clarity uh, for the first time in weeks, sometimes even months, uh, in the valley right now. So. Um, while the wind is uh, kind of fueling the fire, we've gotten pretty lucky over the last uh, 48 hours and hopefully we'll re remain uh, uh, lucky today. Okay, so well, let's look back. Yeah, LNT, I hope the Baker Peak lookout uh, survives as well. I think we had the, one of the windows open that was showing where it was. Um, I may have closed it. Now let's go back and look at the current satellite images of NOAA weather. Yeah, Vesalia, like general information, um, if we hit the satellite view, geocolor animation loop, you can kind of see a lot of that smoke and nastiness being pushed towards Nevada. Sorry, Nevada. And out of the state, um, no rain. Come on, man. Well, at the same time, that north wind is forming, and you can kind of see it kind of coming around. Whoops, wrong pen color. Some of it's coming from the ocean. Some of it's coming from uh, the desert. And the good news is, is that at the Fawn Fire, they don't expect that to be a big danger. However, residents it, just south of Lake Shasta and the east side of I-5 should just be alert. And kind of check things throughout the day. So um, if we look carefully, sometimes we can see which direction the fire is moving based on its smoke, but it's really too hard to tell. There's there's cloud cover, um, and that's interfering with telling what what's what. But uh, we could go back and look at the cams. At this point in time, though, during the daytime, uh, pretty much the fires go invisible. <laughs> like here's Shirley Peak, it's bespattered with ash. Uh, last three hours, smoke just kind of came over to it and settled in. It's south of the fire, uh, just kind of looking to the north, uh, looking at the, the windy. We can keep looking at the heat detections, but we don't see a lot, except up on the uh, the Baker. I think that was the Baker Peak area. Um, we'll see if there's any aircraft. Hopefully there can be uh, today. I I think there's a good chance. Um, where's the heat detection button? Activity. 
detections. Yeah, there's nothing red currently, so maybe there's a lull in the wind. You can look at windy and see which times of the day you should uh, be expecting. More of a wind thing. They said the south side of Baker Ridge has the most fuels because it's that's the area that hasn't burned in a while. So we there's Baker Peak right there. The lookout towers at Baker Point, which is adjacent. Now if we go into uh, Modus and Veers, we did have heat detections near it. Hopefully it stays safe. But uh, this is kind of the spot to watch here. Let's look at Tobias Peak. That's our current info uh, from both cams. Um, the Tobias Peak 2 overnight was was kind of alarming, but good in that we didn't see much of the fire actually approach the tower. We did see a little bit, which was uh, for five minutes, uh, freaked us out, but it was just more the manzanita bushes that they unfortunately, or manzanita type of bushes that they unfortunately allowed to grow ne right next to the structure, and right up around the uh, critical critical radio uh, set. But hopefully it's it's working. So we know that the fire is all around it. But notice how the smoke stays down there in the, in the uh, valley areas that moderated that activity, and um, helped to burn the ridges off. Which, well, if the peaks exhaust all their fuel, that's what causes long range spotting, and that would be a blessing actually. That um, that the wind is well, not crazy, but not um, weak enough to allow the smoke. If the ridges burn off, that would reduce the chance that if we had a major crazy wind event, that long range spotting would occur. So this could be a strange kind of weird mixed blessing. Um, seeing what we were seeing on the camps. So now there's cloud cover at Tobias Peak at the moment. And... Um, over at the Shirley uh, cam as well. Um, we can look at what's going on at the Caldor at the moment. But for the most part, we've had strokes of good fortune, which we'll take it. You know, not, not everything's been rosy. I mean, we've had groves impacted and such, but really, compared to with with the weather forecast, we, we've kind of dodged some bullets. Today we have a red flag day in uh, the valley. Any new fires in the valley are going to probably be very bad. Um, north of uh, San Joaquin area. Um, but, wow. That's the overall assessment. Is uh, They've been lucky. Yay. Knock on wood. Yay. So, uh, let's see what else we have. Uh, let's see if we have a Dixie fire update. Um, that's at 94-ish percent containment. That got some moisture. I hear it rained in such near Quincy. Oh, that's right. We were gonna look. We were gonna look at the. Uh, whoops, not Zone Haven. The current windy uh, uh, forecast. There's stuff off the coast, and see what. Um, let's start at Tahoe. See when the winds of today were supposed to be uh, at their worst. So we still have 32 mile an hour winds up by the Echo Summit area to 45 mile an hour winds um, that are now uh, tapering off down to around 16 to 25 ish mile an hour wind gusts with almost a dead calm, but uh, three to six mile an hour winds uh, sustained. Not very warm today. A high of 51 near uh, near uh, the Echo Lakes at Tahoe. So it's looking pretty good. The north wind will um, gust up to 24 miles an hour by 2-ish, between 2 and 5, and then it tapers off. Um, looking pretty good. If we hit the wind gust, that's um, oranges, uh, colors, and yellowish colors are like 20-ish mile an hour winds. Greens are like the 15s. And as we move, 
we've got the reds down there by Bakersfield. See, that's by the windy. But as we move the slider, things look better and better for Tahoe until about 11 p.m. Wednesday night when some winds uh, return. But keep your eye on down there by Bakersfield. See that, you know, 50, 45 and 50 miles an hour in the uh, dark purples. The uh, the windy is definitely affected by all that. This, the tail end of it in the south, especially. So we can um, kind of see that uh, the winds are present. Let's uh, let's go down and plant the flag a little bit north of Isabella, where the windy is currently at and so we have an almost dead calm with a little bit of winds picking up from two to five like eight mile an hour winds sustained and in general the wind direction would be uh, well it's a northwest wind blowing to the southeast but kind of hard to the southeast uh, so we could see a big it's almost like a west wind pushing to the east but with a tiny uh, that's the way I describe it with a tiny been to the south and uh, it, it's in a an awkward kind of a pattern like that so make of that what you will uh, <laughs> the windy is a big fire um, nice thing is it's gusts instead of like major uh, wind driven plus gusts eight to nine mile an hour winds are very mild and they taper off to almost a dead calm by by uh, eight, but 35 to 40 mile an hour wind gusts, just like they were saying at uh, the morning uh, update on the KMP, really is mostly affecting the the peaks. So we can uh, have fingers crossed. That means that smoke might still kind of be sibling in uh, in the valleys, the up there in the mountains, kind of putting a damper on uh, activity. For the fire to low, lower elevations so a high of 55 degrees only yay even though there's a lot of winds uh, the fact that it's a cold temperature and a bit more uh, humidity in, in there is why it's not considered red flag so let's look back at the chat yep like exactly what Morris is saying, more smoke means less oxygen in the air, right? Because there's less uh, uh, wind blowing it away and blowing new oxygen on it. Sea probes has several helicopters and one air attack. Each is over to K and P and Windy. Some also over to Caldor. Nothing near the Fawn. No tankers in sight anywhere in North Northern California. Think Sea Probe uh, with the wind? I don't know that they'd be effective. See, helicopters can do precision drops, and they can kind of fling their bucket to where they want it. But the, with a fixed wing, with, a, with an actual uh, airplane, they've got to go low to the ground, and they usually drop directly over their target. And if there's wind, well, then they don't hit their target. So helicopters, though, kind of do tricks, and they can approach a fire and veer away from it in the, kind of like a horseshoe pattern. And when they're at the uh, top of the swing, so to speak, like they they can they can fly towards it and then veer away. And right at this point, before they make a hard right turn, they can release the bucket and splash, and do tricks like that to try to get the momentum to fling the the, the retardant or the water uh, where they want it to go. But yeah, aircraft that is uh, airplanes can't can't do that really um, they can't pull those tricks so currently it's 50 degrees at twin bridges near echo summit yep so look back up at chat does anybody have a question about any of the fires it's kind of open question and answer time there's not that much to report after we run through all the videos um, we can look at Ventus sky which is really good getting us a better visual on the uh, understanding of what winds are generally doing. A reminder, what we've been finding out is there are very few um, pretty much like that weather stations anywhere in the Southern Sierras. Very, in fact, maybe just like one 
near peaks. Most of them are down in shelter valleys. Um, so every single weather predicting program kind of fills in the gap based on what the other stations are reporting with an estimate of what the wind's doing. So anywhere deep in the windy fire, we have no idea what it's actually doing. There are no weather stations there. And so what all these models are doing is basically guesstimating the cams are the thing that's going to show us the, um, the, the, the truth about the situation. Occasionally they can launch a, uh, launch a weather balloon, but we haven't heard if they've been doing that. So if we look at today's like 2 o'clock, this is the ground uh, surface winds. Um, but if we go to the 2,500 meters, everything changes because this is the actual 8,000 foot elevation-ish where the ridges are actually burning. And you can see it's a west wind going to the east. If we go back down to like the valley area, it's more of a south going to the north. See? But what, what matters is the peaks. That's where the wind is penetrating and that's where it's actually affecting the uh, the fires up on top of the uh, ridges and peaks. So it'll try to push towards the east, but it held last night and held the day before. That's absolutely wonderful. What I was going to explain um, when I was reading the uh, reading the report is that with with the windy, which is just just kind of around here, sort of. Oop, that's a big pen. The windy. Uh, fire perimeters is just, just kind of a big approximate thing. To protect places like Johnsondale, uh, when the wind was blowing to the west, they lit fires like so, and they went towards the fire line and, and burned, put a piece of black earth. They didn't kill the living trees. I mean, it already had been affected by fires, but they burned off the brush, so to speak, so that that protected Johnsondale and Fairview and other places when yesterday and the day before the winds shifted and they were the west wind was blowing it towards the east well it ran into a black line of pre-burned area and so that really has saved the towns uh, well for the moment same thing with the K&P and others like uh, with uh, with Camp Nelson so like with uh, sorry the northern part of the, the windy is Camp Nelson it looked like the windy was going to march north towards it and hit that powder keg of the uh, explosive potential because of the uh, last year's SQF complex, the, which was called the Castle Fire, which burned so many sequoias. Well, they've had a year to dry out, and those trunks could burn, especially if fire was at the base. Uh, the, the bush, There's a year of bushes and uh, plant growth at the base. Well, they had the wind shifts around here so often that they've had a huge stroke of fortune that they did the same thing. They they put a black line in front of Camp Nelson, and when the wind shifted back to the north, it kind of hit it and kind of stopped. As they lit fires at Camp Nelson down to the uh, existing dozer lines they had from last year's fire. So, phew, huge, gigantic sigh of, sigh of relief that that's holding. Same thing for Fairview on the east uh, part where the Kern River is. Um, and right now, huge sigh of relief for. Uh, California Hot Springs and the Sugar Loaf area and uh, Pine, uh, gosh, I can't remember, Pine Flats. The fire went right up to its doorstep and did start burning structures, but then the wind shifted, and so now the wind's going that way. So at California Hot Springs, uh, Pine, uh, Pine uh, Flats, excuse me, and at Sugar Loaf, they're going to do more firing ops today because their firing ops will blow towards where the fire is and create that black line. They need it because whenever the fire is pushed by winds again by the opposite direction, it's going to hit the black line and hopefully stay out of the communities. So this has actually been the craziest stroke of luck that the wind is shifting whenever they need it to, to protect towns. Wow. It's not the rain we ordered, but that'll do. That'll do. <laughs> cool. You know, we'll we'll take what we can get. So let's let's look back to uh, chat.
if anybody has a question about how that works, I'll be happy to explain it better uh, with the, the maps and stuff in place. So let me go back to um, chat. Um, Happy Camper says Robert Ferguson Observatory had flames 10 feet from the observatory doors. Strike team surrounded it and saved it. Wow, when was that? Um, and Alan was saying something. Uh, uh, Alan says I was on the initial wildland attack down at Ranch Road behind Calaveras Reservoir. We had it almost contained at 35 acres, but we w could not get air support as they were directed at other places. We ran out of deep water and steep, ru steep rugged terrain. We watched it get away. Oh, when was that, uh, Alan? Um, was that the S? CU uh, and C probe just says not surprised I expect wind advisories are keeping fixed wings away from the mountains yeah yeah um, let me back up to the chat um, Alan T says I had a zero AQI index uh, on the sensors within miles of my house yesterday opened up all the windows for the first time in 70 days yeah what is this day 77 of my fire stream I've been doing this for 77 days with only 7 days off total. So for 70 days basically, mostly in a row, I've been speaking on average for about 14 hours a day. My throat is a bit ragged. I'm trying to keep it together. I would love to take a couple hours off and maybe come back and look at the fires uh, again. I'm really, really wanting to not talk for a bit but we, we don't have a radio to listen to, really. We don't have cams to look at. It would be kind of hard to keep this uh, going uh, without any without either myself talking or some radio talking or something. Uh, most people are here to listen rather than to see uh, what's going on with the, uh, with the fires. So I'm thinking about taking some hours off and coming back around 5-ish or something uh, for the community updates on the Caldor. We could watch the morning Caldor operational briefing, but we, we see almost nothing uh, except air attack flying around the Caldor. Uh, that radio we could turn on, but there's nothing going on. We d we never had a radio for uh, it's a Salt Lake City Skyway jet. Uh, it's a Black Hawk. Huh. There's a Black Hawk east of Trimmer. That's not fire related, is it? Uh, Trimmer Lake. So I'm just trying to get back down to where the uh, fires are. That's Wilford Heights. We've got air attack just buzzing around and checking out the windy in California hot springs. They're probably doing all sorts of radio chatter, uh, updating the crews on the situation, but it's so frustrating we don't have a radio to hear it. Um, it would take a ham radio operator pretty close to the fires, which would not be good, but uh, broadcasting that. Uh, unfortunately, we just don't hear anything. Uh, going up at the KMP. That's assess the citation circling the area that could could be your attack. This one actually is probably air attack. The other one might just be a helper of some sort. We've got a Bell 407. This probably is working the area, going around from three rivers. It circled enough. Maybe it did some drops. Is that actually? It's not a news helicopter, is it? It's only nine years old and it's, it's shiny and new, uh, relatively. It could be just looking at the situation, probably, the way it's circled around. But uh, nothing nothing really to report as far as aircraft. So, looking back at the chat, John Sayers has enjoyed your rain show last night. Oh, cool! <laughs> yeah, I left a uh, left a uh, rain uh, sound on so people would 
understand that the rain, that the, the sound worked on the video. Um, but there is nothing, almost nothing to uh, to hear on the radio. Let's check and see if there's a Dixie update. Um, yeah, Alaska National Forest has added some. There's a Dixie update for me to read. Man, my throat is hurting so bad. I was hoping there would be a video. Um, forest road closure updates. There's still 1,727 personnel on the Dixie. 94% containment. 9, 000, 9, excuse me, 963,309 acres on the Dixie. And... Um, there's a west zone update that's paper, east zone update that's paper, an evening update 16 hours ago that um, we could watch. It's only four minutes. Let's watch that and then I'll read. Operation. Oh my god, that's extremely loud. Sorry. Let's watch this and then I'll read this morning's update. This is from yesterday. Good evening. Welcome to the Dixie's Fire Evening Operational Briefing. My name is Brian Elam, and I'm the plans op Planning Operations Section Chief for the Dixie Fire and the Southern New Area Gold Team here with you tonight. So today was a little bit different. Uh, going in, we had uh, a lot of winds and dry air. So we worked this morning on the fire, and this afternoon we kind of pulled the resources out to uh, a staging area where we could monitor fire. We could pick up the smokes. Um, if we had any new starts or if we had anything roll out, we'd be more inclined to pick them up, keep us out of the chance of a falling snag with all the dead trees in the area and not any of our folks getting hurt. So, so far today's been really good. We'll start down here in Whiskey Whiskey. And this morning, first thing, we picked up a little area here down in the Boy Scout camp, less than an acre where the fire had um, Burned through some needle cast uh, across the dozer line in there, got that picked up, cleaned up, looking really good. Uh, in here around the Pacific Crest Trail, the north slope here is looking really good. As we come further south, you know, they still got a day or so of work to button that all up and be done with it. Whiskey Whiskey resources continue to work in here above the Meadow Valley and then working on to the east in here around uh, Kennedy. Line. Still a lot of work going on in there tying up these lines. So as we get over here into uniform uniform, uh, this work in above Taylor's rule is still progressing. They're still trying to get that stuff buttoned up and, and cleaned up and put back to grade and, and repaired. Uh, doing some assessments on the project in here uh, where we can mitigate some hazard trees. Hope to get started on that in a day or so with some specialized equipment to get those hazard trees down and open that road up to the public and without the risk of anything falling on them. As we come in here to Romeo Romeo, here at the Devil's Punch Bowl where we have talked for a couple of days, uh, we did get a Type 1 crew in today that helped install that line. Uh, they're going to rewalk that. They're going to check those lines to make sure everything is good, check it for potentials or roll out and take care of any hot spots in there. As we come down uh, the Grizzly Ridge, we're still picking up some residual heat there in the duff and in the dozer lines that we can put that to bed and, and not have to worry about it. Have some specialized equipment in here working on some hazard trees, working towards Davis Lake. Down here in the Dixie Valley, this work is starting to look really good. So that equipment is starting to move north. Still a little bit of that coming back towards the division break here at Davis Lake, but just a couple more days have that buttoned up. As that equipment moves north, they're working back up here towards the last chance road to tie into with Papa and some of these lateral dozer lines and get that repaired. Up here in Papa Papa, he's still working that last chance road, working some of this area right up in here. Still have a good bit of work in there, probably five, six days to have that all completed and uh, closed off and repaired where uh, we don't have any concerns. As we uh, get above Papa Papa here into November, November, uh, work continues up in there. Didn't pick up a lot of heat in there today. Uh, still working on this, this area up in here and doing some repair work. The uh, 
down here in the valley in uniform, uniform, we did pick up a couple of small starts down in the grass and in the meadow. Those were picked up early this morning and mopped up and cleaned up. No concerns there. Same for the Guinness Valley. So that's it for the operational brief. And I did bring a piece of trivia for you tonight. So we have extracted enough hose here since we've been here that was used in fire suppression that if we wanted to stretch it out, we could pull that line from Quincy, California, all the way to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Thanks, and have a good evening. Wow. Now, that's a statistic. Um, let's hear that again. We could pull that line from Quincy, California, here, since we've been here, that was used in fire suppression, that if we wanted to stretch it out, we could pull that line from Quincy, California, all the way to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Wow. This is not only California's second largest wildfire, it is the first, is the largest wildfire ever with a single start. And we must remember that it started because of the power company PG&E's uh, shoddy maintenance uh, type system where uh, they let vegetation fall over on their lines uh, with a frightening uh, regularity. It is the largest fire ever in California's history that happened because of a single ignition. What that means is other types of fires are like multiple ignition areas, like say lightning striking a whole area then it merges together. That's a that's a complex, but as far as single ignition goes, this is California's biggest ever and it's probably one of the biggest ever in the West ever yeah, in, in the history of the country. And they've used so much hose line that they could stretch it all the way to Albuquerque from Quincy, California. That's, I wonder how many actual miles that is. Let's try to find out. Um, we could do an as the crow flies kind of measurement, but we, and also the measurement like up and down the terrain would be different. But where, where is Albuquerque? Uh, yeah, let's, let's do a really crude, non-scientific type of measurement. Um, measure just as a straight line. It's essentially right here to here. That's 859 miles or 1,782.67 kilometers. They have like 100, they have 860 miles of hose spread around on the Dixie Fire. Uh, wow. Now, friends, we all could be millionaires right now if we had only invested in hose making companies before the fire started a couple years ago. <laughs> Can you imagine if uh, fire hose making companies were publicly traded? How we'd all be chinking our glasses and hanging out in my global, global bombardier 6000 right now? Oh god. All right, um, or a G6, you know, that that's that's a pretty good aircraft. Uh, looking, let's uh, let's look back at uh, that. That was last night. I can now read you guys with my ragged throat best I can. Uh, they don't have a video this morning. That was yesterday's video. I can read you the East Zone update. At least it's not too long. Yesterday. This is hot off the press. This is uh, this was released three hours ago. Dixie Fire East Zone. Due to the extremely high fire danger, crews pulled back from the field work at 11:30 in the morning to be ready to quickly respond to any slopovers or new fire starts during the red flag warning. So a slopover is where a line was violated by a breach. You know. This also lessened the danger of anyone getting hurt by snags falling in high winds. Remember, a snag is a standing dead tree. Crews responded to several smoke reports and mopped up two small fires in the Boy Scout camp and the Genesee Valley. Mop-up continues at Grizzly Ridge and Milford and suppression repair on the Pacific Crest Trail all the way to Highway 70 and around Lake Davis. Firefighters also found new dozer lines around the archaeological sites. What? Firefighters also found 
new new desert signs uh, uh, hang on a second is that what that actually says it's a typo firefighters also found new new desert line around the archaeological site also known as the avoidance area and continued mechanical repair in that same area I have no idea what the heck that's supposed to say um, all right and they continued mechanical repair in that initial area Initial attack responded to service calls. So service calls these days are like the public says, hey, I can see a little bit of smoke in the distance out my back porch. What's that? And that'll be the, the little stumps, the areas burning. That could be little tiny like little pockets and canyons where uh, bushes didn't burn or logs and dead trees that when wind hits them, they kind of show a little bit of smoke and so the public it's really important that they call and say hey I saw one of those and so the crews will just go out there and check it out that's a that's what the service call basically is at the moment and that'll be going on for some weeks today firefighters will pick up where they left off yesterday the Diamond Mountain type 1 crew has returned to the incident and will assess the last section of uncontained line at the Devil's Punch Bowl yeah, we would love to know what's going on there. Did the rain help at all? Did it have rain? Uh, that's where that's the only threat in the inside of the fire that still threatens communities is over there by Devil's Punch Bowl and the Grizzly uh, Heights and Grizzly Peak area by Indian Valley. So today, Diamond Mountain Type One crew will uh, has returned to the incident and they will assess the last section of the uncontained line at Devil's Punch Bowl. Moffup will continue along Grizzly Ridge and other hot spots. Yay. Suppression repair will continue along the Pacific Crest Trail, east of Quincy, and around Meadow Valley, Kennedy, Taylorsville, Quincy, Mount Huff, and areas on the fire's east side. Crews will also assess hazard trees where the roads may be reopened. Initial attack will assist divisions as requested and follow up on any smoke reports. Three helicopters remain assigned to that east zone. Weather. The fire received 0 0.1 to 0 0.25 inches of rain overnight, so a tenth to a quarter of an inch overnight. Today, humidity will be higher with winds from the north and cooler temps. Yay, it did receive a little bit of rain. Trap line changes due to decreased fire activity. Locations where info uh, information is posted have been reduced to the following areas. In Quincy at the Plumas National Forest Supervisor's Office at Safeway and the Savemore Grocery Stores on East Main Street, the Beckworth Ranger Station in Blair's Den, Young's Market in Taylorsville, Evergreen Market in Greenville. I'm so glad that survived. And Leonard's Store in Portola and the Griegel Fire Department. So I, I guess there's no more fire info station at Chester anymore. Uh, Course closure, blah blah blah. To find information, go check out InsaWeb. Westone information is a different page. Here's smoke outlook and breathable air quality it looks green all over the northern half of the state. That's just great. It's good air quality. Wow, open your windows and breathe it in. All right, Westone update for Dixie. The forecast red flag weather was present on the fire yesterday with wind speeds of 20 to 40 miles an hour. Let me change my bottom static message real quick. Uh, text from this morning. Right. The red flag weather was present on the fire yesterday with wind speeds of 20 to 40 miles an hour. This caused an increase in the fire activity and smoke within the interior. But the control lines were never threatened. Woohoo! Ground crews coordinated with air support to get water onto hot spots to the north of Mill Creek. Firefighters continued to patrol containment lines and conduct suppression repair work, especially along Highway 44 corridor in Silver Lake area. All containment lines held secure around the fire perimeter, through, uh, even though there were increased winds. Swing shift resources remained at the fire line last night, providing additional. Perfect capacity as necessary. 
that's an unusual uh, but very effective tactic. Instead of having a day shift and a night shift, since they expected the winds to be kind of bad as the transition happened, well, they told told the uh, some of the day shift crews to sleep in so that they could stay longer throughout the evening. So today, cooler temps and high winds are expected. Minimal fire activity is expected, with isolated visible smoke from heat remaining in heavy fuels within the containment lines. Let's go bigger. Reburn in the fire interior is expected to continue from additional needle casts blown off the trees from yesterday's strong winds. But remember, it's okay. As long as the fire is well within the center of the containment lines, we don't care what's burning in there. In places where the rainfall amounts were light, fuels will quickly dry up and become available for consumption by the early afternoon. Today, firefighters will continue to patrol and secure contained lines and mop up any remaining pockets of heat near the fire perimeter. Suppression repair work will continue across the fire, although initial attack response to new or increased fire activity will remain high. A high priority, excuse me. That's what I'm saying, is it's only a threat near the lines. So if they see smoke anywhere near the actual lines on the ex uh, perimeter of the fire, they'll, they'll hop on it real quick and, and pounce. Air resources will be available to make service calls and support the resources on the ground. Weather. As a passage, after the passage of the frontal system, the temps will be much cooler today. With higher relative humidity, yay. Temperatures are expected to be in the 60s. With a minimum relative humidity of 22%, that's pretty low, but that's a lot better than what we've seen pretty much all summer. Remember, the fire triangle, heat is one of them, meaning what fire needs to live is fuel, heat, and ox and oxygen. So the cooler the temperatures are, usually the, the less uh, activity that the wildfire has. I mean, the, the flip side is that cold air contains more oxygen, but it is more of a bonus than anything. As long as there's higher humidity, that's great to have cooler temps. And so it's 22%. It's still bad for fires, but it's way better than the 9% and the 18s and such we are seeing. Winds will shift from southwest to north winds. Slowly, slowing down considerably to 5 to 10 miles an hour. That's wonderful. A slow warming and drying trend will follow by late week. Closure, closure remains in effect for some areas of Alaska and Plumas National Forest, etc., etc. So, yay. That's a dang good up update. I was hoping for a video, but guess not. Now the dark brown here are previous burn scars. It's hard to read this exactly, but where there's red is where the fire is still kind of a threat in general. Where they don't have black line, and it's all basically up here around Old Station, the Hat Creek area. All this stuff up here. From east of Mount Lassen, all the way up to up here by the uh, Hat Creek area. So, but it's staying within their lines. It doesn't mean that there's no lines where it says red. It's just that they're going to pencil it in black when they are really, really sure that the fire can't cross anymore. Um, well, remember, on the Dixie, uh, it crossed four different black lines and expanded 100,000 acres in 24 hours with explosive growth. But that was during crazy red flag conditions and the extreme heat of summer. So... Black line this time of year is looking a lot more black, <laughs> a lot more secure than midsummer with red flag conditions. That's when black line meant really nothing. So let me look back at chat. Um, did anybody have any questions for any specific fire or want me to look at anything? Uh, we did the Dixie Roundup. We should go over to the river and the McCash uh, and maybe even a little bit of an update on the, the antelope in a second um, so the coho valses we got a bit of rain last night down here it was awesome where were you at coho i can't remember uh you said pop a pop a drink yeah <laughs> i drink it right now here we go 
I didn't catch that. So, um, going back up to the chat, um, a lot of people, you guys are just talking to yourselves for the most part. Um, trying to figure out if anybody has a fire question. William Young says, I've shared this channel with my aunt in California. She's getting up in the years and doesn't always check her messages. I'm looking forward to seeing more family, at least uh, subscribing and listening. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody who has shared the channel with uh, your friends and family. Um, and put it on your own social media pages, like your own Facebook. That's the number one way people find the channel. I hate it when months later, somebody comes in and says, Oh, I wish I knew about your channel before. Well, um, you can help people find out by sharing me on your Twitter or your Facebook, whatever. Hitting the like button even helps um, because it helps it go trending. And when people are looking for info uh, on YouTube, they're much more likely to be connected with a trending channel. I hate the way that works, but that is it. So I do thank you all for doing that, and I thank all the supporters who have been donating to me. This is day 77 of my stream with almost no days off. I think seven in total. Uh, that was sporadic, mostly when I was sick. Um, my voice is absolutely ragged. Uh, I'm trying to find a, a moment that I could maybe take a break this afternoon. Um, you know, um, on the quieter days like this, I mean, knock on wood, I hope it's quiet. There always could be new fire starts and a red flag warning in the valley. Um, I should probably rest it whenever I can. Um, because I will lose it, like like I did last, last year. Um, and then I had to go off the air for weeks. So, the... Uh, here's the Caldor thing. I think we had the... Uh, they may have posted a morning video. They didn't, though. I guess we could find that elsewhere. Do we have a Sequoia National Forest video at all for the Windy? Oh, we do. Wait, no, that's a post I already read. Do we? Oh, yay. Sequoia National Forest has a Windy Fire update video that's two minutes long. Uh, oh, yay. And there, here's the morning update video. I guess I was looking in the wrong place. I was looking at uh, Tulare County Sheriff's. So let's let's look, and I'm going to change this to um, Windy Morning Ops Update. Here we go. Let's take a look. There's been Team 5. Uh, good morning. Ernie Villa here, uh, Planning Ops Trainee, California Incident Management Team 5. Uh, for your windy fire update for Tuesday, September 28th, uh, the fire is currently uh, 87,318 acres with a 4% containment. Uh, real quick, for information about uh, the fire or information related to the fire, uh, you can call 211. Uh, you can visit NC Web for fire related information. You can also visit uh, Tulare County website for information specific to uh, structure damage or loss. And a phone number for you would be 559 802 9790. That'll be for anybody that potentially had any property loss or damage due to the fire. That could be called uh, Monday through Friday, 8 to 8, and then on Saturday and Sunday, 9 to 3. I will go ahead and start off here with your update for the fire currently. And uh, we'll start off here on the northern end of the fire here. Uh, last night, uh, everything held pretty well along the 94 road. Uh, we maintained a tactical patrol along the 94 road. Everything was holding pretty secure along this edge. Coming back in here across where the castle fire scar is, everything's holding pretty well here. Uh, continuing to uh, hold in that area along that footprint. Not a lot of heat signatures. There are some kind of interior of the fire here along the line, but nothing new outside the main perimeter. Uh, as we come down in here towards Slate Mountain, all this piece of fire is still holding pretty tight in here. Uh, we will have crews out here going in this area to try to uh, evaluate that area uh, for direct handling. 
coming back into the Western Divide Highway here, uh, we did tactical patrol that area along as the uh, Needle Rock Road that comes to the south side of the community of Ponderosa. As we continued uh, east out and towards the Lloyd Meadow Road, everything in here uh, was looking good. We still do have a little bit of fire still back and towards the Lloyd Road here, and then everything on the east side of the Lloyd Road uh, still holding within the containment line. We did have a spot fire that came out. They were able to pick it up uh, last night, uh, tied it back into the main fire here, uh, no issues or concerns. As you come along the south end of the uh, Lloyd Road, where we've gone direct and indirect along the fire's edge here, everything's holding secure, coming all the way back in towards uh, this larger part of this finger that pushed out to the east here, back into the Mountain 9090 Road in the Johnsondale area. Uh, it, the west side of Johnsondale, everything's holding and secured in here and back in this area here. And as you come down towards the uh, Spees Bridge area in the Flynn Canyon, fire still remains pretty active. It's in a backing and flanking position coming towards the Kern River here. Uh, with the high winds last night, uh, we did see a little bit more activity in this area, but it's still hanging up pretty high on the slope there, probably about a mile and a half from uh, touching the Kern River in some areas. As you continue down in here towards the southern end of the fire near Baker Peak, the fire still kind of remains to the west side of uh, Baker Peak there. And as you come in towards the uh, southern edge here, the fire made a, a push and it has spotted out into the castle or the uh, cedar fire from 2016, which you see all these little dots in here. Uh, that area of the cedar fire burned pretty hot, so there's uh, it's a bunch of dead snags and trees that remain in that general area. So. For the most part, uh, that burn scars kind of check the, the, the larger growth that would happen to the south other than the spot fires. Those spot fires could be challenging to pick up just due to the position they are inside the burn scar with all the snags, uh, but we'll be coming up with a plan to get those pulled back into the main primary line. As you come out here towards Sugarloaf Village, uh, maintained a tactical patrol, still in a structure uh, defense posture down here. Uh, we continue to mop up secure uh, lines in this area coming back out towards uh, White River. In the White River area, we are continuing to uh, use road as line along the uh, M9 road coming down towards the uh, Caponero Road and the Boney Witt Road, tying it back in towards Pine Flat where we have uh, dozer lines and hand lines that come towards the east side of Pine Flat. Uh, back up towards Deer Creek here, and then on the back side of Deer Creek here, coming back in around the, the structures, back around the Hot Springs Work Center here, the Forest Service Station, and then uh, back up and around coming into the uh, Mountain 50 Road right here at the switchback. At this switchback here, we do have crews that are looking at going direct to try to pick up this piece in between the Mountain 50 switchback, back up to the upper end of Del, uh, Dead Mule Saddle. Uh, if they can are successful there, that'll eliminate having to fire off anything along the Mountain 50 Road here in this windy road section. Coming back over here on the west side of Mountain 50 here, uh, the spot fire remains fairly active. Uh, crews and resources weren't able to pick this up direct, so we're going to be looking at the uh, indirect dozer lines that come out towards uh, below the Devil's Thumb and Thompson Peak coming back into Gibson Canyon back over towards the Potholes Road that'll tie it into uh, indirect lines uh, out here on the Thule Indian Reservation. Coming back into this part here, there are road systems that'll be looking to bring the fire a little bit closer as it backs to them. Um, up in the upper end of the Thule here, a lot of steep, rugged terrain. There's not a good spot for us to be able to go direct on any fire in here. So we'll stay uh, indirect a little bit, but we did bring it a little closer up into here to road systems that tie back into the firing operation that's coming south towards uh, Wheaton area. Uh, that firing operation last night was pretty successful. Uh, crews were able to get the firing operation and uh, all the way down towards within about a thousand feet of the road here, the uh, 212 road. Uh, at the end of the evening, they lost the window, uh, the fuel conditions, the RHs rose, so they didn't have the uh, they didn't have the ability to continue firing for the light, flashy fuels. They're real responsive to the RH level, so they didn't want to leave it in a bad position. They left it overnight, but everything's holding, and they'll continue to fill in the unburnt area between uh, the two and a quarter road down towards the twelve road through today. Uh, RHs on basically the west side of the fire will remain pretty high, so it's pretty, uh, it may be good for them to take advantage of some of those higher RHs, and then everything here on the east side is, is uh, predicted to be a little bit uh, lower RHs, so a little bit more fire activity probably you're going to see over here on the east side. 
coming back on the uh, firing operation, everything uh, is holding well. They're continuing to mop up and secure everything. There were a few slop overs and spot fires that occurred out here on the west side, but they were able to grab all of those and line them and contain them back into the, mi the main primary line. As you come back in towards the top in here, you get back into the 94 road where everything's still looking pretty good. So uh, continuing here, uh, we still do have uh, Tulare County Fires doing a structure assessment today of the community of Sugarloaf to assess the damage. And then uh, we also have a giant sequoia expert here who will be putting together assessments for all of the giant sequoia groves that have been impacted by the fire. Everything from Deer Creek, uh, heading up uh, pack saddle, starvation, Long Meadow. Uh, we have Red Hill Grove and a Pyrone Grove and a few other groves out here on the Thule. So those folks will be going in assessing them. Uh, we did have a fire in one of the giant sequoia trees out here in Long Meadow, so they'll be assessing that as well. Uh, further, we have people from the Forest Service that'll be out there assessing damage to any private inholdings that are within the Forest Service. And then uh, we do have a repop meeting that will be discussing some of the, the potential uh, repopulation of the communities of Panorama, Ida Wild Posey, uh, California Hot Springs, kind of on this west end, Pier Point Springs, Cap Nelson, and the possibility of repopulating uh, Ponderosa there. Uh, also, too, just to clarify, I know we had some questions in the comments, but uh, the difference between monitoring and tactical patrol. So uh, kind of the difference there is that uh, monitoring, we're basically watching the fire as it comes down and as it touches different road systems, we're in there kind of uh, actively mopping it up once it touches the road. We're monitoring it when it's up high on the slope and people can't get to it, so they're just watching it, making sure that it doesn't uh, pose any threats to our line. So we will use the word uh, tactical patrol kind of has similar meaning. So other than that, I hope you like the briefings. And if you have any comments, please leave them below. Thank you. Have a good day. OK, I'm not sure I caught that. Let me go right back to what, what first of all, I think it's funny. He's holding a radio antenna for his pointer. We've been amused by the various things that uh, the presenters pick up randomly around themselves to use as a pointer. A couple of guys have fancy laser pointers, and that's not good for the camera. That just creates crazy, weird flashes on the camera. Um, we, we've seen now um, an antenna. That's a new one. Um, we've, we've also seen uh, things, everything from yardsticks uh, to somebody picking up uh, an arrow. It looked like a crossbow arrow. Um, without the uh, head on it. Um, also, we've seen a fly swatter. That, that was the funniest one on the uh, antelope fire. We've seen a couple of envelopes being picked up and uh, folded in half. A couple of pieces of paper. But now, now we have a radio antenna. It seems like there should be some sort of an official device. Um, I'm kind of waiting for a, a collapsible back scratcher. That would be hilarious. Um, I, in my opinion, they should just have like a back scratcher, but instead of the uh, the little scratchy hand, maybe it would have like a pointing thumb, you know, like something like like this, you know, on a stick. I think that would be great. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's an extra long radio antenna. He just explained the difference between monitoring and tactical. Uh, so let's let's go back again. That was a, a good question. So uh, kind of the difference there is that uh, monitoring, we're basically watching the fire as it comes down and as it touches different road systems, we're in there kind of uh, actively mopping it up once it touches the road. We're monitoring it when it's up high on the slope and people can't get to it, so they're just watching it, making sure that it doesn't uh, pose any threats to our line. So. Okay, so monitoring is watching. We will use the word uh, tactical patrol, kind of has similar meaning, so... Other than that, I hope you like the briefings, and if you have Okay, I, get, I guess then they're basically the very similar meanings, enough so that the public doesn't need to worry about the difference. Um, they're kind of in the area looking at something. Instead of, instead of just looking at something like from an airplane, it means that the crews are on the ground, I guess. Do, do you guys, do you firefighters in chat know the difference, or... Officially, but he's, he just explained to the public that's really similar. Um, so, 
Yeah, Bonnie Johnson says Tulare County might be in the boonies, but they have Comcast, AT&T, and several other broadband services. So I don't know why the delay is there in placing these videos online. I, yeah, I don't know either. Um, the uh, the fact that the uh, the entire instant command team just kind of set up shop, they may be winging it, and they might be really overburdened with the amount of work that they have to do. The the, the few people that are there, um, that, I guess that might be one of the things. Um, I'm this is a single take. I'm sure that they've actually started and stopped uh, filming again and again. It's very difficult to do an eight and a half minute video without stumbling over your words, breaking into laughter, having somebody slam a door, or somebody sneeze randomly, and that kind of stuff happening where you don't have to start the video again. So um, it may seem like it just takes them uh, nine minutes to record this and it should be like boom, 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 let's put it on the internet. In reality, video production is a lot more difficult. You know, you're in the middle of filming and all of a sudden you run out of battery or some other thing happens, you drop something, that microphone stops working, let's get another microphone. Uh, it's it, it's really hard to, to do this. It's it's That was a pretty good like single take that we've been seeing time and time again. So um, I'm, I'm really questioning a couple of things. A lot, most everything looks good. He's explained things pretty well. Uh, that this was a firing line, and so they will continue to burn. Uh, they'll fill this in, so that when the uh, currently the wind is is essentially going that direction from east, uh, from west to east. Excuse me. It's mostly a west wind. If we if we were a little bit more accurate, uh, let me get a different color pen. If we were a little bit more accurate, the wind is is in this kind of arcing sort of thing but where it goes into different drainages it'll do this it just depends on which canyon it is direction can be very relative as, as you can see so um but but overall west wind blowing towards the east so that's perfect for their firing that he's explaining um the firing up went well and it created this uh excuse me this little line and so as the wind is going that way, they can light fires here and it'll uh, make a scorched earth line. What they're preparing is, you know, they're doing firing ops, is they are trying to burn the areas right in front of the communities so that when the wind comes back the other direction, it hits a line of scorched earth. They already did that very well uh, to protect the Camp Witsit and the Johnsonville area, which is where his arm is at. They they already burned the area like this. And so in the last few days, when the wind was going this direction, it basically hit the scorched earth. And that's part of the reason we haven't seen it move too much towards the east and right up against the, uh, the river, which is awesome. The other reason down here is there's a burn scar. And there's a lot less fuels, and they did the same thing with good effect. Um, except the place to watch is down by the Baker Peak area, where there is a little area in between the Cedar Fire every area, which I believe the burn scar is down there technically. But there's this area that's not burned that we have to watch um, for today, and that's Baker Point is where that fire lookout uh, is. Hopefully, it'll survive. But um, I don't understand the repopulation thing yet. I guess they would let people back in and say, be ready to go at a moment's notice. These are not the world's biggest communities. They're easier and quicker to evacuate than, you know, something like Paradise. They're they're really uh, everybody knows everybody kind of communities. But I don't understand why they would want to do that at this moment. Um, what gives them the confidence? to think that the windy wouldn't come back and uh, threaten them like crazy is that the weather forecast ha has their firing ops really done a lot to make it safe. We see little spot fires down here on the southern edge that are just kind of all over the place. Uh, do they have confidence those would be uh, wrapped up soon? I was hoping this would go a little bit longer to kind of explain. This would probably be my question. Uh, maybe I could just ask that in, in one of their uh, uh, chats. Uh, I mean, there is like a comment area. It says, do you want to comment? Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to leave it here or some other place. We could look at 
a forest service there's like a chat button a new message it kind of says oh that's Lassen whatever uh, Sequoia National Forest is where we're supposed to be I think when I first arrived here there is a uh, do you have a question button uh, I'm not sure where we're supposed to leave that oh here it is so I would say probably hello hello thank you for doing such a good job communicating to the public question what is the reasoning uh, behind the repop of Camp Nelson uh, Cal Hot Springs etc areas um, what what current conditions um, are in a place keeping them relatively as uh, safe for now uh, positive uh, is he uh, firing 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 ops uh, line strength uh, weather forecasts or all of the above thank you uh, oh and uh, which conditions would the Necessitate re evacuation if ne necessary. Yeah. Re evacuation. Thank you. Okay. I just sent them a message. Hopefully, we'll get some sort of response. That's pretty cool that they have a message center. Um, now, let's watch the fire behavior analyst video, which is very short. This is two minutes. This is also about the windy fire. So, let's take Some a look. of our containment. This was three hours ago uploaded. Good morning, Jeff Shelton, Team 5 Fire Behavior. And I'm here to talk about uh, the fire behavior and the fire weather for the uh, incident today. Um, the incident continues to expand. We have uh, some heat showing on our infrared on the lower parts of the fire down here in Division Juliet and up here where they were doing the firing operation yesterday in Division Romeo. Those are the primary heat sources that we're seeing today. You'll also see on our weather matrix here, these green areas that are color-coded that show um, favorable conditions for us. We have higher humidity and lower temperatures, uh, but in the red, you're also seeing we have higher winds. Uh, there's some uh, consequences on both sides of those. From a fire behavior standpoint, that higher humidity really does not allow the grass to carry fire very much. So what we have today is the fire being carried from log to log, mostly the dead and down material or the standing dead material that's prevalent throughout the entire fire area. And so as we uh, work through the fire today, uh, we'll be adjusting our tactics to, uh, to, con to deal with the consequence of not being uh, able to use the grass to carry fire where we want to, um, but also understanding that uh, uh, the fire is still going to remain very active due to the wind. What that wind will do is will feed fresh oxygen into the fire, but on the plus side, there's a good chance that we're going to scour a lot of this smoke out and we're going to be able to use aircraft over the fire. Uh, we do expect the fire to uh, challenge some of our containment line and test that line and that's a good thing because it'll show us where the line is strong and where it's vulnerable and then we'll adjust our tactics moving forward from that point. So uh, thank you for your attention. If you have questions, you can always get them to our uh, public information officer through the incident and uh, have a great day. Okay, that moves very quickly through everything. Let's do a step-by-step. -step. Let's go back. Good morning, Jeff Shelton, Team 5 Fire Behavior. And I'm here to talk about uh, the fire behavior and the fire weather for the uh, incident today. Uh, okay, I love these charts in the back. This is a little blurry. I was kind of wondering, am I on the maximum? Yeah, it says it's 1080. Either the camera was out of focus, or that's not really a 1080, but let's go. Um, the incident continues to expand. We have uh, some heat showing on our infrared on the lower parts of the fire down here in Division Juliet, and up here where they were doing the firing operation yesterday in Division Romeo. Those are Okay, Division Juliet is the Tobias Peak and the, uh, you know, the uh, Sugarloaf area. 
um, and Baker Peak. The primary heat sources that we're seeing today. And up there, the firing ops, which they said went well. That's Romeo up there is uh, where I was just illustrating that they, they kind of did this. And then they'll probably light more today so that the fire goes to the west with the wind. Uh, sorry, yeah, to the east with the wind, excuse me. And um, we'll probably see a heat signature there. You'll also see on our weather matrix here, these green areas, they're color-coded that show um, favorable conditions for us. We have overall favorable because it's a mix of greens here, which are wonderful, and reds, which are not. So the wind gusts are not favorable. They're up to 25 miles an hour. And wind speed uh, sustained of 15 miles an hour is pretty yikes, extreme, like very bad. However, it's moderated by the fact that it's only a high of 57 degrees today. Partly cloudy is great, meaning the uh, solar radiation, meaning the sun rays, uh, will keep the winds from getting worse. Um, direct sun uh, will increase wind speeds. I didn't know that, but uh, that's what Holt Haley was explaining. I can't remember the weather phenomenon name for that. But partly cloudy is great. See how it says sunny, red, 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 red? Like sunny is bad. <laughs> you know, um, increases the temperature, increases fire activity, and gives uh, increases wind activity. So partly cloudy is good for today, but the wind is really gusty. But tomorrow's looking great because it's like all green there, except that it's sunny. That, that's awesome. So green is moderate burning conditions. Critical burning is, 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 you know, oh gosh, you know, and the red is, oh God. So this is looking looking good for today and tomorrow. We we see a lot of yellows and, and some red on, on Thursday. But other other than that, this is this is looking nice for the rest of the week. Have higher humidity and lower temperatures, uh, but in the red, you're also seeing we have higher winds. Uh, there's some now, higher humidity is super important. 80%, meaning the max humidity, is basically the nighttime recovery. If you have any kind of uh, misty dew kind of a situation at night, that really, really helps the plants kind of absorb that a little bit, and they're less dry the next day. Um, and that means that at high humidity at night, even if embers whip, ripped off trees in the winds, humidity is a huge factor in whether or not a fire is going to be fierce, whether or not embers... Uh, land on anything that that, that uh, is uh, super flammable or a lot less flammable. It'll be a lot less with higher humidity. So um, that, this, this is a big sigh of relief. So the minimum humidity is being 53 degrees. Wow, that's good. Wow, that's good. 53% humidity, 53% uh, humidity during the day is just, just awesome. That's what keeps this from being a red flag, even though it's uh, windy. Uh, consequences on both sides of those. From a fire behavior standpoint, that higher humidity really does not allow the grass to carry fire very much. So what we have today is the fire being carried from log to log, mostly the dead and down material or the standing dead material that's prevalent throughout the f entire fire area. What he says in a nutshell, basically, is that um, it's not good for, like, fire running around on the ground, like like in grass and such. Because, well, it's almost like a dew kind of a, a situation. It's just the humidity on it. And the, um, the plant life gets reinvigorated a little bit uh, through absorption, a slight amount. It's not rain, but it's at least better than nothing. And um, what he's talking about, though, is we do have potential for spread for snags, the standing dead trees that are on fire, those are the ones that could throw long range spotting. And so the lesson here is you want a fire safe environment, get remove the standing dead trees. They're just everywhere here in the beetle killed area of the sequoias. So that's still why the fire is spreading. We'd have a much better situation if those were gone. That's got nothing to do with the, the climate. You know, um, no matter what the climate is doing, we have worse fire conditions anywhere there's standing dead trees and landscape because even though we have all this favorable stuff, they're still throwing embers all over the place and they're hitting other dead trees and other dead logs on the ground and that's what's igniting spots and, and keeping the fire city and, and going and active. So otherwise it would be 
really mild today. So let's go back up to what he said. From log to log, mostly the dead and down material or the standing dead material that's prevalent throughout the entire fire area. And so as we uh, work through the fire today, uh, we'll be adjusting our tactics to, uh, to, con to deal with the consequence of not being uh, able to use the grass to carry fire where we want to, um, but also understanding that uh, uh, the fire is still gonna remain very active due to the wind. What that wind will do is we'll feed fresh oxygen into the fire, but on the plus side, there's a good chance that we're gonna scour a lot of this smoke out and we're gonna be able to use aircraft over the fire. Uh, we do expect the fire to uh, challenge some of our containment line and test that line, and that's a good thing because it'll show us where the line is strong and where it's vulnerable, and then we'll adjust our tactics moving forward from that point. So uh, thank you for your attention. If you have questions, you can always get them to our uh, public information officer through the incident, and uh, have a great day. So, yeah, I, I concur that this is great. They have a wind test today on their lines, but it's extremely cold. Yes, yeah, 57 degrees is a high. Everybody's in a sweater today. And um, we're going to add a jacket. And it's with high humidity. That's a perfect and pretty relatively uh, uh, gusty winds that are relative, relatively mild. That's perfect test time. So, wow. A stroke of luck with this uh, this lucky break with the uh, with the weather. It's yay. It's just windy enough to blow the smoke away, and they have uh, aircraft support. And wherever the lines are tested, the uh, the helicopters are the best at saying, "Oh, I see where the the uh, spot has gone over the line." Splash! Never mind, I got it. And uh, that's that's awesome. So I I breathe a big sigh of relief. The with if the weather weather had been worse, wow, we could have seen a completely different explosive monster extreme mega fire thing happening. It's being relatively polite. It's like this fire's on a sedative. We'll we'll take it. You know, we'll take it. So let me. Uh, we've already seen the operational update. We've got some general info that uh, I think I read to you guys already. Uh, those are the videos. Let's uh, look back at the chat. See if we have... Um... Yep, hey Teen Homesteader. Hello guys. Um, did anybody have a question on the fires that I have not uh, addressed? Um, I don't see that anybody's like flagging me or talking directly to me. Alan, we do want to make you a mod, but I want to explain uh, some of the, the, the concepts. Um, the T. Gonzo said I had a bad feeling about all this. I, I'm not very... I, I'm uneasy about the whole repopulating things too soon, but looking at the rest of the week's forecast, I'm looking... It's looking a lot better. The idea, though, is... Can any of these communities evacuate at a moment's notice? Uh, I'm, I'm hoping so. If they have a lot of crews there, now that they have more crews, maybe they're a lot more confident that they could, uh, if they were all trapped together, that they could well make it. Uh, sometimes there's only one road out to the west, but sometimes you don't have to evacuate the community. If it's really tiny, you would basically gather people on the same block and, and put them in the same house, and then the crews would park in the driveway and wet it down and let the fire blow past. That's that's sometimes what they do. Uh, the uh, it doesn't have to be that everybody evacuates by car to be safe in, in every situation in every community. So oh, uh, that's very nice. Uh, thank you, firefighters. Uh, that's so cool. So yeah, did any. Anybody have a question that I dismissed? I did ask them directly. Uh, at least the Sequoia National Park uh, Park Service. Uh, why do they have so much confidence about uh, confidence about potentially repopulating? Um, I don't know, William Young. Does anyone know if the Department of Defense follows wildfires? You, yeah, they should. Um, uh, Jay Cat says Department of Defense does whatever it wants to on their land. Well, uh, 
Okay. I'm um, looking back to the chat. Yeah, Frank says the trainee remember needs to remember not to use slang when giving a public briefing. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, Toho Val says, "Yeah, the mods are awesome here. I appreciate all the work they do to keep us informed." Yes, yes, yes. You mods are awesome. They're public service volunteers. They're not just mods in some sort of a chat. They're public service volunteers. Um, so going back to the rest of the chat. Paul Wiley says, as a radio guy, I close my eyes. <laughs> yeah, him using point, pointing around with the radio antenna. Um, Frank Presley says, I think there was a back scratcher used on the antelope briefings. That might have been the river because the antelope was the famous fly swatter. That was awesome. Uh, maybe they, maybe the Siskiyou County and Klamath County has a, has some updates. We're gonna look at river and uh, monument uh, in a second. I'm gonna I try to catch up with chat. Um, let's see here, looking up to, um, but Mike says north winds are blowing strong today in the northern Sacramento Valley, 20 miles an hour plus. The nice thing is, is they're looking very confident at the fawn fire. We can't even find it on the, on the camps. And the Caldor is looking confident as well, even though they had the 60 mile an hour last night. And it was wet. So thank God. Um. Let's go to the rest of the chat. Yeah, Mount Mike says he doesn't sound very familiar with the local area on the Windy Fire, but most of them come out from out of the area. Yeah, they just set up shop uh, day before yesterday, so we can we can forgive them. Um, let's see. Coho Val says they should get a pointer stick with a unicorn horn at the end. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, William Dunn says the weather has created some fire control progress. Definitely, yes, yes, definitely. This has been great. Even though it's not the torrential downpours that we were hoping for, we'll take it. Um, the, um, oh, hang on, I got it, guys. Mods, let me handle it. <laughs> I'm getting good at this. First, I did a hide on the webcam thing. Then I did a report message for pornography and uh, whatnot spam. So I think that's going to be our procedure going forward. And Alan, uh, your training day begins. Um, if you see the, uh, the webcam spammer person come back, which seems to be almost every day, what the procedure is is there's three dots by the names of people uh, whenever you're a mod. And one of it is like hide the user on the channel. That's a ban. Try not to do that unless somebody's really out of line. Uh, screenshot it and uh, email it to me if you do that. Or at least jot down the person's name in the time it happened. Um, but hide user on the channel. That's a ban. And so what we do with like the webcam spanner is we immediately hide user on the channel and then hit the three dots again and uh, report for pornography and explicit because we don't want any of that uh, to run around here that's one of the biggest problems here with the with doing moderation uh what the hide uh, the hide thing is like oh they can't show here we don't want them to be anywhere on youtube um so what we do is report them with a the little flag that says report and then, you know, same thing with a harasser, somebody uh, doing sexual harassment or somebody doing uh, major cursing, cursing up a storm, uh, screaming at people. Uh, that's You want to report that to YouTube directly so that, that YouTube bans a person from YouTube, not just from our channel. So the... Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Smitty. And the more people doing their report, probably the more that YouTube might take it seriously. And then what that forces them to do is really they get that entire account banned on YouTube, and they have to go through the process of making a new one and probably coming in from a different computer elsewhere. And it really slows them down from coming back and and, and messing around with anybody on YouTube. So, but thing is, is that we don't want to, we don't want to ban 
too much um, that has happened. Innocent questions are totally welcome here. Sometimes people are 8 years old. Sometimes people are 101 years old. And sometimes they're uh, either hard of hearing and don't understand what I've said. Or they uh, have vision problems and don't know what's uh, on the screen. And so we, we try to be patient with people, give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, sometimes people have seen really scary uh, other videos that try to say space lasers and shadow governments are starting fires and huge arson conspiracy theory, this and that. They may come in and, and ask the question and we don't want to like jump on them and make them say, make them feel uncomfortable. If it's an innocent question, we just kind of say, hey, conspiracy theories talk is not allowed here. It just creates an environment of fear and we don't want that even talked about in the chat. This is the facts only resource on the fires. We only uh, talk about what can be confirmed. I heard this from somebody is, is not ever allowed. Uh, and so we gently remind people that if they don't obey the rules, that's when the banning occurs. Timeouts we try to do first. But if somebody is 100% nasty, like coming in here and cursing at people, F-bombs, screaming at folks, nasty, nasty, like just go ahead and hide the user on the channel, but please take a screenshot and email who it was to me. Oh yes, and to know when, when things happened, at the top of the chat, don't do top chat, do live chat mode. Live is like as it comes in, the top three buttons, you do toggle the timestamps. That's that'll help out with the screenshot. And um, I can tell you guys how to take a screenshot too. Yeah, and thank you, thank you, Alan. Um, also, as a mod, you're going to be targeted, and that's what a lot of people aren't uh, uh, prepared for. A lot of the people that hate me, which a lot of them do, don't ask me why. Um, I have fiery passions. I'm very opinionated about uh, what PG&E and, and Gavin are, are like, the governor. Um, plus, when people come in and disrupt and I just throw them out, they get really mad. <laughs> they will attack you to cause a problem for me. They're going to try to uh, force me to do something. They'll go to you until you might respond to them in a way that's against the rules. And then ask me, hey, aren't you going to do equal justice before the law? Aren't you going to, aren't you going to ban and time out your own mods for breaking the rules too? And that's what they're trying to start. They're just trying to start trouble. And if I give you mod powers, there's a jealousy factor. So the, the way to look at that, it's going to be hard, but people will try to annoy you, and you, you, you guys don't deserve harassment. I protect my mods from these people that are bad like that. Well, look at Tobias Cam. This is very uh, cloudy. We can't see anything. <laughs> Let's see if we can get an eye on the windy anywhere. But the, the idea is don't take the bait. Uh, tell me if a user is harassing you. Like, email me. And, tell, and screenshot what they're doing, or just copy and paste the, the chat. And I'll deal with such people. Um, mods are here to do an important ser public service job. And don't deserve any crap. But also, if you just don't like somebody, they're irritating, they're annoying, you, you can't hide them from your own view, because you have to police everybody in chat. Um, even as much as you might want to. Um, you can't ban them or time them out just for saying something that you may not like or, or for their, for their uh, you know, uh, for them being annoying. Just remind them of the rules and say, hey, please word that in a, you know, assertive manner, not an aggressive, passive aggressive or offensive way. Uh, rather than like, dude, don't be a, Beep, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, it's a family-friendly atmosphere that's supposed to be welcoming to everybody, and we're we're not all gonna like like each other, um, or the way we come across to each other. 
but warning people of fire danger kind of goes above uh, you know the it, it, it's, it takes precedence and importance this, this lives are at stake sort of a thing so um, the mods also that don't check in very often uh, will get their powers removed just because we don't know what their status is you know um, it's a they've, they've moderation powers are, have got a lot of powers as people check back in we can bestow them again but when somebody disappears for like three weeks I kind of feel more comfortable in taking away the mod power when they check back in we can talk about reinstatement um, because we had a couple instances where somebody who hadn't been here for four weeks just randomly started banning people in chat and I was kinda of like whoa dude what's going on and we found out later that their child had gotten a hold of the phone <laughs> and and uh, you know that kind of thing happens sometimes people forget that they're that they're a mod with some pretty insane powers we've had two of them uh, just be hacked and it you know just caused havoc so the um, that's the general gist of it um, it's okay for people to come in and express warm well wishes that are religious in nature, like prayer sent. It's not okay for people to do doom saying, repent, you sinners, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, we, we keep it an, or, uh, an atmosphere where everybody can feel welcome here. But we, we don't want also people to use this channel to just further their own agendas or their own uh, non fire related, uh, you know. Uh, uh, thing if it is fire related go ahead if um, somebody's come in here and been awesome like budgie you know helping to moderate from the UK uh, I budgie can link you know her own uh, video game channel I, I like to help out the people that help out here you know as much as she wants um, but when you have link powers in general the uh, I, I can't even find anywhere to look at the windy look at all the cloud cover guys in the general area down there that's that's kind of nice it's a partly cloudy day where where's the uh where's the lookout tower bear mountain fresno shows a whole bunch of stuff uh i keep forgetting its name kenzie ridge is completely clouded out um uh, buck rock too let's do a uh Time lapse. Yeah, there's just clouds here. That's nice. That's that's why the humidity is is so great on the fires. It's it's cloudy. So anyway, the the, the general idea is um, um you may be banning people who are my donators. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like uh, be very very careful. Um to not do, to not do that. Uh, if somebody's totally out of line they, they might need a ban and, and like a time to cool out as long as I know who they are and they can uh, email me if it's a misunderstanding that's okay some people come in consistently with sarcastic humor so like Illuminati confirmed is uh, you know sarcastic humor joking about me being a lizard person uh, sometimes sometimes we, we joke about that but the people doing the actual lizard person uh, accusations should be thrown out but the uh, the joke about it you know uh, make just kind of ask people are you being sarcastic if somebody says lasers confirmed you know what I mean um, so let's go back up to but we don't want this to be a dramatic cesspool like like many uh, online kind of forums can be if you have problems with each other like mods problems with each other you gotta take it to me in an email um, or if you see anything untoward rather than confront each other in uh, in the public sphere or issue your concerns there um, yeah Rob Linksdorf I need a text to voice program so we can type info without having to use my voice I did that and it irritated people to the max even I was irritated <laughs> I, I I did find it um, 
I'll look into something that's more, less irritating, like one that might be kind of funny. I've seen some auto-generated voice pro programs that can be really pretty hysterical. But, um, yeah, boy, did we get lucky here on the KNP and the Windy. Uh, it's not it's not completely not dangerous right now, but it's wind, wind is going to test their lines. So they may have some spot fires and such today, but, well, look at the clouds bringing in some moisture at least. That's great. The point is, sorry, this is a big rambling thing, uh, but um, the um, the buttons, what they do, hide user on this channel means I can never interact with them ever again. And that happened way too much. I think the big misunderstanding was, say there's a crisis, we might have 1,200 people come back in. Just like we did with the Caldor and Tahoe being evacuated. And that's gonna the chat's gonna fly by fast, it's gonna be chaotic. And when I ask for chat silence and for only postings about new evacuation info and that kind of thing, um, timeouts are what should be done. Because that just mutes somebody for five minutes. Hide user on the channel means they could never interact with me ever again. And I went back and apparently there's a misunderstanding. People don't know what the button did, and they blanket banned people forever, ever since the Caldor came out. And there's a huge amount of people on the ban list, which I don't even know how to sort out. No, no, somebody should not be banned because they walk in, they don't know that chat silence was on, and they start saying like prayer sent, and then they got banned, praying for Tahoe, and they got banned. Like, oh man. Hide user isn't like hide them for the day. It's forever. I wish it was called something else. But uh, that, that's, that's been a nightmare. Every single day I like unban like 40 people trying to go back to just what happened on that particular day. And uh, some of those people were my donators. And I, I'm on apology tour. Like I'm typing up emails every day like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. That was a misunderstanding. Um. Hey Dusty, how are you? Uh, so anyway, that's it in a nutshell. Um, if you have any questions, you know, bots, let me know. And uh, the the politics thing is about not blaming each other and other groups, like the left not blaming the right, environmentalists not blaming loggers, and vice versa. We don't allow people to come in and say this group and this group did this and this and this it creates an us versus them mentality and so you people can still speak about what might be the problem with fire uh, education and awareness in the public and what's causing fires however instead of saying Sierra Club sucks you know somebody's allowed to, to say I think maybe we should have a letter writing campaign to the Sierra Club and other groups to change one of their policies See how different that is? That's different than blame. That's going on the... It's finding a solution, a possible solution, and suggesting it. Like the 1964 rule uh, about roadless wilderness that was enacted by Congress should probably repeal, be repealed and updated, where the wilderness is still protected from development, but we allow fire access roads. Boom! That's positive. You know, that's like... That's better than, that rule sucks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Big dog. Okay. Okay, big dog. We might want to be easy with that kind of comment. Um, I have no idea what you guys are saying. Now Now I have to go back and look at chat. I'm afraid. What What has been going on in chat since I've been looking at these camps, guys? Here's our smoke outlook for the day. Let me, let me go back. Um, the bear urine thing was pretty hysterical. But I don't know what you guys are talking about. With what, what is a Russian nun? Like, what's going on? Uh, Dusty was saying pine needles absorb relative RF. Never heard of that before. We were talking about dew. I think they reached dew point. Uh, Dusty. Uh, is that what somebody else was saying? Are you correcting me? Or I don't know what's happening at this point. Um, have you ever been camping in the mountains and you have a very dry sleeping bag? 
and then you don't bag it. You don't put it in the plastic bag, and you go around and you come back. Uh, like you go over to a campfire, your sleeping bag's elsewhere, and then you go back to where your sleeping bag is, propped up against a tree late at night, and it's soaking wet. That's because of the humidity, the cloud cover in the mountains. That's what they can do, and that's how pine needles can also get wetter because of cloud cover. Just like my sleeping bag that night that I almost froze to death in the Sierras. Um, we're talking about cloud cover relative humidity, 80%. So, yeah, I don't know what RF is, but um, were you talk was it, were you meaning FRH? Dusty, or am I totally off about what you were saying? Um, the back up there. And going back to the chat, I have no idea what the Russian nun joke is. I don't know that I'm comfortable with it. I don't know what you're referring to, Smitty. Um. Jay Cat says, hold on, I thought Smitty was here for us to harass. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Jay Cat. Uh, okay, looking back at chat. And we're going to look at the monument and river complex next. Fonfire looking great so far. Uh, Wendy and Caldor looking better than we ever expected. Uh, at Wendy and KMP. Caldor's looking great. Um, this is our smoke. Outlook, look at the nice air quality. We have red flag conditions in the Northern Valley, and just hopefully nothing starts in the valley. But flat land is easier to contain a fire uh, in general. Just knock on wood. Um, I just need to catch up with chat. We're about to make Ellen a uh, mod. That would be pretty cool uh, to have you, man. You're one of the, the good team players here. Bear Mountain Shasta Cans back up, says Teen Homesteader. Cool, let's check it out real quick. Sarah Tahoe, let's check it out. Wow. We got so lucky. Even though there was fierce winds, it was very rainy. Uh, well, not very rainy, but just moist enough. And, and uh, the cloud cover brought a lot of moisture. Let's look. We have a sh uh, Highline Trail Cam. Look at all the retardant over there, ready to help with the north wind situation today. Whoa, there's a helicopter on the, on the helipad. At Bear Mountain. Thanks, Team Homesteader. Isn't that cool, guys? What is that little guy? Sea probe. Malcolm, what's that? It's a little, neat little helicopter. Maybe that's why the camera's alive. Uh, did somebody just land to fix it? This camera we thought was a goner. We saw huge flames roaring up to it uh, during the whole fawn fire. The flames were licking at the camera's lens and then splash. All of a sudden it goes out and we saw a helicopter's belly uh, veering away from it. That was cool. But you could see how many bushes they allowed to grow up right next to the cam and the critical infrastructure of communications. Uh, that should never have happened. We were like, what? What? So, um, seriously, guys, what was the nun thing? I don't understand this private joke. Um, uh, yeah, Alan was saying, um, uh, hang on a second, look at the chat. Radio frequency? Okay, then I don't. Yeah, Dusty, I, I went back up and I was quoting you because uh, you said I'd never seen RF. I've never known RF to absorb uh, something about pine needles. Uh, um, maybe I misunderstood your what you were saying. Let me go back up and uh, can't, uh, copy it. Um, it's kind of far up there. Back in when we were talking about the, uh, the presentation of um, I think it was I think it was um, 
Oh, JE Cat. Okay, that brings it in perspective. What makes cell and Wi Fi in remote softwood forests is the pine needles and the frequency used. The pine needles absorb a lot of the radio frequency, and digital is far worse than analog in the pine forest. Oh, you were talking about radio's uh, interference. I thought you were talking about relative humidity and said F, and typed F instead of H, Dusty. So that's why I was saying, uh, that's why I was saying, yeah, they can. <laughs> so sorry, I thought you were making a typo. You were actually talking to J.E. Cat about radio uh, frequency interference. Okay, okay, we got it. Um, let's look back to, um, uh, Derek says, hey, I'm your man for sar sarcasm. Um, uh, chat kind of went to weird places, guys. I'm not, not going to lie. Um, but this is our current look at, um, the Funfire area. So I think somebody here landed a helicopter and is helping fix the uh, radio tower um, up by Shasta. We can do a little bit of a, what, do we have a time lapse? And we'll look at the monument. It's just breezy. The north wind is starting to come out across the lake, but they, they're really confident that um, they can hold things up over by the lake. And we don't even see the fire. We don't have a cam that really looks at it. We can look at the other cam from the north. Um, Sugarloaf, Shasta, not to be confused with Sugarloaf on the Windy. See how nice that is? Everybody's got fresh, breathable air for the most part. Okay. Oh, Big Dog says, can I ask Dusty about the gel and the red stuff thing? Yeah, there's other firefighters here, um, other than Dusty, too. Uh, you could ask Dusty. Uh, what was your question exactly, Big Dog? Um, I think it was, is, is retardant more of a gel or a liquid? But there's multiple kinds. Oh, the camera's moving around. Look at the red retardant all over. Look at the thick brush and trees growing up around the radio tower. Like, come on. This is what we're so critical of. This shouldn't be allowed. There should be a defensible space around the critical comms. If this radio tower had burned up, Firefighters wouldn't be able to communicate with each other, and then they'd lose the, the fire watch cam. They, ne they, they nearly did. The fire probably did chew through the wires, which um, brought down the cam since the fire the fun fire began. They had to go rescue this cam with a helicopter instead of rescue the neighborhood. That's just gross. That's just wrong. That's why we're uh, pretty critical about this. Ah, okay. Is the gel and the red stuff one and the same? Oh yeah, the the fire retardant gel is red. Uh, but there's different types. Some of it's more liquidy and some of it's more of a gel because there's different types of flame retardant. Maybe maybe Frank, uh, who's firefighter and Dusty, could explain uh, the differences. Or anybody who's bought it for their home. You know, Foss check was kind of, he almost did like an advertisement for it. Uh, Blanco Lirio channel, Juan Brown was talk, uh, talking about how Foscheck helped save his friend's house, but then at the very end of the video he admitted that it was mostly the firefighters that saved his friend's house. But, well, he put Foscheck on the bushes in front of his house, and those didn't burn, but well, the firefighters were there the whole time. But, um, okay, Alan, are you ready? Are you ready? Your mission? Do you choose to accept it? Um, drum roll, please, Ellen. Use your powers for good. But you definitely deserve it. You've been a, a great, helpful person here. You are knighted. Left shoulder, tap. Right shoulder, tap. Rise, Sir Alan. You are now a moderator on the channel. Thank you. Okay. Now, guys, banning people's okay if they're super out of line, like for obvious reasons. But please, do you do you know how to take a screenshot? Please screenshot with the timestamps on the video, and email that to me the moment that the banning takes place. My email and Twitter is in the link in the description. Catherine. Davidson. Wildfires. 
at gmail.com. Now, anybody who feels like they were banned on accident or for a bad reason, a couple of my mods got hacked in the past. A couple of them didn't know what the buttons did. Um, some of them were pure accidents. Uh, please email me. Tell me what your username is, and I'll try to un un uh, what day that might have happened, and I'll try to uh, figure it out. So it's an honor to harass Smitty. Ooh, shots fired, Helen. <laughs> Je Cat says, "Kneel before me, man." <laughs> what a power trip! What have I done? Okay. And also, please write me an email with your contact info. Phone number helps in case there's a problem. And uh, at least so I can email you. So email me immediately. Give me your contact info. Um, and then I can ask questions like, hey, what happened Saturday night? You know, that kind of thing. Even if you're not around. Private messaging within YouTube is kind of non-existent. So. Um, Dusty says, not sure. I'm a few years behind on the latest retardant in uh, commercial uh, retardant technology. If they have some special brandies gel, they can spray it on things. Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Uh, we could look into that later. Right now, we want to check on the river complex and the monument. Uh, I think that one was Shasta Trinity is the monument. What? Oh, do we have new... Uh, there's a new photo at... Uh, that's not a photo. That's a update thing at Lassen National Forest. It, I want to make sure that's not a video. Hey, we do have a video. Okay, let's go with the Dixie West Zone video. It uploaded 36 minutes ago. Buddy, my go. name is Casey Cheesebro, Operations Section Chief with Rocky Mountain Team Black. I'm here to give you the morning operational update for the Dixie Fire West Zone uh, for September 28th. Uh, no additional growth on the fire yesterday, still sitting at 94% containment. A uh, really good day yesterday for the crews. We had that critical weather coming in with the dry air mass, uh, windy weather coming in, and everything continued to hold. Had an increase in smoke throughout the fire area, but uh, crews were able to hold on to uh, any any uh, contained edge that we had out there. So no slop overs, no spot fires, just a really good day. We were helped out with the weather a little bit early. The, uh, the rain came in about four to five hours earlier than, than what we thought it would. And uh, reports are, are showing that we received rain across the entire fire, although the amounts do vary. It had up to a half inch in certain areas and as low as about four hundredths of an inch in other areas. So crews are out there today uh, assessing kind of what that rain did for uh, our future operations. But uh, good news all the way around there. We'll just start over here uh, down at the very south end of the zone. Everything continues to look really good up here through Butte Meadows. Uh, no issues there yesterday. Any smokes that people were seeing were well interior of the line. No threat to, to our containment. And then coming up here into our Division Kilo and Lima towards the National Park, things looked uh, really good in that area. Still continuing a lot of our suppression repair efforts within the National Park. That's all going really well. We're getting more equipment in to help clean that up. So uh, some of that equipment will be working out on the highway today, cleaning some of the debris up out there. Uh, so really, really happy that we're getting that equipment here to, to keep making progress on that operation. Coming up here near Old Station, no issues there yesterday. Again, increase in smoke, but everything well interior, nothing that was identified as a, as a threat by any of our crews out there. As we come up around uh, near Fall River Mills, around the north end of the fire, again, everything looked really good. I uh, had crews spread out here yesterday just monitoring everything, but with the increase in wind, uh, we did back some of the crews out to the main roads just due to the snag hazard with some of the burned trees there. Had an increase in trees coming down, so for crew safety, we did pull those folks out to, uh, out to the main roads just to keep them safe. And then coming down here out towards, uh, towards Highway 44, no issues out there. Uh, everything, again, looking really good down here into Silver Lake. Uh, really the same story, just increase in smoke but no threat. Uh, still continuing all the suppression repair efforts down in that area, cleaning up some of those dozer lines and working around some of the, the residences and whatnot in there, helping clean that area up. And then down into Westwood, Almanor, and Chester in that area, uh, really, really looking good in there. Again, a lot of the, the Cal Fire resources working in there, getting a lot of good suppression repair work done. 
and then uh, just dealing with some of those smokes that are, are near the line, making sure we don't have any issues. But uh, that would be the area where we got the least amount of rain was down around Lake Almanor. So we'll really be focusing some efforts in there to make sure that things are looking good. Uh, our concerns going forward, you know, with that wind, we did get a lot more uh, needles coming off of the burned trees. So that reburn, I think, has been talked about in the past with the, the needles on the ground, having that ability to uh, to reignite and start burning near containment lines. So crews will really be focusing on that. Uh, really, the challenge is just the, the sheer scale of the fire, obviously, making sure we have our resources in, in the right areas to, to jump on anything uh, as quickly as possible. Did want to just remind everybody we have the forest closure still in place. It's the, the blue line on this map. I believe on the Lassen National Forest webpage, you can, can find a map also with that closure. And then uh, all of Lassen National Park is closed as well. So just want to remind the public that those areas are closed. That's for the safety of, of both the public and the fire personnel as well. So just ask that you guys stay out of that area for now and, and be patient with us on that. Uh, that's all I have for today. Uh, thank you. Look at you the stay. look at the enormity of that map. Just that was all kinds of telling. Uh, wow. People people back east may not understand how gigantic this entire region is. This is if you were to zigzag around in your car. Um. This would take many days, many days to drive around. The perimeter of that is like the distance from like Seattle to uh, almost to LA. The the dark brown and the previous burn scars, so you don't count them, but all this peach is the enormity of the Dixie Fire. So if you if you measured, this is 58 miles. I think this is 62 miles. Um, as the crow flies, if you went up and down and up and down, um, that would be way, way longer. That'd be hundreds of miles uh, if you count the actual terrain. Um, if they hammered this flat, it would be the size of Texas. That's what one of the comments was, and it's true. And even, even uh, not counting the up and down nature of the terrain, the, the massive, you know, peaks and valleys. Um, that still is larger than the state of Rhode Island. That that the Dixie Fire is almost a million acres in size, um, square. That's five different counties. You've got Butte County. Then it went into Plumas, went into Lassen, Tehama, and Shasta. And uh, it really wasn't far away from Nevada. So this fire is completely optional. Started by Pacific Gas and Electric's uh, shoddy maintenance uh, procedures. Presumably their equipment is what they took responsible responsibility for. They had a tree lean over on it. And this keeps happening again and again and again. And this section right here was the fly fire. A separate fire that merged with the Dixie. So first their equipment starts the fire here on July, what, 13th? And just when they had the Dixie kind of looking wrapped up with a footprint that was only about that big, or maybe this big, a tree falling on power lines again starts the fly fire, and they drop everything and try to save these towns. And then ultimately that dooms Greenville and such, because they had to put down a lot of their effort and split split their forces uh they were trying to uh, keep it keep it down there. In fact, they were winding down the Dixie Fire response, thinking that they were so confident. Um, they were shutting down some of the um, command posts because they had different ones, places like Quincy and Westwood and other places. And so they were like, oh, we don't need this one anymore. And we only need community updates like at once every other day. And uh, not every day. Then everything went to hell. Uh, Everything changed for the worse when PGE equipment again started a fire and uh, started the fly fire. And uh, it's it's a repeating thing. Uh, Shasta County Sheriff's Office just charged, put criminal charges on PGE because last year they started the Zog fire with the same thing. Trees falling over on their lines. And um, their equipment just falling, uh, faltering and failing. They um, 
the criminal investigation into them for um, when they started the uh, Paradise Fire uh, was that uh, they were they were guilty of manslaughter and they pled guilty with the Zog Fire. They just uh, got they were just charged with manslaughter again last year and uh, the tree that leaned over onto the Zog Fire lines and, and started that by by Redding um, was half broken apart and leaning and they had made note for its removal uh, for two years and so they knew for more than two years that it was a hazard and then they knew that red flag at, or near conditions were coming and they promised the governor people of California and their probation judge that they would uh, turn off the power in uh, fire hazardous conditions and they, they don't and that's what happened with the Zog fire and the fly fire here, they they keep lines energized, even though they know that they could, uh, the slightest wind gust, be compromised by vegetation that they failed to trim back, and um, and hazard trees uh, failed to remove for the last 30 to 40 years. So that's why the enormity of this: the more than 6,000 firefighters, the more than it'll probably be one a one billion dollar uh, cleanup type thing, kind of like Paradise was. Uh, it's you and I that are paying for that. All the other fires in California got bigger after this because they didn't have enough firefighters in all the state to um, respond to this. They pulled them in from the entire country. 25% of the entire nation's firefighters were on this fire. And when the others broke out, like the monument, which we're about to look like, look at, the uh, river complex, and the uh, things like, uh, what was it, Tamarack, I believe, broke out at the same time. They were small at one point and they got huge because um, they didn't have people to send when they requested them. Same same deal with uh, Wendy and the KMP. There's still thousands of firefighters on the Dixie that the fire that didn't need to happen. And uh, it was really small for a couple of weeks and then boom, it exploded. They just didn't have enough people to respond to it. So hopefully one day that company is reined in and they stop killing people and burning up uh, you know five counties at a time. But until then, we got to remain extremely vigilant throughout the fire season. And with my channel, I, I fully expect um, pg and &E to start more fires. And, and you know, arsonists and, and accidents to also happen. We are just now entering California's worst fire season, which is the Santa Ana and Diablo wind season. So we are not uh, exiting it. We, everything is not looking good. We're having a reprieve right now. But the mountains are not really safe until there's snow on them. And the hills, and the foothills and the valleys are not safe at all during winter. October, November, December, January. That's the craziest, worst fire season for the foothills and the valleys and the coast range. Santa Ana's and the Diablo winds usually occur at the same time. So we can celebrate that the end of this one is near, but more will come. And mark my words, I think PG&E will start more fires this year. This is a grim prediction. I really hope I'm wrong. But last year we saw it, you know, just when the glass fire is cooking up, the uh, Zog fire goes. So they have to stop everything and uh, on the um, August complex, drop everything, go respond to the Zog fire. August complex grew to the California's biggest wildfire er ever as kind of a result. So that's what's repeating here, the pattern, but hopefully one day we can break it. Let's go to... Let's see, was it uh, Siskiyou, uh, Shasta Trinity, National Forest. That should have the monument updates. Hopefully they have a video. The poor people over there. This is the second, third, and fourth year, actually, that um, they basically were abandoned because... People like, uh, well, companies like PG&E and uh, other fires start elsewhere. And they have the lowest population in the northwest part of the state, you know, uh, where the fires are. So they'll always shift um, their efforts and peel firefighters away and resources like aircraft away from the smaller communities to protect larger ones. And that's really sad, but they, uh, they take it upon themselves to kind of help themselves and both make their own dozer lines and such around communities like Hayfork, which is pretty fascinating and that's at least a bright spot here. Even if the state and feds kind of abandon you, you can kind of help your, yourselves at the community level, which is 
I want to I want to know more about what they've done to uh, see just how effective that is, and, and maybe highlight them as as uh, you know slave rolling up uh, heroes to save their own community. So let's look at they've got an article about adventure medics. There's a community meeting on Wednesday, the 29th, so that's tomorrow, 1 p.m. at High Impa, um at the volunteer fire department there. I don't know if it'll be broadcast. The recording will be posted on the Facebook page afterwards. Oh, that's good for anybody who cannot appear in person. They have an update from four hours ago for the Monument Fire. And they have a daily weather update, which was five hours ago. Okay, wow, look at the green, fresh air. Nice. Nice. So here's their morning update video. Let's watch that. It was five hours ago. The red team here on the Monument Fire. Good morning, I'm Mark Jamison, Operations Section Chief of the Southern Area Red Team. Here on the Monument Fire. So for today, I mean last night we got some pretty good rain over almost all the fire area, especially on the west side over there. They got it pretty much all day, light rain yesterday and last night down here in, in, in Hayfork. They got a good rain last night, so it's all good. But with, it, with that rain, roads are slick, hazardous conditions, rocks are more likely to roll, trees are more likely to come down. So they'll be going out slowly this morning making sure things are safe. Up here in the uh, Shovel Lake Gap area and Backbone Ridge, they'll be out there doing some more mop up, making sure everything's looking good. Starting to pull the hose if they think it's good, easy. If they think everything's well enough, they'll start pulling the hose out of there. And patrolling, doing the structure um, defense, making sure everything's good on the way. Down here from uh, Hay Fork on around, there'll be uh, <clears throat> also pulling hose, doing some mop up. They're starting to rehab some of the hand lines and looking at rehabbing and, and repair, suppression repair activity on some of the fire lines. In uh, India and Kilo around uh, Trinity Village area and up toward Derry, they'll be looking at the uh, also but real slow out there. They got the most rain, the roads are slick, but uh, they'll be doing some mop up where they can get in and looking at uh, further um, mastication work and chipping work up toward Derry. So that's the plan for today. Okay, everybody take a drink. He said mastication. We love masticators, the uh, the awesome new uh, alternative to dozers, um, new technology that's helping to make a new era of firefighting. They're like a, a wood chipper on steroids at the end of a tractor arm, and uh, it goes and will kind of destroy trees instantly or bushes by the side of the road, making a quick fire line. And um, that's way better, more violent environmentally friendly and faster than dozers and it has a, a buzz saw, a grabbing claw, and a wood chipper at the end. So it can grab a tree's trunk, cut it off at the base, lift it up off the ground, and wood chip it. And so only wood chips hit the ground. That's way better than falling a tree and crushing everything in its path and uh, you know dragging it around like the old uh, type of thing or, or making a having a bulldozer push over everything and destroying everything it's past. That can only work on flat ground and the masticator can like reach downhill or reach uphill to some extent and do it real fast. So we uh, we have we have a milk drinking game here on the channel. So when anybody mentions that we go, yeah because it all started when we were celebrating the new technology that'll help wildfire uh, firefighting. So um take one take one shot of milk. So that's looking great. They got rain. They're they're kind of just patrolling. Uh, what's what's the uh, containment line on it? Um, we got a monument and knob fire uh, meteorologist update. So this is a minute and a half. Let's check out this An one. An inch of rain. 
Hello everyone, this is Incident Meteorologist Trainee John Keyes. We did get some rainfall yesterday all the way up over towards the Knob Fire. We picked up around three quarters to eight tenths of an inch of rain. Over the northwest corner of the fire, about three to four tenths. You get over the central part of the fire, about two to three. And right around a tenth, fifteen hundredths down across the southeast perimeter. Some places picked up just a little bit more of a tenth in those areas. We do have some fog and low clouds around. That will be lifting around midday. And as we go into the afternoon, we'll see northwest winds developing across the entire area. Some of those gusts 15 to 20. We might see uh, an occasional gust 20 to 25, but that's the exception to the norm. And once we do break out today, it's going to be a little cool out there. A lot of areas running in the 50s to low 60s and the higher elevations probably closer to 55 for this afternoon. The rest of this period, it's going to be starting to warm up and dry out. We thought a storm might brush us on Thursday, but that's staying to the north of us. That'll probably increase the wind a little bit. It might also briefly push the humidity back up behind it on Friday, but the trend is going to be warmer and drier, but we're also seeing the winds starting to weaken overall across the area. This is our last regularly scheduled Facebook weather update. We will continue these as needed down the road. Thank you very much, folks, and do stay safe out there, everyone. All right, that's um, the, the short little video there explaining the weather. I love the little chart, and uh, let's go back to where let's go back to where it was shown clearly. Okay, here we go. So afternoon cloud highlights. Um, the smoke and cloud cover is in the yellow. The stable, unstable, and very unstable. That's a different layer that we didn't see down at the K and P chart or the windy chart. So that's very interesting. Um, the ridge winds are very low, so they're all green across the board all the way through Sunday. But looking at the Friday, they have an unstable wind uh, and weather pattern. 80 degrees is a high. I can't believe it's going to be 84 and 85 again. I mean, that's that does happen in September in the uh, northern section of the state. It's kind of a special spot where there's a lot of heat that uh, that happens from the uh, the desert that comes in every once in a while. The desert winds, the north winds can sometimes bring heat. It depends on where they're coming from. Max temperature uh, and then minimum humidity. Uh, 19% and 19% again is still pretty low. But recovery, 95% in the morning, this morning, that's awesome. That's starting to look better and better just as the seasons change. So, precipitation chances zero really sucks for the rest of the week. But, um, still, that's, um, Overall, looking looking pretty good. It's going to get drier. It's not a done deal. Let's see what their containment percentage is at the moment. Um, monument fire update. Current situation. Started July 30th because of that lightning thing that happened. Um, it's now 223,000 acres and one. And 72% contained. The increase in acreage today is due to better mapping, so it's not like it all um, increased in one night. It's just that they weren't able to fly around in, uh, in the storms. Rain cloud cover and 90 to 100 percent relative humidity greatly reduced the higher behavior yesterday. Firefighters took advantage of minimal fire behavior to make progress on mopping up or moving unused equipment, cooling the remainder hot spots, and conducting suppression and repair. Crews made good progress removing hazard trees along Soldier Creek Road in the interior of the fire footprint, working from the east side of the fire at Evans Bar Road, which is just south of Junction City, west to Price Creek Road. On the northeast edge, firefighters patrolled the hand lines from the north edge of the Hobo Gulch Road to Backbone Ridge, and the southern lines from East Fork of the North Fork Trinity to Backbone Ridge, securing the fire's edge along Backbone Ridge and Northern Handline to the west fork, west towards the north fork of the Trinity. They completed mop up on the eastern fire edge along the east fork of the north fork of the Trinity. 
I know that sounds weird, but that is what it's called. It's there's a big, huge part of the river called North Fork, and then there's an East Fork of the North Fork. Don't ask me why. So um, I completed a map up there where it crossed into Hobo Gulch Road. Let's see where, where's the rest of it. I can't zoom and pan. Ah. In order to read the bottom, I have to make micro print. Ah. Zoom in my chair here. Um, in the southwest, crews continued chipping woody debris along High End Palm Road, and a pilot car returning from escort mission nearly missed being struck by a four-foot diameter tree falling across the road. Whoa, a pilot car with an escort mission was almost struck by a four-foot diameter tree falling across the road near the eastern end of the road closure by Judd Creek. Yikes! This indicated that more assessment of the hazard trees needs to be done, I'll say, before that road is opened. Crews continued to make good progress, chipping up slash along the uh, 08 Butter Creek Road. I hope that they had a GoPro or a dash cam or something. Northwest side, firefighters patrolled, mopped up, and assessed what equipment is in excess. Crews scouted roads up to Jim Jam Trailhead to see what work needs to be done to reduce fire hazards and widen the defensible space along the roads. Um, is there page two? Let's see. Blah, 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 blah. Anything else of note? They're trying to work on secondary containment lines to the north of the Daly Ranch on the northwest side and uh, Continue to structure f defense around that ranch, that ranch, the Denny, and the New River Trailhead. The north side of the fire has been held in check some by the footprint of the 2015 Happy Fire. On the west side, crews will continue to mop up and patrols needed to retrieve equipment around Butter Creek Meadows. Blah, blah, blah. Shipping operations. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, the, a burned area emergency rehab team will be working in the Monument Fire today to, ex to assess long-term remediation of some areas. The southeast section of the fire is cold and is being monitored from the ground and with aircraft. California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection will respond to the area if necessary. There's 749 personnel, 12 hand crews, 48, 48 engines, 6 helicopters, 4 bulldozers, 16 water tenders, and 11 masticators and chippers, 4 excavators, and 3 scavengers on the fire. And rainfall yesterday over the area ranged from uh, 0.04 inches at the northwest near Trinity Village to 0 0.01 inches on the east side near Junction City. Today, clouds will decrease throughout the day, leading to some late day sunshine. High temps will be near 70, with minimum relative humidity around 30% due to the rainfall received yesterday. Winds will be from the northwest 10 to 15 miles an hour. Weather conditions will return to dry and warm throughout the week, and high temps climbing back into the 80s. Relative humidity dipping back into the teens by late week. Higher relative humidity, extensive cloud cover, and a chance of rain will keep fire behavior to a minimum today. With creeping and smoldering, logs and stumps and sheltered areas with heavy timber overstory will still have potential to retain some heat, though. Areas of concern including the northeast portion of the fire west of Backbone Ridge, where the fire spread is still possible. South and east aspects are most concerned. Fire will continue to creep down towards the north fork of the Trinity. On the northwest portion of the fire, fire will creep and smolder towards the southwest towards the confluence of the Trinity and the New Rivers. On the southwest portion of the fire, between a Fork and Hay Fork and High Palm, large logs and stumps and interior pockets of unburned veggie will continue to smolder. Burning material rolling downhill, which is called roll out, and snags along the line, which are standing dead trees, continue to be a concern along the containment lines. Nothing like a big tree that's perhaps on fire, pretty tall, to fall down across a containment line and introduce fire on the other side, right? So that's the monuments update. Let's see if we've got something for the cash and whatnot. Wasn't that Siskiyou? Was that Siskiyou National Forest? 
Oh, that's just your Rogue River. That's not the right part. Um, uh, let's see. I always get this confused. Cal Fire, Siskiyou Unit. Oh, Klamath National Forest. Sorry, guys. A new reduction in fire evacuation orders for Trinity County Sheriff's Office. So, on the river, one hour ago, hot off the press. Zone 3 on the river complex has been reduced to a warning. Yay! That's Ramshorn Road, west of Ramshorn Road to the Trinity Alps Wilderness, south of the Billy's Peak. Billy's Peak east to North Derrick Flat Road. This includes Billy's Peak Road, Eagle Creek Loop Road, and Ripple Creek Cabins. Upgrade sections going from south to north include, but not limited to, 31, 32, 29, 30, 20, 21, and southern portions of sections 15 and 16. So, we're going to look at uh, river update, river complex update. That's hot off the press. We've got something to read here. Do we have a do you have a video? Yeah, four hours ago there was a video. Good morning, my name is Mick Elmquist. I'm the fire behavior analyst for California Incident Management Team 15 here on the Shasta Trinity National Forest, Klamath National Forest on the river complex. Today is Tuesday, September 28th. I'm gonna give you an operational update. Uh, yesterday, as you guys well know, we had some uh, precipitation over the fire area. The highest precipitation totals were up on the Eddie Gulch lookout on the north part of the fire at the upper elevations where we got about seven tenths. The east side of the fire where we still have active fire is uh, generally about a third of an inch, but obviously those conditions were all very conducive for the fire crews to increase containment. Uh, nothing new to report on the Cronin fire. Union, Kilo, Lima still uh, concentrates on the equipment backhaul. They're finding miscellaneous stump holes and some uh, heat still remaining in some of the dead surface fuels. So they're, uh, anything with any potential, there's remaining vigilant in there and conducting mop-up operations as they backhaul equipment. Going over to the east side of the fire, uh, the fire still continues to back down from the Craggy Peak Ridge towards the Little Mill Creek. We have crews in there, uh, will continue to assess as that fire comes down and meets the control lines. They have hose lays and they'll secure it as it does so. The Tangle Blue Spike uh, or Tangle Blue Spot Fire was lined uh, several uh, days ago. They continued to secure that. It's about 300 acres, um, so we're feeling pretty confident after yesterday's rain that they'll be able to uh, show that um, and leave it unstaffed. It's actually black lined on today's map. Those crews are going to walk out to the west and pick up the fire's edge and then start uh, constructing direct line uh, where it's safe to do so. They're going to be working uh, to the south as the crew that were inserted in Division Oscar uh, a couple days ago um, are working north. They're able to make direct line containment efforts yesterday all the way up to where you see mule spike and sling. So that's where they slept uh, last night. They're being supported remotely with helicopter operations that uh, sling in their gear, food, and saw gas. And so the, the plan is they'll continue their direct line efforts to the north as the crew from Division or the crews from Division Mike were work south. There's some of this area up there that they're not going to be able to get into just due to terrain, but uh, we're feeling pretty confident that they're going to be able to access and get direct line on any areas of concern. So that's going to be the emphasis the next couple days. The fires in uh, Minnehaha Creek in Division Oscar, that's all direct line. Um, we're still going to have a presence uh, crews in there mopping up, taking advantage of this uh, weather that we currently have. The, uh, the main concern, and it's not that big of one, is just roll out there's very steep slopes so any sort of burning material or trees that uh, burn out that are holding heat could potentially cross the line so they'll continue to uh, secure that portion of the fire the next th next several days everything looks good uh, down on the south side of the fire there was an unburned uh, island that was holding heat up uh, upper Coffee Creek Road, kind of near the North Fork of Coffee Creek. There's going to crew, uh, be a crew that goes in there today. It's well interior, but it does have uh, several acres of unburned fuel around it, so they're going to look to cut that piece of heat out to make sure that there's not any issues uh, moving forward. Everything continues to look good on the south end of the fire. Uh, there's still a few uh, unburned islands up here in the Sugar Pine Butte area. That'll continue to consume, but there is very 
good uh, granite ridge here, so we don't have any concerns about that moving out or moving around too much. Um, everything is still looking good on Division Romeo and out in Division Sierra and Tango. That's out in the Trinity the Alps wilderness, and that will continue to be monitored by air. And uh, last night we weren't able to get an infrared flight like we normally do due to the cloud cover, so the perimeter remains as it was before at 198,555 acres. We plan on getting one tonight, and that will identify the remaining hotspots. That's the end of my report. Appreciate you listening. Thank you. Well, very happy that they got that. Um, they got that spot fire contained, and they're so confident about it. They're like, well, we don't need to be there anymore. And we have to appreciate how these these crews just slept outside in the wilderness. I wonder if they have tents or whatever. Maybe Dusty or, or Frank can let me know. What do they do when they have to camp out? Do they carry around tents on their backs? Or they sleep under the stars? Or does a helicopter come and bring them tents? Um, how does that work when they, um, when they hike into an area and have to sleep out there? I'm kind of curious. Um, that's looking much better. The river complex... Uh, it's uh, finally starting to turn the tide on that one as well. We've got some good moisture and some rain. It's awesome that the evacuation um, evacuations uh, are being reduced to a warning in some places. The bulletin released for today um, will illuminate on what he said. Although light yesterday's precipitation combined with below normal temperatures extended a period of high humidity will keep fuel moistures up for the next several operational periods. Yay! Next several days. <laughs> Overall fire activity should be minimal and isolated to smoldering in the heavier dead ground fields. Those conditions will allow opportunity for success in continuing direct line construction and mop-up efforts. Several additional interagency hotshot crews arrived at the incident yesterday. These crews will be inserted to assist the other crews constructing direct hand line on the eastern portions of the fire today. All signs point to favorable conditions for the rest of the week for firefighters to be successful in containing the eastern flank um, and the fire near its current perimeter. Sweet. The Cronan fire is 100% contained and is in patrol status. Yay! Crews will continue to go direct on the hay press. Weather prevented the use of infrared and therefore the fire ac acreage is unchanged. That's okay, though, because the reason the weather prevented it was cloud cover that brought a lot of moisture. So, we'll take it. Oh, excuse me. Total acreage is 198,555 acres. At the river complex, river complex is a, a series of fires. They may or may not have grown together, but it's usually, usually because of lightning strikes in a general area. When they all start at once, they'll just call that a complex. They... Many of them do merge together over time, but not all of them. Like the Cronan was was out by by itself there. So the hay press in the summer is 192,615 uh, acres. The Cronan itself was 5,940 acres. Containment in general is 67 percent. So the hay press in the summers were the ones that merged, and there were a bunch of smaller spots that they. Or they contained a long time ago, uh, smaller lightning areas. So resources, 902 personnel, 25 hand crews, 15 helicopters, 24 engines, 12 dozers, excuse me, 12 dozers, 13 tenders, 4, uh, eva four excavators, excuse me, 12 masticators, and 4 skid steers. What's a skid steer? Property damage assessment. For questions or info regarding the status of your property, Call Trinity County Office of Emergency Services, 530-623-8223. And I forgot that I should probably share a lot of these things to my new super um, um, uh, Facebook. I don't share now to the public. I don't rely on my Facebook for anything. I, I barely pay attention to it. Um, and mostly I just go here for the meetings. So, there is a f general forest service update, which I think is the same thing I just read. The cash fire operations update. That was five hours ago. Let's watch this.
All right, good morning. Karen Scholl, Operations Section Chief with the Alaska Incident Management Team. Here on Tuesday, September 28th for your morning briefing. So yesterday, as you all know, we had quite a bit of rain over the fire area, anywhere from uh, six tenths to about four tenths of rain, a uh, little bit heavier uh, to the north, about four tenths down south, and then a little bit lighter, a uh, little bit less to the east. Uh, still with that rain, uh, super helpful, but we, we still do have quite a large fire footprint out there. And as the days start to dry over the next week, can anticipate some smoldering of uh, fuels again. So the rain helps, but it's not over just quite yet. Yesterday we did, we were able to get some folks off the blacktop, <clears throat> basically working off the blacktop, uh, pulling structure protection up and around some uh, campgrounds to the north and then up in the happy camp area. A few folks uh, out in China Grade area uh, staying on the blacktop because you know how the, the roads get really slick out here. So just trying to keep everybody safe with all the rain, but some work was being accomplished. Uh, as you can see, we did black line this the other day, so today's plan is for those uh, folks that are up here is to continue and do another walk walk through grid basically of, uh, of the line as it comes down uh, towards the uh, Buck Mountain area. And we're anticipating this will be black lined uh, by the end of shift today. Uh, that's the extent of our intention of going into the wilderness to do some pressure activities. So we're going to hold it up there. Uh, the reason we don't need to or feel we're, we're not going to go into this area uh, on the eastern portion is all the natural barriers that are out there. The rain's taken a, a big um, punch out of the fire and during our time here really we haven't had any forward progression. We've had some areas close in but we haven't really had any forward progression to the east. Uh, that with the extended uh, distances and lack of ability to support people out there, uh, we just don't feel that it's necessary uh, to get boots on the ground all the way around the rest of this fire. As we uh, move to across, uh, today's plan up in, in uh, the northern portion is to get people as able, we have to let the, dr the roads dry out a bit, but have folks back into the Elk Creek Road area assessing what they can do. Our resource advisors are with them, advising on uh, what types and when uh, and where the repair work is going to happen. And again, the repair work is suppression activities uh, taken to suppress the fire. So putting bulldozer lines in, putting hand lines in, um, masticating roads, uh, hazard trees, uh, removal, all of that has to be dealt with and that's all considered repair. So those are the types of activities that are being assessed uh, and when we can start engaging, we'll get in there and do that. We've done quite a bit already, mind you, but we're uh, continuing to, to consider the conditions uh, before we commit people. So over the next day or two, we'll be really moving forward on that. We'll have folks up in the chicken ladder area, Bishop Bowl, taking a look at that um, and uh, ensuring that everything is good. I mean, obviously with the rain, that's super helpful, uh, but we will have folks in uh, putting the heavies out. And the rain doesn't generally put the heavies out uh, for quite a while just because of the dryness of those fuels. So folks will be in here mopping that up and then also assessing the work areas for uh, the repair. Uh, our structure group talked about them already pulling a lot of the pumps and hose out of the out of the um, uh, communities to the north as well as Independence Ferry area. As we move back down around to the west side of the fire, a lot of the same activities are happening down here. As you can see, there's a lot of repair that needs to occur in the uh, south of the uh, lookout. So. We're starting to get the resources needed. We're ordering those and they're starting to come in slowly and we're devising a plan on how to, how to go about the repair needs in, uh, in the T-Bar area, Patterson Road, and, uh, and places down south. We've got folks on the Camp 3 Road masticating piles that had been cut previously. So they'll be masticating that <clears throat> and then also uh, pulling the and pulling material out of the barrow ditches along the side of the road so we don't impede water flow. So those are some of those activities. Black Mountain 
uh, project is done. The road prep was complete. We're just cleaning up uh, what was left there. Folks will go back in, make sure there's no heat in this area. And then our structure group in the, in the south, they'll continue, they've uh, completed all of the, the brushing around homes uh, that uh, have been identified down in the Ishipishi area. So that's complete. They'll also be assisting with pulling uh, tactical gear, pumps, hose, pumpkins um, out of the areas that they were deployed previously. So yesterday we did, uh, we were able to accomplish some work, but also it was a nice day for our firefighters just to kind of uh, take a breath, uh, sharpen their tools, uh, uh, and just get a little bit of a, a breather in. Uh, this next phase of work, it's kind of a switch from suppression and then you move into repair. So it's a little bit of a mind switch, so they're, they're focusing now on, on the things that need to accomplish to get the, the suppression repair damage, um, or the suppression activity damage repaired. So that's what's uh, happening today. Um, again, we have really not much intention to go further in with boots. However, we will be flying recons um, pretty much daily, uh, watching the activity if there's any left on Steinecker Ridge, down in Woolly Creek, out to the east, and then uh, the whole uh, east side. So daily flights are scheduled, uh, reconnaissance flights, just to ensure everything's looking good. And that's it for your update. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay. I would just love to hand her a bouquet of flowers and be like, we think we love you firefighters. You know, you can tell a lot of them are weary and tired like that. Um, that's, that's pretty cool that they don't even have to staff the east side. The, uh, the fires run up against uh, terrain over here that they don't expect it to be able to pass. Even without people there, it hasn't moved. And um, this is some of the most steep and rugged terrain around. Uh, this is a, a pretty non, not really ever developed kind of wilderness area. So this is extremely difficult for them to get up uh, around and hike to. And so it's looking looking good with the favorable weather here in the McCash as well. I just wanted to say something about the spammer thing in chat. Don't don't report a bot like that for harassment. Um, that's not harassment. It's actually pornography. And so harassment is like a maybe we should block this user and it goes to the back burner of whatever YouTube uh, wants to look at. But if you put explicit material and pornography spam, which is what that is, it just boom, automatically gets taken off and uh, it's much going to be much quicker. It's a bot. It's not a person. Just people program bots to spread their spam all over every kind of live stream that happens to be broadcasting at the same time on um, on YouTube. I just happen to be live. That's not a person. Even if you typed to them, that's that's not a person. The bots are making new accounts at Facebook, and then they go into live streams and they spam and spam their links, and then they get banned. And the bot makes a new account on YouTube, and they span their links, and then they get banned. And it kind of works like that. So, oh yeah, Big Dog, we've been struggling with this for like 60 days in a row. It's just, uh, we report it every time it happens immediately, but it comes right back because it's a bot. These bots work faster than a human can even click. So, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get rid of them, but it's just sort of a it's just sort of a, a YouTube phenomenon and YouTube has to you see I keep reporting to YouTube hey there's a bot and the bot keeps making an account called webcams blah 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 you would think that YouTube wouldn't allow that same username to make a new account but they do yeah, she does always seem pretty tired. Maybe she's just not a morning person. But the fire crews have been absolutely exhausted. Absolutely exhausted uh, at this for a very long time. So we that's why we have to give them support. And say, you know, thank you. Thank you for the update. Thank you for what you're doing. And big hearts and stuff. It does help uh, refill people's spirits and give them a sort of an energy, you know. Um, I know it does for me when people pat me on the head. And uh, so I think that's about our update. I think we're at the end of updates for uh, 
you know, uh, the fires, this is hilarious, this is our circle of metal chairs outside, and they said, photo, a circle of empty chairs sits in the rain at the McCash fire, uh, instant command post. Rain is a welcome event on a fire, but it does make having an outdoor meeting a bit more challenging. <laughs> Look at the horrible weed growth, and these are fire-promoting weeds. This is a great example of Himalayan blackberry just taking over regions, and they choke out all the native plants and make, make them die. And this is about six to seven feet tall, the weeds. In fact, here's some dead, uh, dying uh, trees that they took over that they're going to try to strangle. And when these are on fire, the flame height can be easily like that. It's uh, They burn really quickly. But when you have power lines, you can see how the weeds under the power lines will eat, burn off the insulation. And, and then the lines topple. And uh, here comes the fire crews. They're like, oh, we'll put out the blackberry fire, right? They can't put water up there because they'll electrocute themselves. So you can't have fire-promoting weeds underneath uh, power lines. Or just on the landscape in general, this is one of the big problems that California, Oregon, and Washington has. Um, look at the, the, it's like kindling at the base. See all the weeds, the blackberry at the base of this tree? So if there was a grass fire, it would be like, okay, tree would shrug it off because it has protective bark, right? Well, it would hit the blackberries and catch the branches on fire. And uh, we saw this happen to deadly effect at the Beachy Creek, where the blackberries were growing uh, up underneath the power lines for the entire length of the uh, lines, all the way from Detroit Lake almost to Staten. That's a huge amount of, uh, a huge distance. And that meant the fire crews had to abandon like 10 towns in the mountains instead of trying to uh, protect them because the insulation burned off all the, uh, the power lines and then they toppled. It was a pretty bad situation, but there are many different reasons for why fires get so bad in California, Washington, Oregon. And Himalayan blackberry, these horrible weeds and fire-promoting weeds like uh, scotch broom and non-native grasses that promote a fire and burn uh, hotter, that's one of them. So simply removing weeds like that with like masticators and such will be uh, really a good step in the right direction, but we have to get grant money and stuff to do that. So, it is poor management, absolutely. So, go back up to what started in the Gulf War. I'm not really sure what you're referring to. Um, I don't, we can check cams. I've got the multicam link here. And pretty much everything is non-visible as far as fires are concerned and or in uh, the clouds. The KMP and the Windy are looking better. It's much more humid down there because of the clouds, even though it's windy. Um, here's the best view of the KMP. There's helicopters down there, but probably not for very long because, well, it's cloudy. Here is the current view of the Highline Trail, uh, showing the retardant of the landscape with the, uh, the fawn fire. Can't even see the fawn fire smoke. It's not expected to do anything today, despite the north winds on Shasta. Um, here's Sierra Tahoe. There's still some smokes over by Fornai and uh, uh, Echo Lakes and such. But everything remained within its footprint, despite the high winds, probably because it was so moist. Here's Lake Springs. Barely any smoke. Visible. Looking good. Check of the aircraft. Don't see anything over the... Uh, Windy whatsoever. Got a scouting type plane over the KMP, but no helicopters anymore. It doesn't look like we'll have VLAT action today, period, because of the weather. Um, a helicopter is flying around Tahoe just looking at things, but it's pretty pretty uh, cloudy down there too and windy. Uh, got a helicopter running around uh, looking at things. By the Devil's Punch Bowl in Taylorsville. I wonder if Daniel Kearns has uh, checked in for a bit. Let's see if he's made a video. He hasn't made one for a long time. Boy, he was making several a day. That was amazing of him. Don't see any aircraft really over the fire at the Fawn. Not sure what that Airbus helicopter is. Uh, 
There's really not much to report. You can look up uh, Daniel Kearns Taylor's Belt. It's funny, he probably has no idea who he who I am, but I've been showing his videos almost every day for almost 70 days. <laughs> probably about 60. Um, let's see, he's promoting rebuilding of the Greenville Resource Center. Cool. Um, they have meetings. He's hosting meetings and, and stuff for people. Five days ago, he had an update. Uh, I'm not sure what he's talking about. Uh, did he shave? No. Nope. Haircut? Maybe. Uh, September 20th, he was live, so like eight days ago. Um, let's see what he's talking Sometime, about. Uh, almost three o'clock. Just wanted to touch base with everyone. Uh, uh, I'd like to announce again uh, our. Indian Valley United Gathering, uh, which will be happening this Friday. Uh, five o'clock to six o'clock is social hour and potluck. We're also um, very happy and excited to announce um, that Indian Valley Sheep Co., uh, which I think that was last Friday, is Nikki and Ed Hamrick, who raise sheep uh, for grazing and for food, and they sell the meat. They're going to be Bring in the sliders, lamb sliders for us, uh, and then also the potluck time. Um, it's really, it, the last one, it was really just fun to see people, really great to just get, have some time to chat with people. People, you know, we've been a while away from each other for a while, so it's been really, it was really nice to have that time for people to get together and connect um, and also meet each other. And because we we have some new community members, um, and so it's, it's been great. I would also like to say specifically on the agenda for this week, we are going to have Rose Brazetta will be back to talk about what's going on with the board of supervisors. I was hoping you give us a fire update, like looking at maps. Cause that's the main thing we're here for. Otherwise, it's hyper local info. He's not really talking about the fire, so. Um, here's a link to his page if you want to go check out what he's saying. Um, we can look at Lassen uh, National Forest for an east side update video. I don't know if we had one of those. Uh, we just have their press release things. The West Zone. An evening update. So, I guess we don't have an East Zone video today for the last in uh, the East Side of the Dixie. So, yeah, I think that's basically it. And I think I should probably, perhaps, get a little bit of uh, R and R time in for myself because my voice is going to falter and die if I uh, if I uh, don't take care of it. So let me look back at chat. I haven't really looked up for a long time. Sorry, guys. I'm going to go up here. Um, let's see. Going up towards... It, does anybody have a question on the current fire situation? There's almost nothing to hear, see, or do anymore. I was thinking of taking a break until like 7 p.m. or so. Um, and then we do a video roundup and see what's going on. I can kind of monitor the fires from my armchair here and come back live of course if there's some sort of a some sort of a you know happening um Frank Presley says the skid steers or small tractors four wheels or tract may have a masticator in place or a bucket oh that's cool um let's see Looking, uh, let's see. <laughs> okay, Chris. Yeah, I think I made Chris happy by saying it was poor management. Absolutely. Um, Desiree says, I was going to say it would be great if he came down and did the fawn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, Chris W5CMP says, was watching the Santiago Peak live stream, but it seems to be looking, uh, looping. What's, what's Santiago Peak? Is that the one for the Canary Islands? Uh, that's been incredible, that eruption thing. Um, yeah, but, uh, the high school at Greenfield did not. I'm not sure about the, uh, I'm not sure about any other schools uh, burning down Greenville, Big Dog. Um, oh, oh, you mean one of the lookout, the fire lookout cams? Oh, SoCal? Patrol mode, software scans for the fires and then alerts if there's a fire. Yeah, it's, it's AI, actually. So when the cameras pivot around and constantly turn, that's patrol mode, and it's looking for smoke, and then AI technology is looking for a smoke column. And if it thinks it sees one, then a human being is alerted, and then they will usually stop the um, the, uh, the the pivoting, the turning around, the rotating is what I meant. Yeah, looping in a video means the same video is playing again and again. That's what looping means. But rotating, I think, is the word you're looking for, where the camera just looks around and around and around. The, the a lot of them are in that mode. Uh, if there's two on the same tower, there'll be one that looks generally in one direction all day, and the other one's in patrol. And if uh, something major close by happens, then sometimes both will look at the same thing, like at Tobias Peak, uh, where the fire was approaching the camera. You know, um, So even if something amazing is happening, sometimes frustratingly the cameras rotate around, like at Dire Mountain, even though 600 tall flames were coming over the top of uh, Dire Mountain with that firestorm and pyrocumulus cloud, so they still look out for other spot fires and other fires, even though there's the one to look at would be like, wow, you know, in the in, a, in the view. Oh, it jumps from day to night mode. That's weird. Let's take a look at it. Actually, that sounds weird. Um, the Santiago Peak in LA. Let's take a look. So there's the Bear Mountain Shasta one. Uh, the LA in orange. Um, Santiago. So glad that uh, we still have the Wilson Observatory. Last year's Bobcat fire, we uh, thought we might lose it. I We spent a lot of time on the cam last year here for the Wilson Observatory. There's too many dang trees up there. Half of them were dead. I was hoping they reduced the amount of trees so that we don't lose it again this year. But, well, who knows. Let's go to Santiago. Santiago Peak 1, or what? We could do a one hour. Wow, that's cool. Cloud formation is neat. Does anybody have a question about any of the fires right now? I'm looking at Santiago Peak. I just don't see uh, anything happening within the last hour. Uh, that's the one hour loop. Uh, there's others. Santiago Peak 2 is probably the one in loop mode, or excuse me, rotate mode. And patrol mode. Yeah, see it just changed its... Uh, yeah, it's the one that's looking around different directions constantly. With all this cloud cover, I don't know why it's bothering. Um, And there's the other Santiago Peak, Colois. Col Col I have no idea how to say that. Let's do a one hour loop. Uh, excuse me, time lapse. Now I got, now I'm stuck on saying loop. No. Cloud formation. The way that can help fires is shading the ground, you know. Even that 
helps them to not dry as dry, helps the vegetation to not dry dry out as as much. Um, yeah, I don't I don't see that any of these are going into nighttime mode or anything. Um, make sure cookies are not blocked and an ad blocker is not on. Otherwise, it can really screw up your connection to alert wildfire cams. Um, if it if you did a 12 hour time lapse on this sometimes at night if there's anything that's bright it'll switch into daytime camera mode it's automatic um, sometimes you just screwed up but that's nighttime uh, this is the 12 hour SoCal Broadcast Engineer is his can. Okay. How neat is that? That's dawn in the clouds. It's almost like an ocean. That's some eye candy. Now some of the Southern California cams and the like Monterey Bay type cams can show you some amazing sunrises of the ocean and sunsets too. With gold colors on the uh, early morning fog. Big Dog says Santiago Peak, another can with lots of brush at its base. Yeah, what is that about? Do they just want to lose critical infrastructure? I mean, that would be the best way to go about it. Can you imagine, like, in World War II, uh, Japanese saboteurs were, they had plans to land them on the beaches. And they would blend in with society, and they would go and light uh, fires and commit arson, especially in the Pacific Northwest, where they knew that the Tillamook burn was devastating, and where they were going to try to repeat it. They abandoned those plans when uh, the Japanese were got taken to camps. That's basically why they were taken to camps. We intercepted uh, United States intercepted their coded messages and learned about their plans, and removed any people they could blend in with. Which, not defending it, just explaining it. Can you imagine if, if right now we were at war with Japan, if World War II was happening right now, they'd just walk up and be like, wow, this is so easy. Flick a cigarette and walk away and destroy all of our critical infrastructure uh, comms just because we let bushes grow up right next to them. Just like, what is this? This is very expensive to replace. Weed whacking is not very expensive, though. Uh, we see this time and time again, and now we're losing historical fire lookouts because we're not maintaining them and we're letting a brush to go right up next to it. We lost Mule Peak last week. We almost lost Tobias Peak last night, and we all, and we did lose one of the uh, lookouts. It was made out of stone in Lassen County. That's the thing that gets me. The one in Lassen County was made out of stone. It had a wooden walkway. A wooden staircase, but this is how I feel. It's like, come on now. What's going on? The public should be able to sue whoever's in charge of that for just getting uh, hazardous conditions that result in the destruction of our heritage. We're giving them money to take care of it, take care of the forest, and take care of our history. When they destroy it and neglect it, uh, sometimes they bulldoze it on purpose, they should be held accountable. So in Lassen County, the one that we lost was, uh, but to the Dixie, was the, uh, can't remember which one it was, the, not Peg Leg, did we lose Ladder Butte? Nope, that one was already gone, that's where it used to be. Um, Dixie Fire, Dixie Fire destroys Fire Lookout. It was 91 years old. Classical. It's made out of stone. All you got to do is wrap that stuff, secure it securely, wet it down, put it on the uh, put it on the roof, and then weed whack the vegetation around. It's at the top of a hill. Like it just. I don't get it. It's made out of stone. It's just really sad. I don't get it. 
they needed shutters, of course, of some sort to, uh, if the, if the windows break, then of course embers can go in there. But it lasted 94 years for a reason. Uh, in the past, they kept vegetation away from it. Uh, just really sad. But anyway, maybe one day they'll learn. If they don't, it's our tax dollars at work. So nice to see that we don't have too many heat detections today on any any of the fires. So, um, Teen Homesteader says clouds are getting dark where I am. Cool, cool. We want rain. We want rain. Let's look at the current radar. Sometimes, you know, we can't blame individual park rangers. Oftentimes, they they just don't have the budget to do what they want. Maybe they're chronically under-budgeted or short-staffed, whatever the reason is. But they should allow volunteers. If they said, hey, volunteers needed to protect the lookout, hundreds of people would, would, ra would raise their hands. Just something has to change. What I'm mad at is that when this happens, when they raise several thousand dollars and they want to say, hey, we'll, we'll repair the roof on an ancient cabin that's in need of repair. Uh, that's uh, on public land and it's, you know, historical. Usually they're told, no, go home. That's just part of the frustration. So whatever rules that are blocking things needs to, needs to change. Now that's live lightning strike. You can go on to uh, weather radar, loop it for the past six hours. Here's moisture over the west. Not too much. Mostly running around Portland to Seattle. We can go into satellite view. This last two hours. There's clouds, but not much in the way of clouds with moisture. I wonder what this is. If that'll bring any moisture. But for the forecast, mostly no. According to uh, what we've been reading. It's going to be a drying period, unfortunately. Strange, it looks kind of like it has moisture. Let's go to visible spectrum. I like the look at that, it's pretty. And we've got infrared plus. It does seem to have some moisture in it. Huh. Well, we'll continue to look at the uh, weather situation later. So, Alan T says, I believe there are over 5,000 radio transmitters on Santiago Peak. 5,000? Well, Smitty says exactly by the way the report you cite World War II saboteurs found to be substantiated by an O military and policing agency, something of an urban legend, but it's, it's not an urban legend. Uh, it's declassified. It was, a, it was an urban legend before being declassified. That uh, happened relatively recently in the last 10 years. Um, they, the Japanese were running off the coast of uh, Oregon. I visited a museum at Brookings, which is a museum dedicated to, well, the fact that Brookings, Oregon was bombed by the Japanese in World War II. People don't realize that. It was. It was right. Brookings is approximately right here. And uh, the Japanese had subs off the coast. And um, they couldn't land nearby and land people on the beach. Uh, the Germans were making plans to do that too in the New York area and do some sabotage. They may have accomplished that in World War I. Um, it's kind of up in the air, but a couple of munition ships kind of blew up in harbor and that sort of, th sort of thing. But they uh, decided that if they couldn't land anybody and blend in with the environment, uh, a plan B was tested and a sub surfaced off of, uh, wait, maybe Brookings is down here actually surfaced off of the coast and they had tiny airplanes like biplane types um, kind of latched onto the sub and they surfaced and it went over to Brookings and it dropped bombs trying to start a fire incendiary types 
Now, Brookings had a massive fire. Like I said, they were inspired by the 1930s fires, the Tillamook Burn. And down here, Brookings had a massive fire on the coast at, in the same era. And so in World War II, it was just a few years later, we're like, let's try to do that again. And um, <clears throat> it didn't really take that much, but it did start some fires. And they found, uh, you know, some of the bombs, and it's in the museum, some of the piece, particles related to it. And there's a Japanese sword, and there's a movie you can go in there and watch. Um, there's a Japanese sword on display. So the pilot comes back later in his life to apologize. I don't know the particulars about how he felt about the situation, but I think he felt that it was a cowardly type of attack. It was against Bushido or some something similar. Um, a hit and run kind of a strike or whatever his personal feeling was, he was very regretful. So he offered his sword to the city or to the museum and they were kind of bewildered and were like, sure. And they accepted it. And he felt very relieved and thanked them very vigorously and explained he was going to commit suicide if they did not accept the sword. He was going to fall on it in Sipaku. And that was like an oh. We, we can't forget the massive cultural differences, but uh, he was going to do that to retain, regain his honor after committing what he thought was something dishonorable. It was. It's quite a muse quite an eye-opening museum to visit, um, and it has quite a lot of uh, interesting uh, uh, things there. So the next Plan C, if they couldn't do sabotage and they couldn't uh, effectively launch aircraft after the subs surfaced, there was a massive a response was to build massive blimp, uh, blimp hangars all over the coast, and the blimps were on patrol uh, looking out for the subs. Um, and they were like, okay, plan C, launch the balloon bombs all the way from Japan. Uh, they would go with trade winds, uh, pretty much. You see how in this loop, winds are coming from the, uh, across the ocean and going mostly, mostly to the Pacific Northwest. So off of Japan, they released balloon bombs and they were on an altitude timer. They crossed the entire ocean. And they went all over the country, but mostly landed in the Pacific Northwest. And they were incendiary devices meant to start wildfires. So it was classified until somewhat recently, like we're talking last, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, they even approached the press, the uh, State Department, Department of Defense, military, whatever, said to the newspaper men, you are not to report on this. Every time a fire starts in wartime here, that could be these balloon bombs, you are to report in the back section of your newspaper as if it's unimportant that a cigarette, lightning, whatever, started these fires so as not to cause a panic. And they complied. I went back to old 40s newspapers and found a lot of weird, suspicious little fires in the back page news when uh, Google had... Uh, the uh, scanned all the newspapers and had it available as an archive. They kind of took that offline, which really sucks. Um, but I found tons of articles like that. Mostly the trade winds delivered the balloon bombs in the wet autumn periods, in the wet season, September and such, like we're experiencing now. You can see some of the trade winds in action, sort of. And so that wasn't that effective as a plan. But some of them did get started and may have been sus substantial. They are still all over the place. These balloon bombs were not all found. The blimp's secret mission, mission that other than patrolling for subs, was to intercept the balloon bombs. They had little airplanes that could detach from the blimps, and they could uh, radio in uh, naval air stations, uh, fighter planes, to go and intercept the balloons, too. Many of them were missed, especially the ones at night. They, didn't, they weren't lit up or anything. So the ones that arrived at night generally fell across the landscape. And eventually, uh, they're still being found to this day. But uh, one blew up a family. That was the only firm confirmed fatality, like direct fatality. It was quite a long time later. Um, but there was a road work thing going on. <clears throat> Husband gets out to talk to the 
road maintenance people. Family gets out to stretch their legs. Mommy, mommy, come look at this. Mom walks over. Family blows up. It's a real sad case. I think I was in like 1955 or something. It was much later. But um, we, we'll never really know how many are still in the landscape. They look like this. So I keep telling people like to go ghost tanning or hiking or, or anything. Um, yeah, let's see, when did it happen? Oh, it was actually in 1945, but after the war, I believe. The balloon bomb killed six Americans, five of them children in Oregon, and, and you know, their mom. Uh, some of them looked big and round like so, but the I don't know how much would remain of the actual balloon, but this is what they look like. This is what the metal parts look like. They had... Uh, Sometimes clusters of incendiary devices, sometimes sandbags to maintain altitude. And it was on a uh, altitude timer that is, as soon as it got towards the correct area, it would uh, release the bombs on the landscape and or just crash on the landscape and uh, light it up on fire. These are still all over the place in the United States, mostly in the Pacific Northwest. So if you see anything that looks remotely like that, it would be all rusty and whatnot. could be in the top of a tree, top of a peak, some place off the beaten path for sure, otherwise it would have been discovered. For God's sake, don't jostle it and, and don't try to dig it up out of the ground. You know, call, <laughs> call it in as a possible incendiary explosive device you know so um, the um, could look uh, pieces of it could look like this this is exploded view of the incendiary bomb found near Hayfork California really Hayfork poor Hayfork dealing with the fires right now they landed all over the place it even says this is the steel body of the bomb. This is a striker. This is the one inch wood core screw, arming wire, pin housing, pin safety pin springs. Wow. Wooden blocks holding the fuse, connecting tall sections with a nose section. And pretty sick. So Yeah, big dog, you were right, it was nineteen forty five. So I try, I try, Chris. Uh, uh, basically, my channel is supposed to be about history, um, especially of the West, but ghost towns in particular are my specialty uh, worldwide, meaning not paranormal, you know, like abandoned. Uh, tumbling tumbleweeds, Wild West, you know. So, the kind of things, though, that I come across researching ghost towns can be pretty insane, like looking at old newspapers and research, researching the old fires and such, uh, things like this. <laughs> so, uh, but they're out there still. Every once in a while they still find something. Um, going back up to the chat. Exactly. Anybody with an axe to grind in America, that's vulnerable and that's just kind of strategically stupid to have uh, flammable vegetation growing up next to our fire lookouts in our radio towers. <laughs> it's just like, really? Oh, and our priceless obser uh, observatories, like like the Wilson Observatory. The firefighters had their work cut out for them and barely saved it because they allowed all over the place overgrowth, bushes, and dead trees everywhere. Just whoever is in charge of that should be reprimanded. Um... Ah, a lot of times it's like, do, do you want things to burn down? But it's one of those easily e things we can easily fix. People think that, oh, we're helpless because the climate's going to make some fires worse. Actually, the fires are mostly worse because we've been stupid with, um, uh, you know, introducing fire-promoting weeds in the landscape and, and just in, in every kind of way, not just... Uh, not just that. So, even in this bad climate change event, we see that even on the Windy and the KMP, they have really awesome results where they've done fuels reduction. So we're not doomed by any means. We should get to work. the The climate change means that we should work harder 
to prevent mega fires. It doesn't mean that there's nothing to do and we should cry in our beer. It means we should work harder than ever to prepare the landscape for fire because climate change makes it a little bit more difficult to deal with. Not impossible, though. Some can't think outside the box. Well, yeah. Um, let's see. The rest of the chat. Glad to have you with us. You sound like a, a good thinking man. Um, assuming you're a male, actually. Wyoming has some pretty cool ghost towns. Yeah, if you have ideas about places that I could visit, anybody, my email is in the description of the video. I want to, uh, I'm fundraising for a camera. Thank you, everybody who has helped me. I'm getting closer to that goal every day. Um, I want to travel around, especially the West, but other parts of the U.S., to film these ghost towns in our history before it disappears. We've lost so much this last three years. I'm just absolutely sick to my stomach. Half the places I wanted to film just burned up. In Plymouth County, I was supposed to do a, a scouting mission to pre-film with a cell phone all the places I wanted to film with like real gear. Uh, in Plymouth County's ghost towns, and Rich Bar just burned to the ground, and so did Seneca, and probably many other ghost towns and mines, like Engel Mine. I'm absolutely sick to my stomach. And the previous year, I wanted to make a documentary on the Dogtown Nugget, the 54-pound do uh, Dogtown Nugget, made out of almost pure gold. Well, high percentage of gold in Butte County. That Nugget Museum burned to the ground in paradise. And the uh, ghost town of Cherokee barely made it, but everything else around here, like many of the, the honey run covered bridge just burned up and then uh, you know we almost lost Pollock Pines and, and uh, got very close to uh, losing places like Placerville this year in Volcano it's just making me twitch we lost Grizzly Flat and a lot of the history here in the Caldor and I thought well at least down south I can go down to the Sierras and film the Sequoia oh my god and we just lost a whole bunch of the history here too and of course, the landscape and the trees. It's just, I got to get on this, like immediately just start making road trips. And so, thank you, everybody who's donated to that fund. I have a PayPal link in the description of the video. Um, I'm just looking for the camera gear, gas money, and I can go. And of course, the wham money, the walking around money to actually, you know, make uh, reservations, uh, maybe rent a trailer to tow around or, or something of, the, of that sort. Um, what do I think of the idea of inmate work crews doing brush removal around communication sites? I've been favorable. Uh, I have a favorable opinion of the whole inmate uh, work crew kind of system. I I know almost nothing about it. I don't know if it's corrupt or anything of that nature, but on face value, the idea of prisoners like the white collar, especially um, becoming volunteer firefighters and maybe making that a career for time uh, for reduced sentencing. I think that's excellent. I don't want people to rot in jail. I want people to redeem themselves and pay back society instead of being in a cage. I think that's a better justice system than the whole cage system that we have right now where they sit around and don't have anything to do except discuss crime with other criminals and get new ideas about crime. Um, I like the general concept of that. But of course it, it can't be corrupt. So, um, that's, volunteers also, just allow volunteers to help. I, I would think that they should pay our farmers and ranchers to graze around the communication equipment too, where we're applicable. It uh, depends on the situation, but our farmers and ranchers could use help economically and instead of just a, just a subsidy or bailout, maybe just pay them to do a good service, you know, um, yeah, Jay Cat is saying the problem with anyone doing work on public land, if it, anyone got hurt, the lawsuit would be huge. Well, that could be changed with a um, with a bill. In fact, that's why history is being bulldozed. Oh, somebody might get hurt on the dilapidated building. As long as there's a sign saying at your own risk in three different languages, French, English, and Spanish, which are our neighboring countries, uh, make it not possible for them to sue. Did you trespass and walk past safety barriers and fall into a mine? That's your problem. Sorry. In fact, you 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 get billed for the uh, being rescued. 
you don't get to sue somebody for falling into a mine because you went past uh, the barriers. You know, because you played around on them. Uh, you went over the barrier and fell off the state park cliff. Well, that's very sad. But you don't get to make that your payday and drain uh, the United States uh, budget uh, to protect for protecting the parks, you know. There should be common sense things like mines should have a seal on them and a grate. It's not too expensive. But in reality, you know, that could be changed in an instant. So that's what should be changed. They bulldozed entire ghost towns that should have been museums. Thinking, oh, people are partying here and uh, putting the graffiti on them. So instead of restoring them and putting a guard there and an admission ticket, they bulldozed it. That's not their right. It's ours. It belongs to the public. It's our heritage. It's our history. Somebody might get hurt at Pompeii, but you don't bulldoze it. You know? Yeah, Frank says the Forest Service does rent out forest land for grazing. But um, here's the thing. When we're talking about fire reduction, don't rent it out where they have to pay. Pay the rancher to do the service at the critical infrastructure area. That's what I'm talking about. Um, the, they, they're they really hurting. They have uh, their, their profit margin and stuff for like running a dairy or something is incredibly bad. And they're facing new uh, challenges such as the reintroduction of wolves. So they could use a boost in other areas to compensate. Exactly, a non. Uh, a um, I I sign those every every time that I explore a dangerous place and I get permission to film. I sign uh, the last thing that I went filming uh, several years ago now that I signed one of these it was like I uh, went to film a boat that was on land, but it was leaning over. I was hoping to get a fundraiser going to preserve it. And so I went there with a news media crew, and I was walking around kind of like the, the junkyard type situation it was in, and it was hazardous, and there was sharp edges of sharp metal, and I signed, if I'm hurt on this, it's my deal, it's my problem, and I produced a uh, document that stated I had health insurance meaning I wouldn't have to sue. Here, here's the thing about suing. Universal health care would like kind of probably solve that entire problem. Medicare for all, anybody who can't afford it. P Americans are not as sue happy as you think. The reason why they sue after getting an injury for like any kind of injury is oftentimes they don't have insurance or their insurance is not going to cover the entirety of their bill. They have no choice. They either don't get their medical bills paid and they lose their house and lose everything and go bankrupt and probably don't get surgeries they need they can either face that or they can sue whoever is on the other side of things and get their bills paid even if they don't want to sue they kind of are backed up against a wall so that happens to everything from car accidents suing the rental car company you know for some reason it's not their fault, but the driver doesn't have good insurance, but the rental car company does. Uh, sue the national government because they have money to sue, whereas suing, suing the mining company uh, wouldn't work because the mine company went out of business a long time ago. So if we change some laws, that would stop. Especially if we just kind of gave people health care. But that's a different issue. I'm not trying to start a debate. I'm just explaining the situation in America. To other countries, there's not that much litigation regarding accidents. And they think Americans are Sue happy. No, we're not. We're Sue unhappy. We're unhappy with the fact that uh, you probably have to sue, even if it's not warranted, to get your medical bills paid. It's not like other countries where you can just get cancer and have your medical bills paid or get in a car accident and you just get treated. A lot of times you turn away from ERs. When I didn't have when I didn't have health insurance uh, in college, after I turned 21, I went to the emergency room with a 103 degree fever, and they found out I didn't have insurance, and they pushed me outside in a wheelchair. 
it's a real thing. So, um, uh, Big Dog says there's actually several million bucks worth of equipment on top of the Santiago Peak. Whoa. Yeah, see, an ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure. We can't be uh, doing this, this unsustainability. We can't have these lookouts that were made in the 30s burned down with a rebuild cost of modern day building. Every Everything seems to cost a million dollars anymore, which is stupid. We can't afford to just let things burn down and rebuild them. Something has to be cut. If we do that, then we may, might have to open up national parks land to oil and gas development or something else to make up for the budget. That's why we're so enraged about this. So, just looking back, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, Australia is worse, actually. In Australia, um, if somebody breaks into your house and uh, is there to rob you, and you either shoot them or stab them with a kitchen knife, they the criminal can sue you, and it'll come down to this argument. Was it, did you have a right to defend your home with deadly force? Could you have fist fought him instead? Could you have shouted and clapped your hands and scared away the robber instead? Did you take these steps? Could you have taken ten backward steps instead and locked yourself in the bathroom and called 911 instead? Was using the knife overboard? It's just, Australia is insane. The criminal has the right to break into your house, threaten you, threaten your life, take your stuff. And you had better not so much as hurt his feelings. Otherwise, he can sue you and go, go to the bank. So it's not as bad here as it could be, but it's still pretty bad. But uh, we, we take some things for granted, but doesn't mean we couldn't improve just because some places are worse. Yeah, Big Dog says and you can replace the wooden shake roofs with a modern day green metal roof like you see on a new log home. Absolutely. Or just put copper on there. Copper would last. It would be initially expensive. But copper roofs can last for a thousand years. The copper roof on the Parthenon is still good. The Parthenon of Rome, as in Caesar Augustus built that. Well, it burned to the ground a, a year later, but they rebuilt that. You know, there's Renaissance buildings in Rome that still have their copper roofs intact. It develops that green patina like the Statue of Liberty and just sits there. It's pretty good. And they can attach that to lightning rods and ground it. And um, there you go. Pretty easy. And they could put iron shutters around the windows. Uh, there's not that many lookout towers to do it. LMT says, I know somebody who spent 10 years in jail and prison for shooting a robber in his own house. The judge ruled the homeowner could have left. Wow. That's just all kinds of wrong. Okay. Let's see. Looking back up. Um, oh, Helen said something I missed. Let's go back up to... Ellen says, I got permits to take down snags and remove live trees in a six inch diameter from BLM along my boundary with them. Well, that's good. Six inches doesn't sound very big, but that's good. Did you did you find out if, if it was easy? Uh, was it easy to get the permits? Um, I think there's a lot of red tape we just have to cut through. Like, why would you need to get permits to take down anything in your yard that's a fire hazard you know what I mean <laughs> yeah. J cat says lol copper that would last a day before it got stolen fire lookout towers are, are manned 24 hours a day J cat that, that they wouldn't be stolen the only time they ever leave a fire lookout is well during a massive wildfire and they have cameras all over them that that wouldn't work you do realize that they're staffed 24 hours a day usually by a two to four man team right they live there in the tower um, still 
They're not automated. There's living quarters. That's what's inside the building. Besides, you can batten it down pretty dang well. It would it would pretty it would be pretty elaborate to the sheet. It's extremely heavy, by the way. The sheets of copper for the roof tiles. Um, you would it would need a crane. Uh, J E Cat. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. Um, you can't just lift that off by hand. It will be one stop shopping. You never really need to maintain it. Uh, it, they're they're pretty ding deluxe. Um, with their pay rate, they they would be the ones that would steal it. Oh, shot fired! <laughs> I thought they were paid pretty decently. They, they basically, it's free housing. Um, there was a couple of blogs I read about what it's like to be a lookout person, and it's uh pretty cool. Um. But where where would they get a crane? But that's a pretty funny joke. Um, this is sad. This is the one that burned down. And it's made out of stone. I just... I don't know. The main thing is if they had weed whacked, you wouldn't even need a special roof. Uh. Chris says, Chris W5CMP says, South Texas has control burns just about every year. Well, in California, it's not as easy to do as Texas because of the fact that um, the valley is a bowl that fills up with smoke. Uh, there's the rice fields that they used to burn every year and control burning and stuff just meant this, this entire region fills up with smoke and just stays there. It takes very strong winds to push it over the Sierras. And usually, in very strong winds, there's only two places in the entire county, uh, entire state, where wind can easily access the ocean, as San Francisco Bay and, and Pasadena. And um, it just stays in there and makes everybody miserable and gives everybody asthma. The pollution level is high already with the vehicles and the industry. So adding the smoke to it was a bad thing. However, what my idea was, is to gather the combustibles and either have special biomass facilities for generating power with it. Don't just burn the landscape like, oh, let's put a torch on the ground. Gather it up, and they could have even portable power generating areas that would uh, carbon sequester and capture uh, the worst uh, smoke particles. And you could generate electricity at the same time. And do things a little bit like that. Or wood chip for fuels reductions and save the wood chips and take them to a facility that'll put them into those special logs made out of wood chips that would be sold around the world, not just in California, you know, the uh, or put into a biomass plant, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, even a six inch diameter tree could be 20 foot tall. That, that's true, that's true. But uh, in California, just lighting the landscape on fire is not going to be a good solution. Gathering up and uh, trying to do other things, making uh, bio uh, biodiesel and ethanol from uh, cellulose. They need to put a whole lot more money into, uh, grant money into researching that. Especially where they need to go across the landscape and get rid of every fire producing weed. Every scotch broom plant needs to be eradicated from California, and I'm not kidding. The way that it's invasive, the way it promotes fire, the way it destroys the landscape and destroys the native plants, and the way it uh, propagates again if, if every single one of them isn't uprooted. There's so much oil in those seeds, you can make biodiesel and uh, cellulose ethanol from it. Uh, that could be profitable. You could put a bounty on the weed and people would go out and collect it themselves. Um, that can be done relatively quickly instead of having people illegally cross the border and looking for work and this is stuff we could have work permits and have, have people come in from other countries where, and with cheaper labor in general to just do that just blanket the landscape with, with workers and then make it a seasonal job 
a lot of them just want to work seasonally and go back to their home country. Well, why not? Sounds great. A lot of Americans uh, would not work at the, the pay rate there where that would be affordable. That would be a much better uh, uh, situation than the um, current broken one we have. A lot of a lot of people uh, from Central South America would be delighted to do that. They'd be paid a lot more than if they were doing labor in their own place. And you could provide housing with them in temporary workplaces. If they didn't have to pay for housing, that would be like hitting the jackpot for them for the amount of uh, if they were returning to their home nations, uh, working for a lot more money than if they had been working locally. I, I see a lot of positives to all of this sort of stuff. Yeah, Blanco Lirio explained that plan burns could count against the state's air quality while wildfire smoke does not. I know, that's just wrong. The state's being penalized for trying to prevent big fires. Yep. So, also, carbon emission deals might get in the way with that because that is technically producing carbon. It's stupid. The wildfires produce the more than industry and everything combined. But doing a control burn might be seen as from other nations as uh, as carbon emissions, which is just just awful, absolutely evil. There's a lot of complications, but like I said, we could work on uncomplicating the situation because we can't let the entire state burn up. See, if the forests disappear, they're not turning carbon into oxygen, are they? How much is that as an offset? See? There should be an allowance for that. Kindly explain to the world, well, California does have to do some control burning and such in order to save the forest that produce a lot of oxygen. What do you say? Can we be forgiven? You know. Exactly, Helen. Scotch broom is thick along the roads which are a vector for invasive weeds and make safe egress from fires unsafe. Exactly. If you have eucalyptus and scotch broom and fire-promoting weeds like blackberries on the side of the roads, your road is no longer a fire break. Your road is now a fire-promoting line across the landscape. It You can't sit there and hold the line. Fire crews can't sit there and hold it. They have to run away from it. It'll cross the line. The same thing along the railroad tracks. We can't even afford to repair lost railroad tracks and wooden trestles. We can't even afford to rebuild them with Amtrak and such. With their budget, we have to just get rid of the weeds on either side and uh, save the landscape. Yeah, Chris says, seems like a no-win deal. If the fire burns everything up, there's then it leads to mudslides. Exactly. We just can't. We can't afford to not take action. We've got to do something. So let's look back up to. Most people don't know you can rent some fire lookouts and spend a few nights in them if you're fairly plush. Yeah, Ellen, I've wanted to do that. That's pretty amazing. That's a good. That's a good uh, example. Now they shouldn't destroy history. They should restore it and make it a money gen generating revenue stream for our public lands. Rich people love to spend time in uh, fire lookouts, and sometimes they're affordable. Um, instead of selling off li uh, public lands to oil and gas development, they could, and destroying our history, they could revitalize it and make tourist attractions. They they did down here at Merrill's, Merrill King and Silver City. These fire lookouts, even if they're not even useful for fire lookout later, they could be a bed and breakfast. And some of them are doing that, and uh, thank goodness there's some people are getting a brain about the situation. Norman Elliott says in the 80s, Oregon tried to remove Scotch broom. Should have tried harder, and should keep trying. The thing that uh, keeping it around is not an option. That's the thing. We have to find a way. Excuses can cannot be accepted. It's going to strangle the economy. It will make it'll decrease property values, make it impossible to graze animals because it's poison. It uh, promotes fire. It would make massive blazes. It'll destroy our railroads. It'll destroy our roads. It'll destroy uh, native plants. It'll make some plants extinct. 
it's taking over entire forests. People don't realize, oh, well, maybe it's just taking over the roadside. No, it's taking over entire forests. Making it so no baby trees can, can sprout and live. And destroying meadows and making species like the Oregon meadow lark extinct because the meadow is gone. It just becomes a scotch broom uh, field. Scotch broom taking over field. It goes as far as the eye can see. I don't know. I should have clicked on uh, it's that thing. That horrible plant. There's a couple of similar species that look like it. Uh, I was looking for a good a good, uh, it's this, it's this. So whenever there's a meadow, no trees can grow in it and no native plants. It just takes over. It's highly toxic. If you walk into that, your eyes swell up during the blue, of course. You can't see. It's one of the biggest allergens. It gives people asthma. It, that mustard yellow thing, just the pollen of it is insanity. And it's taking over much of the landscape, especially in the Pacific Northwest, but in California too. And Home Depot, excuse me, I whacked the mic. Home Depot still sells it as an ornamental and people are planting it on their yards and they don't realize they're going to destroy their entire property. When fire gets into the plant here, let me change the color pen. Say the fire gets in the plant here, you could put it out and the fire crews go home. Well, four days later, a fire erupts here in a high wind event because the colony root system it went all the way that distance in the root system and then all of a sudden the entire thing is on fire because the roots were on fire it has to be stopped it's not an option native plants can't grow underneath it it strangles them an entire grazing fields and everything it's taking over it Instead of when they replant our forests, if Scotch Broom gets there, kiss it goodbye. All the little replanted trees disappear under that and are strangled to death. It's absolutely horrific. It'll grow up at the base of trees and start killing the big ones. You see this thing? You get rid of it. It's really bad. Oh, here's some right up underneath power lines. No longer could you access the power lines under the fire access road. Oh my god. You should see this and see an emergency. It's not always yellow, but when it blooms, it's bright yellow. You can spot it from the air. We can map it real quick. We can get it off the landscape. But it's not an option to keep it around. Kind of looks like that. But with a little bit of elbow grease, they, they made new tools, new technology. It was almost impossible to remove with the old kind, but that guy is using a weed wrench. And it's now easy as pie with minimal effort. Um, I wish the entirety of the tool was shown, but you just stick the weed wrench in the ground and it uses leverage. And you just push on it and it wrenches it right out of the ground like this. It's pretty awesome. In the future, I'm sure we could use robotics to do this um, for free. But for now, you know, we could hire people from uh, out of the country. Oh, sorry. Guys, flag me whenever there's something in chat that I need to attend to like that. Dang, bot is back. There we go. Helen says, need to develop a market for small saw logs, high-tech fellers, feller bunchers, and certain techniques prevent soil and root damage. And do not require roads, absolutely. In the future, robots will be doing this, and it'll be so much easier. Maybe even remote control. But for now, we could still hire people to do this. Put a bounty on it. This is, the, this is how easy it can be. Just like when you scrap metal. If you go to scrap metal yard, you fill up the back of your truck, or your trailer with metal like steel. You go up on the way, uh, it's like a way station, uh, the uh, something you drive over. It weighs your entire vehicle and the entire trailer. Then you dump and you weigh the vehicle again and uh, they pay you for the difference in weight. Super easy. 
are very quick. They can turn the soul into ethanol, biodiesel. It's got very, very oily uh, seeds and stuff. You could have, you put a bounty on this weed, you do it the same way that they were successful with the Nutria bounty in um, Maryland. Nutria, the incredibly invasive rodent, uh, water rodent, uh, semi aquatic rodent, uh, looks kind of like a beaver, but it's not, has a rat tail. They destroy wetlands and uh, basically start driving the muskrat extinct everywhere they go. Uh, so part of the reason the hurricanes are worse at New Orleans is they're destroying the wetlands. They uh, don't belong here. And they get invasive and home. oh man. They, they eat uh, Swiss cheese. They make uh, the levees and uh, eat holes into them and make a, make a Swiss cheese kind of burrowing colony. They cause flooding. So in Maryland, when they showed up, they put a bounty on them uh, that said, you know, bring in 10 nutrients. Uh, tails and we pay you X right but as it got harder and harder to find the nutria people got less and less interested in doing the bounty so they kept raising the bounty until it was very very uh, profitable to even catch one because that's the problem with bounties is that by the time the uh, they get harder and harder to find people lose interest and say man I've been looking for seven days didn't get paid well, they kept increasing the bounty as uh, as the nutrient got more rare and as they got towards the finish line, and it seems to have worked. So initially, put a bounty that that where these weed removal isn't that lucrative, but then increase it, increase it, increase it, and then you'll have people fighting each other, uh, cap gun in the air, boom, go, and they'll race off into the uh, designated area to remove scotch broom, do it county by county or whatever. And also put a bounty uh, per sector. Some areas it would be easy to remove the Scotch room, right? The low flatlands, road access. What, what about areas you have to hike in? So with the uh, pike minnow bounty, where they want to protect the salmon in uh, Columbia River, we just we just model off after what works already. They, you have to register. They only want the pike minnow to be uh, removed from some salmon uh, breeding areas, right? That's what that's what the point is. So you have to check in with Fish and Game at a check-in station. They take your license plate and your number and all that. And uh, then by the end of the day, you have to check back in with what you have uh, gotten from the area. And that prevents people from doing it far away where it doesn't matter yet still getting paid the bounty right so you'd have a check-in station in a remote area where aircraft spotted the uh, scotch room and then people would hike in and come back and that would prevent the fraud you know helen says scotch broom burns like old tires and smells like them too yeah they make it makes the thick black oily smoke which is so dang hazardous because they're full of oil but that's what makes them so good for creating biodiesel and cellulose ethanol. So, once collected, the cost of the bounty could be offset by the fact that you could turn that into uh, something that would make fuel. Laura says, Home Depot says on its website is 2015 they are working with Plan Right to avoid invasive species sales. I hope that's true. Well, it's not. Not currently. There's a Facebook group I'm a, uh, a part of, and people keep showing these pictures of this year and last year. Home Depot selling Scotch Brew in, uh, in California and other invasives. It's um, BS until they uh, get their act together. Yeah, exactly, Big Dog. They take over meadows and flatlands and pastures. And so whenever there's a clear cut, that just means that now they can grow. It's because they want sunlight. Underneath a tree canopy, they're less uh, inclined to grow because of the lack of sunlight. But it grows in native Scotland, you know, and so the partly cloudy and kind of moist conditions of Pacific Northwest are perfect for its growth, and there's nothing that eats it. It's all toxic. I don't know what eats it in uh, Scotland and whatever, British Isles. But 
nothing does here. And it kills livestock. It, it kills our native, uh, uh, our native animals. And so that's, that's what kills the baby trees and prevents the replanting. But, but I, I know that. I've, I totally ver verified that. Where the Tillamook burn was, when I went out there to study the Tillamook burn fire of 1933, um, some of the replant efforts failed in the 60s because Scotch Broom took over instead mostly by where the railroad tracks were so I know exactly what you mean you're totally right so but a lot of citizens could get together just like solve you know beach cleanup school groups when I was in school we um, got together and did extra credit for our class if we would do community volunteering and we went out to uh, stabilize beach dunes by, by planting uh, beach grass and stuff. And I don't know now if those were native beach grasses. I hope they were. <laughs> but we were uh, trying to save uh, habitat for like snowy plover and save a neighborhood. One day I'll tell that story. But you see this? Don't buy a property that's uh, it's got that stuff on it. Oh my god. The thing is, is that once you rip it out, the seed pods are still everywhere, but you can assign people to patrol every time that, uh, every once in a while, and when an area is mostly cleared of it, you can put a higher bounty on the new plants, the new baby plants, because that would mean that people are um, preventing the regrowth, you know. So... Check out the link I just sent. Uh, what to my email? Or yeah, deer and elk know not to eat it. Well, the ones that are alive know know that. But what about the babies? Yeah, here's Oregon. That's got to be Astoria right there. Um, this is how bad it is. It grows underneath the power lines because that's where they trim back the vegetation. Or cough PG. That's where you're supposed to trim back vegetation. Because of the uh, sunlight right there. And we have to start fining uh, people that allow it to grow on their property. Here's the thing. There's a carrot and a stick method. Carrot. Here's a financial incentive to get it off your property. We will help you. We will give you tax breaks if you remove it. Stick. We're going to fine you if you don't remove it. Including you, power company. Are you going to allow invasive weeds to take over the, the land and then start polluting public land nearby, we're going to fine you. I mean, that's a shot of uh, British Columbia, but you get the point. Carrot and stick. Use both liberally, you get the problem solved. As Mike Wink was saying, there is, what was his quote for motivating his fire crews? There is no such thing as impossible, only try harder. Yeah, it's not an option to let this happen. Kiss like all of our native environment goodbye. Kiss many species goodbye. Welcome new megafires and devastated landscape. It's not an option to not do it. And if anybody's trying to say, oh, we can't pull up weeds. Yeah, we can. We can go to the freaking moon. We can eradicate a weed. Yeah, you just sent it to my wildfire email. Okay. I was going to sign off, actually. Because I need to rest my voice. I've been actually should have done that two hours ago, and I forgot I skipped lunch on accident. So I think we're good on the fires. Has there been any new development? What is that? Is that frost on the lens? Wow, Nevada has frost. It almost looks like snow. Nice. I hear it snowing at Timberline Lodge. That's awesome. But I'll check. I'll check the email tomorrow, guys. I kind of got to sign off. Unless something new is happening with the fires, there's nothing to look at. Maybe we'll reconvene at seven or eight p.m. or something to uh, watch the uh, videos and do a checkup. But I have things to do before five p.m. closures at uh, businesses and such. So, um, yeah, that's frost on the lens. That's cool. Um, can't even see fires on any of the cams, so. 
going once, going twice. Anybody have a fire question? And I'm also kind of sarcastic. They are working with Plan Right to avoid invasive species sales. Home Depot is. They don't have to work with anybody. They could just press a button and say, we no longer sell that. It's pretty obvious. You just Google the internet. What is an invasive species? But, you know, the laws have to change. It should be against the law to plant this stuff. If it isn't, and, and against the law to sell it. If it isn't, then if it's voluntary, uh, looks like people are just not going to comply. There's always the airheads out there. I think it's a cool plant. You shouldn't discriminate against it. It has a right to be here just like any other plant. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You know, there's always going to be some stubborn idiot that says, I'm going to put it in my garden just because I'm a rebel. Well, make them financially pay for that. Make the people who are polluting pay, right? They should finance the mess. Or we could put it to it like this. Home Depot, hey, go ahead. Sell scotch room all you want. Except you get the bill for its removal from the state. Would you like to donate half a billion to that effort? Because that's probably going to be the cost. They'd probably be like, oh, never mind. We're not going to sell that anymore. Yeah, we could do it like that. Yeah, Helen says broad acres areas can be covered and to prevent regeneration by covering it with black polyurethane sheeting after removal. But that is a plastic on a landscape. That's okay for somebody's backyard. But when the polyurethane stuff gets tattered by the wind and gets crunched up, it's putting micro, uh, not micro, but smaller bits of plastic all over the landscape. Uh, which is going to be bad for the wildlife. Uh, I can't tell you how sad it was to watch birds just rip the, the plastic up and consume it. I went chasing after a bunch of birds trying to get them to stop, and I couldn't. Uh, that's real bad. But but on a small scale, basically the idea is to deprive the plant of light and nothing will grow back. But with the, the amount of time the seeds could uh, sit there underneath the soil, I think that's more appropriate for Japanese knotweed. But scotch broom, scotch broom, you just got to pull up by the roots and then keep pulling it up and uh, kind of keep at it and monitor it. Um, later, when we have robotics, AI will probably pick up every seed off the landscape with little robotic octopus arms. That'll come down the pipe later. Check my Twitter messages. What? Is there something? I was supposed to sign off. What? Are we? Fine. I'll check the email then. Um. All right. I'm checking my email. What? What's going on? I'm getting the most interesting kind of trophy spam. I'm. Uh, oh, guys, did you know that there's a princess in Nigeria who wants to leave everything to me, her entire fortune and her palace? If only she had my bank account information in order to donate all of her gold reserves to my bank account. <laughs> um, um, okay, let me check the spam folder. I don't see a new email from anybody today, like just now. Um, I got a Dixie Fire West Zone update. I got Alan T's con contact info. Who was supposed to be sending me something? Travis Murray? Did you just send me an email? Uh, I don't see one. You do a search for your name. I have emails from you from September 4th. That's it though. Did you send me an email just now?
Um, I see something from the 23rd. Oh, those. Okay. You mean from a while ago? Okay, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, okay, I got those pictures. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I've been juggling a whole bunch of stuff. I need to take a break from fires, and I have to actually make phone calls before 5. So we'll come back around 8 or something like that tonight. Uh, 7 or 8, something like that. Very sorry. I haven't meant, been meaning to neglect emails. Uh, I have a huge backlog. And I have not been sleeping well, and I had the flu all last week. So I have a huge backlog. Very sorry. haven't been meaning to neglect anything. Um, not true, Helen, but I, what I'm trying to say is that birds tear it up and consume portions of it. They do that of their own volition. Like, they see it, and they think it's food. So, but it's it's good on a small scale, but like covering an entire uh, forest meadow with it wouldn't particularly be practical anyway. But anybody, last call, anybody have some sort of a fire question? They're mostly looking good right now. Yep. If you would like to know when I go live, every YouTube channel has a button. Here it says subscribe, hit the ringing bell, and you'll know whenever we go live again. I'm going to try to prep my computer too for a complete Windows reinstall. It's kind of limping along right now. This will give me some time to do my own thing. This is day 77, I think, of my fire stream. I've been speaking about 14 hours a day since for, for 70 days, mostly in a row. Covering the fires. Thank you, everyone who has donated to keep me going. It's with your kind donations, it's the only way I can take off work and keep going, uh, monitoring the fires every day. Um, I think everybody has done that. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you, mods, for keeping keeping chat alive when I'm asleep. But every once in a while, I do have to take the stream down and uh, start my own computer work. I'm going to back up and prepare it for complete Windows install because it's kind of crashing every once in a while and interrupting the stream. And I have to order some parts. I have to, uh, well, I haven't really been outside more than nine times, I think. I literally mean outside, as in opening the door, stepping outside since July 14th. I'm kind of going insane with stir craziness. And every once in a while I have to do something that's not fire related. So, thank you guys uh, for being mod volunteers. We'll come back around 8-ish p.m. I'll get on Twitter and let you know if there's some other problem if I can't. I have Twitter link in my uh, description of my video. If you want to donate to my camera fund, where I uh, never wanted to do fire stream really. What I wanted to do was... Um, what I wanted to do was make boring history videos. Well, actually, kind of cool history videos, actually. Boring compared to wildfires. Um, about ghost towns of the American West and well, the world. And um, that takes money, though. I've got the time, but not the money. It's kind of a ironic thing. Uh, if you want to support the career I was trying to have before the fire uh, happened, and that would be awesome. But please donate to the fire victims first. Um, Pocket change left over. If enough people give me that, I can keep going on for the near future with the fire stream. This is Tobias P. We don't see anything going on. Uh, we don't really see anything going on in the cams. We can't really hear anything either, and there's not that much aircraft uh, chatter to hear. So I think I'll end it, and um, then we'll come back and we'll play all the nighttime roundup videos. Around, I'll say around 8 p.m. or so. 7 or 8. So hit the subscribe button, hit the like button on the way out, that really helps. Sharing the stream, uh, sharing my channel page link will help other people to find me, and especially if you think they could use uh, almost a, a nearly 24 hour a day uh, resource on the fires and the evacuation of hope. So that's the way most people find us. Thank you all for being here. And, um,
we'll talk to you later tonight. Stay safe.